Cold War. America vs. Soviet Union, written by A.J. Kingston, narrated by Madison May. Introduction. The Cold War was one of the defining features of the international system for much of the 20th century, and it had a profound impact on global politics and diplomacy. The competition between the United States and the Soviet Union created a global environment that was marked by intense ideological conflict, military competition, and political polarization. The Cold War shaped the course of global politics and diplomacy, and its legacy continues to be felt around the world today. This book, The Cold War, America vs. Soviet Union, offers a comprehensive exploration of the complex and multifaceted nature of the Cold War. The book covers the historical context and origins of the Cold War, the key events and turning points that marked the course of the conflict, and the enduring legacy of the Cold War on global politics and diplomacy. The book begins by exploring the origins of the Cold War, including the political and ideological factors that contributed to the emergence of the conflict. It examines the key events and turning points of the Cold War, including the arms race, the space race, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the various proxy wars that were fought around the world. The book also examines the cultural and social impact of the Cold War, including the emergence of new forms of cultural expression and the development of new forms of political and social activism. It explores the legacy of the Cold War on global politics and diplomacy, including the continued presence of nuclear weapons, the competition between the United States and Russia, and the ongoing struggle between different ideological and cultural values. The Cold War was a period of significant change and transformation in global politics and diplomacy, and its impact is still being felt around the world today. As such, the study of the Cold War remains an important subject of study and discussion among policymakers and scholars around the world, and it will likely continue to be an important subject of study for many years to come. This book offers a comprehensive and detailed examination of the Cold War, and it is intended for students, scholars, and policymakers who are interested in understanding the complex and multifaceted nature of this defining feature of the international system in the 20th century. Chapter 1. The Origins of the Cold War The Yalta Conference, held from February 4 to 11, 1945, is widely regarded as one of the most consequential diplomatic gatherings of the modern era. At the conference, the leaders of the United States, Great Britain and the Soviet Union met to discuss the post-war world and divide up the spoils of the war. To be sure, the Yalta Conference was a momentous event in world history. However, what is often forgotten is the degree to which the seeds of discord were sown at the conference. Indeed, the decisions made at Yalta set in motion a chain of events that would lead to decades of tension and conflict between the Western powers and the Soviet Union. The conference was hosted by Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin in the Crimean resort town of Yalta. Attending the conference were U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and their respective delegations. One of the key issues discussed at the conference was the fate of Eastern Europe. The Soviet Union had liberated much of Eastern Europe from Nazi occupation, and Stalin was keen to ensure that these countries would remain within the Soviet sphere of influence. Churchill, however, was determined to prevent the spread of communism in Europe. He feared that the Soviet Union would seek to expand its influence at the expense of Western Europe, and he was determined to prevent this from happening. The United States, for its part, was more concerned with the Pacific theater of the war. President Roosevelt was eager to secure Soviet support in the war against Japan, and he was willing to make concessions on the issue of Eastern Europe in order to achieve this. The result of these conflicting interests was a series of compromises that satisfied no one. Stalin agreed to hold free and fair elections in Poland, but only after the war was over. Churchill, meanwhile, secured a promise from Stalin that the Soviet Union would not interfere in Greece, but this promise was not kept. The Yalta Conference also established the United Nations, which was intended to be a forum for international cooperation and diplomacy. However, the UN was quickly beset by the same tensions and divisions that had plagued the conference. In the end, the Yalta Conference was a missed opportunity for the Western powers. 
They had the chance to challenge the Soviet Union and assert their dominance in Europe, but they were too preoccupied with their own interests to do so. As a result, the Soviet Union was able to expand its influence in Eastern Europe, and the stage was set for decades of Cold War conflict. The seeds of discord sown at the Yalta Conference would continue to bear fruit in the years that followed. The Soviet Union would go on to establish a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, while the Western powers would work to contain the spread of communism. This would lead to proxy wars, covert operations, and a nuclear arms race that threatened to destroy the world. In summary, the Yalta Conference was a pivotal moment in world history. While it is often remembered for the establishment of the United Nations and the division of Europe, it is important to recognize the degree to which it sowed the seeds of discord between the Western powers and the Soviet Union. The compromises made at the conference satisfied no one and set in motion a chain of events that would lead to decades of tension and conflict. The Yalta Conference was a moment of great consequence but one that was marked by missed opportunities and fatal compromises. In the history of the United States, few presidencies have been marked by as much upheaval and uncertainty as that of Harry S. Truman. The unexpected death of Franklin D. Roosevelt in April 1945 thrust Truman into the Oval Office just as the Second World War was entering its final phase. It was a time of immense challenges, both at home and abroad and Truman's response to those challenges would help shape the course of American history for decades to come. One of the most consequential developments of Truman's presidency was the beginning of the Cold War, a period of heightened tensions and ideological conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union that would define international relations for the rest of the 20th century. Truman's ascension to the presidency was marked by a sense of unease and uncertainty. He was a man who had risen to power through a combination of hard work, luck, and a knack for political maneuvering, but he had never before held an executive position of such magnitude. Moreover, he inherited a country that was still grappling with the aftermath of a long and grueling war, both in terms of its economy and its national psyche. As Truman himself later reflected, I felt like the moon, the stars, and all the planets had fallen on me. Despite these challenges, Truman quickly set to work. One of his first major decisions was to authorize the use of atomic bombs against Japan, a controversial move that some historians have argued was unnecessary and even immoral. Truman defended his decision by pointing to the enormous cost in American lives that would have been incurred by an invasion of the Japanese mainland and to the need to end the war as quickly as possible. I knew what I was doing when I stopped the war, he later said. I have no regrets and under the same circumstances, I would do it again. The end of the war brought with it a brief period of optimism and celebration, as Americans looked forward to a return to normalcy and prosperity. However, this sense of relief was short-lived. Almost immediately, tensions began to emerge between the United States and its erstwhile ally, the Soviet Union. The roots of this conflict were deep and complex with economic, political, and ideological factors all playing a role. But at its core, the conflict was driven by a fundamental disagreement over the nature of international relations. The Soviet Union, under the leadership of Joseph Stalin, was committed to spreading communism around the world. It viewed the United States and its capitalist allies as its chief adversaries, and sought to undermine their influence through a combination of propaganda, subversion, and military force. The United States, for its part, saw itself as the defender of democracy and freedom, and believed that it had a duty to protect its interests and those of its allies against Soviet aggression. Truman, who had little experience with foreign policy before becoming president, was initially uncertain about how to respond to the Soviet threat. He received conflicting advice from his advisors, some of whom advocated a conciliatory approach while others urged a more aggressive stance. Ultimately, Truman chose the latter course. In March 1947, he announced the Truman Doctrine, a policy that committed the United States to providing military and economic aid to countries threatened by communist expansion. This was followed by the Marshall Plan, a massive aid program that provided billions of dollars in assistance to Western Europe in an effort to rebuild its shattered economies and prevent the spread of communism. 
These policies were greeted with alarm by the Soviet Union, which viewed them as a direct threat to its interests. Stalin responded by tightening his grip on Eastern Europe and launching a campaign of subversion and propaganda aimed at undermining the United States and its allies. The history of Soviet expansionism is a story of ambition and power, of a nation seeking to extend its reach and influence across the globe. The culmination of this ambition was the establishment of the Iron Curtain, a symbol of the division between East and West that would define the post-World War II era. The roots of Soviet expansionism can be traced back to the early years of the Soviet Union. Under the leadership of Lenin and Stalin, the Soviet Union sought to establish a new world order, one that would be defined by the triumph of communism. At first, Soviet expansionism was focused on the consolidation of power within the Soviet Union itself. The Bolsheviks were determined to stamp out opposition and establish a monopoly on power, and they were willing to use force and violence to achieve this. However, the Soviet Union soon turned its attention to the wider world. Stalin, in particular, saw the expansion of Soviet influence as a means of securing the Soviet Union's place in the world and defending it against the perceived threat of capitalism. The culmination of Soviet expansionism was the establishment of the Iron Curtain, a term coined by Winston Churchill in 1946. The Iron Curtain represented a physical and ideological divide between East and West, between the Soviet Union and its allies and the Western powers. The Iron Curtain was not just a physical barrier, however. It was also a symbol of the growing tensions and divisions between the Western powers and the Soviet Union. The Iron Curtain represented a challenge to the principles of freedom and democracy that had defined the Western world for centuries. The Soviet Union, for its part, saw the Iron Curtain as a means of protecting itself against the perceived threat of Western aggression. The Soviet Union saw itself as a champion of the proletariat, and it believed that the establishment of communism throughout the world was the key to achieving true justice and equality. The establishment of the Iron Curtain had far-reaching consequences. It led to the division of Europe and the creation of a system of satellite states that were firmly under Soviet control. It also led to the arms race and the Cold War, a period of tension and conflict that would define the global political landscape for decades. The legacy of Soviet expansionism and the Iron Curtain is still felt today. The tensions and divisions that were established during this period continue to shape the world, particularly in Europe and the Middle East. In summary, Soviet expansionism and the establishment of the Iron Curtain were pivotal moments in world history. They represented the culmination of a vision of a world defined by the triumph of communism, and they set in motion a chain of events that would have far-reaching consequences. The establishment of the Iron Curtain was a moment of great consequence, one that defined the course of history for generations to come. The late 1940s were a time of great upheaval and uncertainty in the world, as the international order that had emerged from the Second World War began to fracture. The Soviet Union, led by the indomitable Joseph Stalin, had emerged as a global superpower, with a revolutionary ideology that promised to reshape the world in its own image. The United States, meanwhile, was struggling to come to terms with its new role as a global leader, as it faced a host of economic and political challenges at home and abroad. Against this backdrop, a new doctrine emerged that would come to define American foreign policy for decades to come, the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine was born out of a sense of urgency and necessity. The Soviet Union, emboldened by its victory in the war and its growing power, was actively seeking to expand its influence around the world. It had already established a number of satellite states in Eastern Europe and was making inroads in Asia and other regions. The United States, which had traditionally been isolationist in its foreign policy, was suddenly confronted with a new and dangerous adversary. It was in this context that President Harry S. Truman, who had assumed the presidency following the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt, announced the Truman Doctrine in March 1947. In a speech to Congress, Truman declared that the United States would provide military and economic aid to countries threatened by communist expansion. This aid, he argued, 
was necessary to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. The Truman Doctrine was, in essence, a call to arms, a rallying cry for the free world to stand up to the Soviet threat. The Truman Doctrine was motivated by a number of factors, both practical and ideological. On a practical level, it was seen as a way to prevent the spread of communism, which was viewed as a direct threat to American interests. The United States was still reeling from the effects of the Great Depression and the war, and was eager to avoid a new global conflict that would further destabilize the fragile post-war order. By providing aid to countries threatened by communism, the United States hoped to prevent the spread of the ideology and avoid a wider conflict. On an ideological level, the Truman Doctrine was motivated by a deep-seated belief in the superiority of the American way of life. The United States saw itself as the defender of democracy, freedom, and human rights, and believed that it had a moral obligation to support other nations in their struggle against tyranny. This belief was rooted in the American experience, which had been characterized by a commitment to individual liberty and limited government. The Truman Doctrine was not without its critics, both at home and abroad. Some argued that it represented an unwarranted intervention in the affairs of other nations, and that it would only serve to deepen the divisions between the United States and the Soviet Union. Others pointed out that the doctrine was vague and undefined, and that it was not clear how the United States would determine which countries were threatened by communism and which were not. Despite these criticisms, the Truman Doctrine had a profound impact on American foreign policy. It marked a dramatic shift away from isolationism and toward a more assertive role in world affairs. It also laid the groundwork for the policy of containment, which would come to define American strategy during the Cold War. The policy of containment was based on the belief that communism was a global threat and that the United States had a duty to prevent its spread. This policy was implemented through a variety of means, including military intervention, economic aid, and diplomatic pressure. The Truman Doctrine and the policy of containment were not why. The Marshall Plan was one of the most consequential acts of American economic diplomacy in the 20th century. Conceived in the aftermath of World War II, the plan was designed to aid the devastated economies of Europe and promote economic growth and stability in the region. Its success was a testament to the power of American economic might and the importance of economic diplomacy in international relations. The Marshall Plan was named after Secretary of State George C. Marshall, who in 1947 proposed a plan to provide aid to the war-ravaged nations of Europe. The plan was designed to help rebuild the economies of these nations, which had been devastated by the war and were facing the threat of communist expansion. The Marshall Plan was a massive undertaking, involving billions of dollars in aid and technical assistance. The plan provided funds to help rebuild infrastructure, restore agriculture, and promote trade and industry. It also provided technical assistance and training to help the nations of Europe develop the skills and knowledge they needed to rebuild their economies. The success of the Marshall Plan was remarkable. Within a few years, the economies of Western Europe had rebounded, and the threat of communist expansion had been contained. The Marshall Plan had played a critical role in restoring economic stability to the region and in promoting democracy and freedom. The success of the Marshall Plan was due in large part to the power and influence of the United States. The United States was, at the time, the world's largest economy, and it had the resources and expertise needed to help rebuild the economies of Europe. The Marshall Plan was a demonstration of American economic might and a testament to the importance of economic diplomacy in promoting international relations. The Marshall Plan also had far-reaching consequences for the world economy. It helped to establish the United States as a dominant economic power and set the stage for the post-World War II economic boom. It also established the importance of economic aid and technical assistance in promoting economic growth and stability in the developing world. The legacy of the Marshall Plan is still felt today. It remains a symbol of American economic diplomacy and a reminder of the importance of international cooperation and aid.
It also serves as a model for future efforts to promote economic growth and stability in the developing world. In summary, the Marshall Plan was a remarkable achievement of American economic diplomacy. It helped to rebuild the economies of Europe and promote economic growth and stability in the region. Its success was due in large part to the power and influence of the United States, and it had far-reaching consequences for the world economy. The Marshall Plan was a moment of great consequence, one that demonstrated the power of American economic might and the importance of economic diplomacy in international relations. In the aftermath of the Second World War, Europe was a shattered continent, divided and disunited by the ravages of war. The Allied powers, led by the United States and the Soviet Union, struggled to find a way to restore order and rebuild the devastated nations of Europe. The division of Germany, which had been a key player in the war, was one of the most contentious and fraught issues facing the Allies. The Berlin blockade, which began in June 1948, marked a turning point in the struggle over Germany and would help to define the contours of the Cold War for years to come. The Berlin blockade was the culmination of a series of events that had been building for years. In the aftermath of the war, Germany had been divided into four occupation zones, each controlled by one of the Allied powers. Berlin, the capital of Germany, was similarly divided, with the Soviet Union controlling the eastern half of the city and the Western powers, the United States, Great Britain and France, controlling the Western half. The division of Germany and Berlin was intended to be temporary, but as the Cold War began to heat up, it became clear that the situation was not going to be easily resolved. Tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers had been growing for years, as each side sought to promote its own vision of the world. The Soviet Union, under the leadership of Joseph Stalin, was committed to spreading communism around the world and saw the Western powers as its chief adversaries. The Western powers, for their part, saw themselves as the defenders of democracy and freedom and believed that they had a duty to protect their interests and those of their allies against Soviet aggression. The Berlin blockade was sparked by a decision by the Western powers to introduce a new currency, the Deutsche Mark, in their occupation zones. The Soviet Union saw this as a direct threat to its control over the city of Berlin, which was entirely within its own occupation zone. In response, Stalin ordered a blockade of all land and water routes into the western part of the city, effectively cutting it off from the rest of the world. The Berlin blockade was a dramatic escalation of the tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers. It was a brazen attempt to force the Western powers to abandon their presence in Berlin and to accept Soviet control over the entire city. The blockade had a profound impact on the people of Berlin, who were suddenly cut off from their friends and family on the other side of the city and who faced severe shortages of food and other essential supplies. The Western powers responded to the Berlin blockade with a massive airlift, which involved flying in supplies to the people of Berlin. The airlift was an extraordinary logistical feat, involving thousands of flights and millions of tons of supplies. It was a testament to the determination and resolve of the Western powers, who refused to be cowed by Soviet aggression. The Berlin blockade lasted for 11 months, from June 1948 to May 1949. It was ultimately unsuccessful, as the Western powers refused to abandon their presence in Berlin. However, it had a profound impact on the course of the Cold War. The blockade demonstrated the lengths to which the Soviet Union was willing to go to assert its dominance, and it showed the resolve of the Western powers to resist Soviet aggression. It also cemented the division of Germany and set the stage for the construction of the Berlin Wall in 1961. The division of Germany was one of the most consequential legacies of the Second World War. It was a stark reminder of the deep divisions that had torn Europe apart and of the dangers posed by ideological conflict. The creation of NATO and the Warsaw Pact was a pivotal moment in world history, one that set in motion a chain of events that would define the global political landscape for decades. The two military alliances were formed in response to the perceived threat of Soviet expansionism, and they represented a challenge to the principles of freedom and democracy that had defined the Western world for centuries. NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was formed in 1949. 
The organization was created as a collective defense against the Soviet Union and its allies, and it represented a commitment by the Western powers to resist Soviet aggression. The Warsaw Pact, meanwhile, was formed in 1955 as a response to the establishment of NATO. The pact was a military alliance between the Soviet Union and its satellite states in Eastern Europe, and it represented a commitment by these nations to resist the perceived threat of Western aggression. The creation of these two military alliances had far-reaching consequences. It led to the division of Europe and the establishment of a system of satellite states that were firmly under Soviet control. It also led to the arms race and the Cold War, a period of tension and conflict that would define the global political landscape for decades. The legacy of NATO and the Warsaw Pact is still felt today. The tensions and divisions that were established during this period continue to shape the world, particularly in Europe and the Middle East. The creation of these two military alliances was a product of the perceived threat of Soviet expansionism. The Western powers saw the Soviet Union as a threat to the principles of freedom and democracy, and they were determined to resist its expansion. The establishment of NATO and the Warsaw Pact was also a product of the Cold War, a period of tension and conflict that defined the global political landscape for decades. The two military alliances represented a challenge to the principles of freedom and democracy that had defined the Western world for centuries, and they set in motion a chain of events that would have far-reaching consequences. The legacy of NATO and the Warsaw Pact is still felt today. The tensions and divisions that were established during this period continue to shape the world, particularly in Europe and the Middle East. The creation of these two military alliances represented a turning point in world history, one that set in motion a chain of events that would have far-reaching consequences for generations to come. In summary, the creation of NATO and the Warsaw Pact was a moment of great consequence in world history. The two military alliances represented a response to the perceived threat of Soviet expansionism, and they set in motion a chain of events that would define the global political landscape for decades. The creation of these two military alliances was a moment of great significance, one that shaped the course of history for generations to come. In the early years of the Cold War, Asia was a battleground of competing ideologies and ambitions. The Chinese Revolution, which brought the Communist Party to power in China in 1949, was a seismic event that had profound implications for the balance of power in the region. The Korean War, which broke out in 1950, was a direct result of the tensions and conflicts that arose from the Chinese Revolution and would have far-reaching consequences for the United States and the world at large. The Chinese Revolution was a long and bitter struggle that had been building for years. The Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, had been fighting a guerrilla war against the ruling Nationalist Party since the 1920s. The Communists were initially seen as a marginal force, but they gradually gained support and momentum as they demonstrated their ability to fight against the Japanese during the Second World War. By the end of the war, the Communist Party was a potent force that was poised to take control of the country. The Chinese Revolution was a deeply ideological struggle, driven by a commitment to communism and a desire to transform China into a modern, industrialized society. The Communists saw themselves as part of a global movement that was working to overthrow capitalism and build a new world order based on equality and social justice. They were inspired by the success of the Soviet Union, which had been the first country to embrace communism and was seen as a model for other countries to follow. The Chinese Revolution was a cause of concern for the United States and its allies in the region. The United States had been supporting the Nationalist Party, which was seen as a bulwark against communism and a potential ally in the fight against the Soviet Union. The communist victory in China was a blow to this strategy, and raised fears that the United States was losing its grip on the region. The Korean War was a direct result of the tensions and conflicts that arose from the Chinese Revolution. Korea had been divided into two zones following the end of the Second World War, with the Soviet Union occupying the North and the United States occupying the South. The division of Korea was intended to be temporary, but as the Cold War intensified, 
it became clear that the situation was not going to be easily resolved. In June 1950, North Korea, under the leadership of Kim Il-sung, launched a surprise attack on South Korea in an attempt to reunify the country by force. The United States, which had been caught off guard by the attack, quickly mobilized its forces and intervened in the conflict. The Korean War would last for three years and would be one of the most costly and controversial conflicts in American history. The Korean War was a deeply ideological conflict, driven by a desire to contain the spread of communism and to protect American interests in the region. The United States saw itself as the defender of democracy and freedom, and believed that it had a duty to protect its allies against Soviet aggression. The conflict was marked by a series of dramatic battles and a brutal stalemate that lasted for much of the war. The Chinese Revolution and the Korean War had profound implications for the balance of power in the region and the world at large. The Chinese Revolution brought the Communist Party to power in the most populous country in the world and demonstrated the power and appeal of communism as an ideology. The Korean War, meanwhile, was a stark reminder of the dangers posed by ideological conflict and of the limits of American power in the region. The Korean War would have far-reaching consequences for the United States and the world at large. It would cement the division of Korea and set the stage for decades of tension and conflict on the Korean Peninsula. The nuclear arms race was a product of the Cold War, a period of tension and conflict that defined the global political landscape for decades. The race for nuclear superiority was a testament to the power of science and technology, but it also represented a grave threat to the future of humanity. The nuclear arms race began in earnest with the United States testing of the atomic bomb in 1945. The test, which took place in the New Mexico desert, was a demonstration of the power of nuclear weapons and a warning to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, for its part, responded by developing its own nuclear program. In 1949, the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear bomb, and the race for nuclear superiority was underway. The nuclear arms race led to a period of intense testing and proliferation. The United States and the Soviet Union conducted hundreds of nuclear tests, both above and below ground. These tests had a devastating impact on the environment and on the health of those who were exposed to the radiation. The proliferation of nuclear weapons also became a concern. The United States and the Soviet Union were not the only nations with nuclear capabilities. By the 1960s, several other nations had developed their own nuclear programs, including France, China, and the United Kingdom. The nuclear arms race also led to a dangerous escalation of tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. The two superpowers engaged in a game of nuclear brinkmanship, each trying to outdo the other in terms of nuclear capability. The Cuban Missile Crisis, which occurred in 1962, was a tense standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union that brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. It was a stark reminder of the dangers of the nuclear arms race and the need for greater international cooperation and disarmament. The legacy of the nuclear arms race is still felt today. The proliferation of nuclear weapons remains a concern, particularly with the rise of rogue states and non-state actors. The threat of nuclear war continues to loom over the world, and the danger of accidental nuclear detonation remains a real possibility. In summary, the nuclear arms race was a product of the Cold War, a period of tension and conflict that defined the global political landscape for decades. The race for nuclear superiority was a testament to the power of science and technology, but it also represented a grave threat to the future of humanity. The nuclear arms race was a moment of great significance, one that shaped the course of history and continues to define the world in which we live. It is a reminder of the need for greater international cooperation and disarmament, and a warning of the dangers of weapons of mass destruction. In the early years of the Cold War, espionage and intelligence gathering were central components of the struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. The two superpowers were locked in a fierce competition for global dominance, and each saw intelligence gathering as a vital tool in its quest for superiority. 
The espionage and intelligence struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union would play a major role in shaping the course of the Cold War and would have far-reaching consequences for both sides. The United States and the Soviet Union both had sophisticated intelligence agencies that were tasked with gathering information and conducting covert operations. In the United States, the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, was established in 1947 to collect and analyze intelligence, while the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, was responsible for domestic intelligence gathering. In the Soviet Union, the KGB, Komitet Gusudarsvani Bizaposnosti, was the primary intelligence agency, responsible for both domestic and foreign intelligence operations. The espionage and intelligence struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union was marked by a series of high-profile incidents and dramatic operations. The most famous of these was the case of the Rosenbergs, who were accused of passing nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union in the late 1940s. The case, which led to the execution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, was a stark reminder of the dangers posed by espionage and the need for heightened security measures. In response to the espionage threat, the United States and the Soviet Union both adopted increasingly sophisticated and aggressive intelligence gathering techniques. The United States, for example, began to rely more heavily on satellite and aerial surveillance, while the Soviet Union developed advanced spy technologies, including hidden cameras and listening devices. The espionage and intelligence struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union also had important implications for the broader Cold War. Intelligence gathering was seen as a way to gain a strategic advantage in the struggle for global dominance, and both sides invested heavily in developing sophisticated intelligence networks and covert operations. The United States, for example, supported anti-communist groups in countries around the world, while the Soviet Union supported communist movements and insurgencies. The espionage and intelligence struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union would come to a head in the 1960s, with the emergence of the spy ring led by the Soviet double agent Aldrich Ames. Ames, who worked for the CIA, was able to pass a wealth of sensitive information to the Soviet Union, including the identities of American intelligence agents operating in the Soviet Union. The case was a major embarrassment for the United States and led to calls for increased security measures and tighter controls on intelligence gathering. Despite the intense competition between the United States and the Soviet Union, there were also efforts to establish lines of communication and to prevent the escalation of conflict. In the early years of the Cold War, for example, there were a number of attempts to establish a system of arms control and to reduce tensions between the two superpowers. The 1963 Limited Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited nuclear weapons testing in the atmosphere, was one of the most significant of these efforts. The espionage and intelligence struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union was a reflection of the broader conflict between the two superpowers. It was driven by a desire to gain a strategic advantage and to protect national security, but it also had important implications for the course of the Cold War. The espionage and intelligence struggle demonstrated the lengths to which each side was willing to go to gain an advantage in the struggle for global dominance, and it served as a reminder of the dangers posed by the Cold War and the need for continued vigilance and caution. Chapter 2. Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan In the annals of history, few documents have had a more profound impact on the course of world events than the Truman Doctrine. This fateful policy statement, promulgated by the United States in the aftermath of World War II, marked the beginning of a new era in international relations and set the stage for the Cold War that dominated global politics for much of the 20th century. To fully appreciate the origins and significance of the Truman Doctrine, one must first understand the context in which it emerged. In the wake of the Second World War, the world was in a state of flux. Europe lay in ruins, the victors of the war jockeyed for position, and new powers were emerging on the global stage. Against this backdrop, the United States found itself in a precarious position. As the only major power to emerge from the war relatively unscathed, it was suddenly the dominant player in international affairs. 
The question was, how would it exercise its newfound influence? The answer came in the form of the Truman Doctrine. On March 12, 1947, President Harry S. Truman addressed a joint session of Congress and laid out his vision for America's role in the post-war world. The speech was a clarion call for the United States to take an active role in containing the spread of communism around the world. I believe, Truman declared, that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. The Truman Doctrine was more than just a rhetorical flourish. It was a concrete policy with real-world implications. At its core, the doctrine was about providing military and economic aid to countries threatened by communism. This aid took many forms, including military equipment, training, and economic assistance. In practice, this meant that the United States would be directly involved in the affairs of other countries, in a way that it had never been before. The origins of the Truman Doctrine can be traced back to a number of factors. One of the most important was the Soviet Union's aggressive behavior in the years immediately following World War II. The Soviet Union, under the leadership of Joseph Stalin, was determined to spread communism around the world. This was evident in the Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe, the establishment of communist regimes in countries like Czechoslovakia and Poland, and the support for communist insurgencies in countries like Greece and Turkey. The United States and its Western allies were understandably alarmed by this behavior. They saw communism as a grave threat to their way of life, and they were determined to contain its spread. The Truman Doctrine was the manifestation of this determination. It was a clear signal to the Soviet Union that the United States would not stand idly by while it tried to spread communism around the world. The significance of the Truman Doctrine cannot be overstated. It marked a fundamental shift in American foreign policy, away from isolationism and toward active engagement in international affairs. It was also a clear signal to the rest of the world that the United States was willing to use its power to protect its interests and the interests of its allies. In many ways, the Truman Doctrine set the stage for the Cold War that would dominate international politics for much of the next four decades. But the Truman Doctrine was not without its critics. Some argued that it represented an overreach of American power, that it was too aggressive and confrontational. Others argued that it was hypocritical, given America's own history of imperialism and intervention in other countries. Still others argued that it was ultimately ineffective, that it did little to actually contain the spread of communism. These criticisms have some merit. The Truman Doctrine was at times overly aggressive. In the years following the Second World War, Greece was a country in turmoil. The country had been occupied by the Axis powers during the war, and had emerged from the conflict with a weak and divided government. In 1946, a civil war broke out between the Greek government and communist insurgents, who were seeking to establish a Soviet-style state. The conflict would have far-reaching implications for the region and for the broader struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Greek Civil War was a deeply ideological struggle, driven by a desire to shape the future of the country and to align it with one of the two superpowers. The communist insurgents, who were supported by the Soviet Union, saw themselves as part of a global movement that was working to spread communism around the world. They believed that the only way to achieve social justice and equality was through a radical transformation of society. The Greek government, for its part, saw communism as a threat to its very existence. The government was supported by the United States and its allies, who saw Greece as a key battleground in the struggle to contain the spread of communism. The United States feared that if Greece fell to the communists, it would set off a domino effect that would spread throughout the region. The Truman Doctrine, which was announced by President Harry S. Truman in March 1947, was a direct response to the situation in Greece. The doctrine was a call to arms, a rallying cry for the free world to stand up to the Soviet threat. In his speech to Congress, Truman declared that the United States would provide military and economic aid to countries threatened by communist expansion. This aid, he argued, was necessary to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. The Truman Doctrine 
had a profound impact on the course of the Greek Civil War. The United States provided substantial military and economic aid to the Greek government, which was able to turn the tide of the conflict. The aid was critical in allowing the government to defeat the communist insurgents and to establish a stable, democratic state. The Greek Civil War also had important implications for the broader Cold War. The conflict was seen as a test case for the Truman Doctrine and for the policy of containment, which sought to prevent the spread of communism. The success of the Greek government in defeating the communist insurgents was seen as a major victory for the United States and its allies, and demonstrated the power of American economic and military aid in achieving its foreign policy objectives. The Greek Civil War also had a profound impact on the region. The conflict set the stage for decades of tension and conflict in the Balkans, and contributed to the rise of authoritarian regimes in countries such as Greece and Turkey. The legacy of the conflict would be felt for years to come, as the region struggled to come to terms with its past and to forge a path forward. In summary, the Greek Civil War was a significant conflict that had far-reaching implications for the region and for the broader struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. The conflict was driven by deep ideological differences and was seen as a key battleground in the struggle to contain the spread of communism. The Truman Doctrine, which provided critical military and economic aid to the Greek government, was a key factor in allowing the government to defeat the communist insurgents and to establish a stable, democratic state. The legacy of the conflict would be felt for years to come, as the region struggled to come to terms with its past and to forge a path forward. In the annals of history, few events have had a greater impact on the course of world affairs than the Berlin blockade and the Marshall Plan. These twin policies, implemented by the United States in the aftermath of World War II, marked a turning point in international relations and set the stage for the Cold War that dominated global politics for much of the 20th century. To fully appreciate the significance of these events, one must first understand the context in which they emerged. The end of World War II left the world in a state of flux. Europe lay in ruins, the victors of the war jockeyed for position, and new powers were emerging on the global stage. Against this backdrop, the United States found itself in a precarious position. As the only major power to emerge from the war relatively unscathed, it was suddenly the dominant player in international affairs. The question was, how would it exercise its newfound influence? The answer came in the form of the Marshall Plan. In June 1947, Secretary of State George C. Marshall addressed a gathering of European diplomats at Harvard University and laid out his vision for American aid to the war-ravaged continent. The plan was simple but ambitious. The United States would provide economic aid to Europe with the goal of rebuilding its shattered economies and preventing the spread of communism. The Marshall Plan was a resounding success. In the years that followed, the United States provided billions of dollars in aid to Europe, helping to rebuild its infrastructure and jumpstart its economies. This aid had a profound impact on the continent, both economically and politically. It helped to stabilize Europe and prevent the spread of communism in the region. It also cemented the United States' role as a global superpower, a position that it would hold for much of the next century. But the Marshall Plan was not without its critics. Some argued that it represented an overreach of American power, that it was too aggressive and confrontational. Others argued that it was hypocritical, given America's own history of imperialism and intervention in other countries. Still others argued that it was ultimately ineffective, that it did little to actually contain the spread of communism. These criticisms have some merit. The Marshall Plan was, at times, overly aggressive. It did involve the United States in conflicts around the world that were not directly related to its national interests. And it did little to address the root causes of communism, such as poverty and inequality, which continued to plague much of the world in the years that followed. But despite these criticisms, the Marshall Plan remains a pivotal moment in world history. It was a clear signal to the rest of the world that the United States was committed to international engagement and to the principles of democracy and capitalism. It also set the stage for the Berlin blockade, which would test the limits of American power and influence in Europe. 
The Berlin blockade was the Soviet Union's response to the Marshall Plan. In June 1948, the Soviet Union blockaded all road, rail and water access to the city of Berlin, which was located deep within Soviet-controlled territory. The goal was to starve the city into submission and force the United States to withdraw its forces from Germany. The United States responded with a massive airlift operation, flying supplies into the city around the clock. This operation, known as the Berlin Airlift, was a remarkable feat of logistical coordination and engineering. It involved thousands of planes and millions of tons of supplies, and it lasted for over a year. The Berlin blockade was ultimately unsuccessful. The Soviet Union lifted the blockade in May 1949, and the city remained a symbol of freedom and democracy in the years that followed. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the United States faced a daunting task to rebuild a devastated Europe and Asia and to establish a new world order based on democracy and capitalism. American economic diplomacy played a central role in this effort, as the United States provided massive amounts of aid and investment to help rebuild and modernize the economies of Europe and Asia. The Marshall Plan, which was announced by Secretary of State George Marshall in 1947, was one of the most significant initiatives of American economic diplomacy in the post-war period. The plan provided billions of dollars in aid to European countries, with the goal of promoting economic recovery and stability. The Marshall Plan was a testament to the power of American economic might, and was seen as a way to prevent the spread of communism in Europe. The Marshall Plan was highly successful, helping to fuel a period of rapid economic growth and modernization in Europe. The aid provided by the United States was critical in allowing European countries to rebuild their infrastructure, to modernize their industries, and to promote economic integration. The plan also helped to establish the United States as the dominant economic power in the post-war world, and set the stage for decades of American economic dominance. In addition to the Marshall Plan, the United States also provided significant aid and investment to countries in Asia, as part of its broader effort to promote economic development and modernization. The United States was a major supporter of Japan's post-war reconstruction, providing aid and investment that helped to transform the country into an economic powerhouse. The United States also provided significant aid to South Korea, which was ravaged by the Korean War, and played a key role in the establishment of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which provided critical financial support to developing countries. American economic diplomacy in the post-war period had important implications for the broader struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. The United States saw economic development as a way to promote stability and democracy, and as a way to counter the appeal of communism. The Soviet Union, for its part, saw economic development as a way to spread communism and to establish its influence around the world. The competition between the United States and the Soviet Union was not limited to the battlefield or the realm of espionage. It was also fought in the arena of economic diplomacy, as the two superpowers sought to promote their respective visions of the world. American economic diplomacy was seen as a way to counter the Soviet threat and to promote a new world order based on democracy, free markets, and economic development. American economic diplomacy also had important implications for the United States itself. The post-war period was a time of great economic expansion and prosperity, as the United States established itself as the dominant economic power in the world. American companies and products were in high demand around the world, and American consumers enjoyed a level of material wealth that was unprecedented in history. In summary, American economic diplomacy played a central role in the post-war reconstruction and modernization of Europe and Asia. The Marshall Plan was a critical initiative that helped to fuel economic growth and stability in Europe, and set the stage for decades of American economic dominance. American economic diplomacy was seen as a way to counter the Soviet threat and to promote a new world order based on democracy, free markets, and economic development. The legacy of American economic diplomacy in the post-war period would be felt for decades to come, 
as the world struggled to come to terms with the challenges and opportunities of the modern era. In the annals of history, few individuals have had a greater impact on the course of world affairs than George C. Marshall. As the architect of the Marshall Plan, he played a pivotal role in the reconstruction of Europe in the aftermath of World War II and set the stage for the Cold War that dominated global politics for much of the 20th century. To fully appreciate the role of George Marshall in the Marshall Plan, one must first understand the context in which the plan emerged. The end of World War II left Europe in ruins. The continent had been ravaged by years of war and occupation, and its economies lay in shambles. Against this backdrop, the United States found itself in a unique position of power. As the only major power to emerge from the war relatively unscathed, it was suddenly the dominant player in international affairs. The question was, how would it exercise its newfound influence? The answer came in the form of the Marshall Plan. The plan was the brainchild of George Marshall, who was serving as Secretary of State at the time. Marshall recognized that the reconstruction of Europe was critical to the stability of the region and to the prevention of the spread of communism. He also recognized that the United States had a unique opportunity to take a leadership role in this effort. Marshall's vision was bold but simple. The United States would provide economic aid to Europe, with the goal of rebuilding its shattered economies and preventing the spread of communism. This aid would be delivered in the form of grants and loans, and it would be contingent on the adoption of policies that promoted democracy, capitalism, and free markets. Marshall's vision was not without its critics. Some argued that it represented an overreach of American power, that it was too aggressive and confrontational. Others argued that it was hypocritical, given America's own history of imperialism and intervention in other countries. Still, others argued that it was ultimately ineffective, that it did little to actually contain the spread of communism. But despite these criticisms, the Marshall Plan was a resounding success. It helped to stabilize Europe and prevent the spread of communism in the region. It also cemented the United States' role as a global superpower, a position that it would hold for much of the next century. The success of the Marshall Plan was due in large part to the leadership of George Marshall. Marshall was a career military officer who had served as Chief of Staff of the United States Army during World War II. He was widely respected for his leadership and strategic thinking, and he brought these skills to bear in the development of the Marshall Plan. Marshall was a tireless advocate for the plan, traveling extensively throughout Europe to promote its adoption. He met with leaders from all over the continent, and he listened to their concerns and ideas. He also worked tirelessly to secure funding for the plan, which was no easy feat given the opposition that it faced from some members of Congress. Marshall's leadership was critical to the success of the Marshall Plan. He was able to bring together the diverse interests of Europe and the United States, and he was able to rally support for the plan both at home and abroad. His strategic vision and leadership were instrumental in the reconstruction of Europe and in the prevention of the spread of communism. Marshall's legacy extends far beyond the Marshall Plan. He went on to serve as Secretary of Defense under President Truman, where he oversaw the development of America's nuclear arsenal and the establishment of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. He was also awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1953 for his efforts to promote peace and stability in the world. The implementation of the Marshall Plan was a monumental undertaking, one that involved enormous logistical, political, and social challenges. But despite these challenges, the plan was a resounding success. It helped to rebuild Europe's shattered economies, prevent the spread of communism, and cement the United States' position as a global superpower. To fully appreciate the challenges of implementing the Marshall Plan, one must first understand the context in which it emerged. Europe was in ruins in the aftermath of World War II. Its economies lay in shambles, and its people were struggling to survive. Against this backdrop, the United States offered a lifeline, a massive program of economic aid that would help to rebuild the continent and prevent the spread of communism. But implementing this aid was easier said than done. There were numerous logistical challenges that had to be overcome. For one thing, 
the aid had to be delivered to countries all across Europe, each with its own unique needs and challenges. This required a massive effort in coordination and logistics, as well as a significant investment in infrastructure. There were also political challenges to overcome. Some European countries were skeptical of American intentions, and there was concern that the aid would come with strings attached. There was also resistance to the idea of adopting American-style capitalism and democracy, which some saw as a threat to their own traditions and values. Despite these challenges, the Marshall Plan was ultimately a success. The United States provided over $13 billion in aid to Europe over the course of four years, an amount that represented a significant investment at the time. The aid helped to rebuild Europe's infrastructure, jumpstart its economies, and create new jobs for millions of people. One of the keys to the success of the Marshall Plan was the involvement of the European countries themselves. The plan was designed to be a collaborative effort, with European countries taking an active role in the development and implementation of the aid programs. This helped to build trust and collaboration between the United States and its European allies, and it helped to ensure that the aid was used effectively and efficiently. Another key to the success of the Marshall Plan was the focus on economic development. The aid was not just a handout, it was designed to help Europe rebuild its economies and create new opportunities for its people. This focus on economic development helped to lay the groundwork for the post-war economic boom that would transform Europe in the decades that followed. But the success of the Marshall Plan was not without its critics. Some argued that it represented an overreach of American power, that it was too aggressive and confrontational. Others argued that it was hypocritical, given America's own history of imperialism and intervention in other countries. Still others argued that it was ultimately ineffective, that it did little to actually contain the spread of communism. Despite these criticisms, however, the Marshall Plan remains a pivotal moment in world history. It marked a turning point in the reconstruction of Europe and the prevention of the spread of communism. It also set the stage for the emergence of the United States as a global superpower and a leader in international affairs. In the years that followed, the legacy of the Marshall Plan continued to resonate around the world. It served as a model for other programs of economic aid, and it helped to lay the groundwork for the creation of institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. It also helped to shape the way that Americans thought about their role in the world, and it continues to influence American foreign policy to this day. In summary, the implementation of the Marshall Plan was a monumental undertaking, one that involved enormous logistical, political, and social challenges. But despite these challenges, the plan was a resounding success. It helped to rebuild Europe's shattered economies, prevent the spread of communism, and cement the United States' position as a global superpower. As I embark upon an examination of the Marshall Plan aid to Western Europe, I am struck by the enormity of the task before me. The post-war period was one of great upheaval and uncertainty, as nations sought to rebuild and recover from the ravages of war. Against this backdrop, the Marshall Plan emerged as a bold and ambitious initiative, designed to assist the countries of Europe in their efforts to restore economic stability and prosperity. The Marshall Plan, officially known as the European Recovery Program ERP, was announced by Secretary of State George Marshall in June 1947. The plan called for the United States to provide aid to European countries that were willing to work together to implement a comprehensive program of economic recovery. The aid was offered in the form of grants, loans, and technical assistance, and was intended to help countries rebuild their infrastructure, retool their industries, and expand their exports. The Marshall Plan was a tremendous success, and it played a critical role in the post-war recovery of Western Europe. In the years that followed, the countries that received aid under the plan experienced significant economic growth and development. In this essay, I will examine the impact of the Marshall Plan on a selection of countries in Western Europe in order to gain a deeper understanding of the plan's effects and outcomes. France was one of the largest recipients of Marshall Plan aid, receiving over $2.7 billion in grants and loans between 1948 and 1951. The aid was instrumental 
in helping France to rebuild its shattered infrastructure and to modernize its industrial base. The French government used the aid to fund a variety of projects, including the construction of new highways and railroads, the modernization of its electricity grid, and the expansion of its telecommunications network. In addition to these infrastructure projects, the Marshall Plan also helped to reinvigorate the French economy by providing funding for the expansion of key industries. The French steel industry, for example, received significant support from the plan, which helped to modernize and expand its production facilities. The aid also helped to fund the development of new industries, such as electronics and petrochemicals, which helped to diversify the French economy and to create new job opportunities. Italy was another major beneficiary of the Marshall Plan, receiving over $1.5 billion in aid between 1948 and 1951. The aid was crucial in helping Italy to rebuild its infrastructure, which had been badly damaged by the war. The Italian government used the funds to repair roads, bridges and buildings, and to modernize its transportation network. The Marshall Plan also provided funding for the development of new industries such as chemicals and machinery, which helped to diversify the Italian economy and to create new job opportunities. One of the most significant outcomes of the Marshall Plan in Italy was the improvement of living standards for ordinary citizens. The aid helped to increase access to health care and education, and it provided funding for the construction of new housing. As a result, many Italians were able to enjoy a higher standard of living than they had before the war. Germany, which had been the epicenter of the war, was also a major recipient of Marshall Plan aid. The country received over $1.4 billion in aid between 1948 and 1951, which was used to fund a wide range of projects aimed at rebuilding the country's infrastructure and economy. The aid was used to repair and modernize Germany's transportation network and to fund the development of new industries, such as chemicals and electronics. The Marshall Plan was particularly important in helping to rebuild the city of Berlin, which had been badly damaged by the war. The aid was used to fund the reconstruction of buildings and infrastructure, and to provide food and other essential supplies to the city's residents. In the annals of history, few programs have had a greater impact on the course of world affairs than the Marshall Plan and the European Recovery Program. These twin initiatives, launched by the United States in the aftermath of World War II, marked a turning point in the reconstruction of Europe and set the stage for the emergence of the United States as a global superpower. To fully appreciate the significance of the Marshall Plan and the European Recovery Program, one must first understand the context in which they emerged. The end of World War II left Europe in ruins. The continent had been ravaged by years of war and occupation and its economies lay in shambles. Against this backdrop, the United States found itself in a unique position of power. As the only major power to emerge from the war relatively unscathed, it was suddenly the dominant player in international affairs. The question was, how would it exercise its newfound influence? The answer came in the form of the Marshall Plan and the European Recovery Program. These initiatives were the brainchild of Secretary of State George C. Marshall, who recognized that the reconstruction of Europe was critical to the stability of the region and to the prevention of the spread of communism. He also recognized that the United States had a unique opportunity to take a leadership role in this effort. The Marshall Plan was the centerpiece of the United States' efforts to rebuild Europe. It involved the provision of economic aid to European countries, with the goal of rebuilding their shattered economies and preventing the spread of communism. The aid was provided in the form of grants and loans, and it was contingent on the adoption of policies that promoted democracy, capitalism and free markets. The European Recovery Program was a complementary initiative that focused on the physical reconstruction of Europe. It involved the provision of aid to European countries to help them rebuild their infrastructure, including roads, bridges, and buildings. The aid was provided in the form of supplies, equipment, and technical assistance, and it helped to jumpstart the physical reconstruction of Europe. Implementing these initiatives was a monumental task. It involved enormous logistical, political, and social challenges. For one thing, the aid had to be delivered to countries all across Europe, 
each with its own unique needs and challenges. This required a massive effort in coordination and logistics, as well as a significant investment in infrastructure. There were also political challenges to overcome. Some European countries were skeptical of American intentions, and there was concern that the aid would come with strings attached. There was also resistance to the idea of adopting American-style capitalism and democracy, which some saw as a threat to their own traditions and values. Despite these challenges, the Marshall Plan and the European Recovery Program were ultimately a success. The United States provided over $13 billion in aid to Europe over the course of four years, an amount that represented a significant investment at the time. The aid helped to rebuild Europe's infrastructure, jumpstart its economies, and create new jobs for millions of people. One of the keys to the success of these initiatives was the involvement of the European countries themselves. The plan was designed to be a collaborative effort, with European countries taking an active role in the development and implementation of the aid programs. This helped to build trust and collaboration between the United States and its European allies, and it helped to ensure that the aid was used effectively and efficiently. Another key to the success of the Marshall Plan and the European Recovery Program was the focus on economic and physical development. The aid was not just a handout, it was designed to help Europe rebuild its economies and physical infrastructure and create new opportunities for its people. This focus on economic and physical development helped to lay the groundwork for the post-war economic boom that would transform Europe in the decades that followed. As I delve into the study of the Marshall Plan and its impact on European integration, I am reminded of the complexities of the post-war period. Europe had emerged from the Second World War battered and bruised, with its economies shattered and its social fabric frayed. Against this backdrop, the Marshall Plan emerged as a beacon of hope, offering much-needed aid and support to a continent in need. The Marshall Plan, or the European Recovery Program, ERP, was announced by Secretary of State George Marshall in June 1947. The plan offered aid to European countries that were willing to work together to implement a comprehensive program of economic recovery. The aid was provided in the form of grants, loans, and technical assistance, and was intended to help countries rebuild their infrastructure, retool their industries, and expand their exports. However, the Marshall Plan was more than just an economic aid package. It also played a key role in promoting European integration, laying the groundwork for the development of a more united Europe. The plan recognized that the fate of Europe was intertwined, and that the only way to achieve lasting peace and prosperity was through cooperation and collaboration. The Marshall Plan marked a turning point in the history of Europe. For the first time, European nations began to work together in a concerted effort to rebuild their economies and societies. The aid provided by the plan helped to create a sense of shared purpose and common identity, and it encouraged European nations to set aside their differences and work towards a common goal. The Marshall Plan was also instrumental in the formation of the European Coal and Steel Community, ECSC, which was established in 1951. The ECSC was the first step towards the creation of a more integrated Europe, and it represented a bold and visionary effort to bring European nations closer together. The ECSC was formed by six founding members, France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Its primary objective was to create a common market for coal and steel, which were essential inputs for heavy industry. The ECSC was a historic achievement, and it represented a major step towards the development of a more united Europe. It laid the groundwork for the formation of the European Economic Community, EEC which was established in 1957. The EEC was a more comprehensive economic union, which aimed to create a common market for goods, services, and capital. The formation of the EEC was a direct outgrowth of the Marshall Plan. The aid provided by the plan helped to create a sense of shared purpose and common identity among European nations, and it encouraged them to work together towards a common goal. The Marshall Plan also helped to create the conditions for economic growth and prosperity, which made the development of a more integrated Europe possible. The impact of the Marshall Plan on European integration was profound and far-reaching. 
it helped to create a new sense of shared purpose and common identity among European nations, and it encouraged them to work together towards a common goal. The plan also helped to create the conditions for economic growth and prosperity, which made the development of a more integrated Europe possible. The Marshall Plan was not without its critics, however. Some argued that the aid provided by the plan was too closely tied to American interests and that it was designed to promote American economic and political influence in Europe. Others argued that the plan was too focused on Western Europe and that it ignored the needs of Eastern Europe. Despite these criticisms, the Marshall Plan remains a landmark achievement in the history of European integration. It helped to create a new sense of shared purpose and common identity among European nations, and it encouraged them to work together towards a common goal. The plan also helped to create the conditions for economic growth and prosperity, which made the development of a more integrated Europe possible. The Marshall Plan was a pivotal moment in the Cold War, marking a turning point in the reconstruction of Europe and the prevention of the spread of communism. It had a profound impact on the dynamics of the Cold War, setting the stage for the United States to emerge as a global superpower and establishing a new order in international relations. To fully appreciate the impact of the Marshall Plan on the Cold War, one must first understand the context in which it emerged. The end of World War II left Europe in ruins. The continent had been ravaged by years of war and occupation, and its economies lay in shambles. Against this backdrop, the United States found itself in a unique position of power. As the only major power to emerge from the war relatively unscathed, it was suddenly the dominant player in international affairs. The question was, how would it exercise its newfound influence? The answer came in the form of the Marshall Plan. The plan was the brainchild of Secretary of State George C. Marshall, who recognized that the reconstruction of Europe was critical to the stability of the region and to the prevention of the spread of communism. He also recognized that the United States had a unique opportunity to take a leadership role in this effort. The Marshall Plan was designed to promote democracy, capitalism, and free markets in Europe. It involved the provision of economic aid to European countries with the goal of rebuilding their shattered economies and preventing the spread of communism. The aid was provided in the form of grants and loans, and it was contingent on the adoption of policies that promoted democracy and free markets. The impact of the Marshall Plan on the Cold War was significant. The plan helped to rebuild Europe's economies, stabilizing the region and preventing the spread of communism. It also established the United States as a global superpower and a leader in international affairs. The Marshall Plan helped to contain Soviet expansion in Europe. By providing economic aid to European countries, the plan helped to build strong, stable, and prosperous democracies that were less vulnerable to Soviet influence. It also helped to create a sense of solidarity among the Western powers, making it more difficult for the Soviet Union to divide and conquer. The Marshall Plan also established a new order in international relations. It helped to promote the idea of collective security, in which nations would work together to prevent the spread of communism and promote democratic values. This idea was later enshrined in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, which was established in 1949 to promote collective defense among the Western powers. The Marshall Plan also had a profound impact on the United States itself. It helped to establish the country as a global superpower and a leader in international affairs. The United States became the dominant economic power in the world, and its policies and values became a model for other nations to follow. The impact of the Marshall Plan on the Cold War was not without its critics. Some argued that it represented an overreach of American power that it was too aggressive and confrontational. Others argued that it was hypocritical, given America's own history of imperialism and intervention in other countries. Still others argued that it was ultimately ineffective, that it did little to actually contain the spread of communism. Despite these criticisms, however, the Marshall Plan remains a pivotal moment in world history. It marked a turning point in the reconstruction of Europe and the prevention of the spread of communism.
it also set the stage for the emergence of the United States as a global superpower and a leader in international affairs. In summary, the Marshall Plan had a profound impact on the dynamics of the Cold War. It helped to rebuild Europe's economies, stabilizing the region and preventing the spread of communism. It also established the United States as a global superpower and a leader in international affairs. Chapter 3. The Berlin Blockade and Airlift As I delve into the history of the Soviet blockade of West Berlin, I am struck by the profound implications of this event on the course of post-war Europe. The blockade, which lasted from June 1948 to May 1949, was a dramatic escalation of tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers. It also marked a turning point in the early stages of the Cold War and set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The blockade was the culmination of a series of events that had taken place in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Germany had been divided into four occupation zones, with the Soviet Union taking control of the eastern part of the country and the United States, Britain and France taking control of the western part. The city of Berlin, which was located in the Soviet zone, was also divided into four sectors. Tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers had been simmering for some time, but they came to a head in 1948, when the Western powers announced plans to create a new currency in their sectors of Germany. The Soviet Union saw this move as a direct challenge to its authority and responded by blockading all road, rail and water access to West Berlin, which was located deep in the Soviet zone. The blockade was a daring move by the Soviet Union, designed to put pressure on the Western powers and to test their resolve. It was also a risky move, however, as it risked provoking a military response from the United States and its allies. The response of the Western powers was swift and determined. The United States responded by launching a massive airlift, designed to supply the residents of West Berlin with food, fuel, and other essential supplies. The airlift was a remarkable feat of logistics, and it demonstrated the commitment of the United States to defend the freedom and independence of West Berlin. The blockade had far-reaching implications for the course of the Cold War. It marked a dramatic escalation of tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and it set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The blockade also had a profound impact on the people of West Berlin, who were forced to endure months of isolation and deprivation. Despite the challenges they faced, the residents of West Berlin refused to be cowed by the Soviet blockade. They rallied around the airlift, and they demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity. The blockade also helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of West Berlin, who saw themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of Soviet aggression. The blockade was eventually lifted in May 1949, after the Soviet Union realized that it had failed to achieve its objectives. The United States and its allies had successfully demonstrated their commitment to defending the freedom and independence of West Berlin, and the Soviet Union had been forced to back down. The legacy of the Soviet blockade of West Berlin was profound and far-reaching. It helped to crystallize the political and military divide between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and it set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The blockade also had a profound impact on the people of West Berlin, who demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity. In summary, the Soviet blockade of West Berlin was a pivotal event in the history of post-war Europe. It marked a turning point in the early stages of the Cold War and set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the Soviet Union and the Western powers. The blockade also had a profound impact on the people of West Berlin, who demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity. The Potsdam Conference marked a turning point in the history of Europe. The conference, which was held in Potsdam, Germany in 1945, was the last of the major wartime conferences held between the Allied powers during World War II. At the conference, the fate of post-war Europe was decided, 
with far-reaching consequences that would shape the course of world affairs for decades to come. One of the most significant outcomes of the conference was the division of Berlin, a decision that would have a profound impact on the history of Germany and Europe. The Potsdam Conference was attended by the leaders of the three major Allied powers, the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain. The conference was held at a time when the Allies had already achieved a decisive victory over Germany, and the main focus of the conference was on the post-war settlement of Europe. One of the key issues discussed at the conference was the division of Germany. The Allies had already agreed to the unconditional surrender of Germany, and the question was how to divide the country and administer its post-war reconstruction. The Soviet Union was eager to ensure that it had a significant role in the reconstruction of Germany, and it pushed for a zone of occupation in eastern Germany that would be under Soviet control. Another key issue discussed at the conference was the future of Berlin. The city had been heavily bombed during the war, and it was in ruins. The Allies were divided over the fate of the city, with the Soviet Union pushing for the city to be divided into four sectors, each under the control of one of the Allied powers. The decision to divide Berlin was one of the most significant outcomes of the Potsdam Conference. The city was divided into four sectors, with the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union each controlling one sector. The division of Berlin reflected the broader division of Germany, and it would have profound implications for the history of Europe. The division of Berlin created a stark division between the East and the West, with the Soviet-controlled sector becoming part of the Communist East and the other three sectors becoming part of the Democratic West. This division would become one of the defining features of the Cold War, and it would have a profound impact on the history of Germany and Europe for decades to come. The division of Berlin also created a significant challenge for the administration of the city. The four sectors of the city were administered separately, with each sector having its own government and bureaucracy. This created significant logistical challenges and it made it difficult to implement a coherent policy for the administration of the city. The division of Berlin also created a significant challenge for the people who lived in the city. Families were divided by the border, with some members living in the Democratic West and others living in the Communist East. The division of the city also created significant economic disparities between the two sides with the Communist East lagging far behind the Democratic West in terms of economic development and living standards. Despite these challenges, the division of Berlin would remain in place for decades. The city would become a symbol of the Cold War, with the Berlin Wall serving as a stark reminder of the division between the East and the West. The city would also become the focus of significant political tension, with a number of high-profile incidents, such as the construction of the wall and the airlift of supplies to the city, marking important moments in the history of the Cold War. In summary, the Potsdam Conference marked a turning point in the history of Europe. The conference was a key moment in the post-war settlement of Europe, and it had far-reaching consequences that would shape the course of world affairs for decades to come. The Berlin Airlift, which lasted from June 1948 to September 1949, was a massive logistical effort that demonstrated the resolve of the United States to defend the freedom and independence of West Berlin. It was also a turning point in the early stages of the Cold War, and it set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The decision to launch the Berlin Airlift was a bold and risky move by the United States. The Soviet Union had blockaded all road, rail and water access to West Berlin, which was located deep in the Soviet zone. The residents of West Berlin were cut off from the rest of the world and were facing the very real prospect of starvation and deprivation. The United States responded by launching a massive airlift designed to supply the residents of West Berlin with food, fuel, and other essential supplies. The airlift was a logistical feat of extraordinary proportions and it required the cooperation and coordination of military, civilian, and government organizations. The United States Air Force, in particular, played a key role in the airlift, deploying hundreds of aircraft to transport supplies to West Berlin. The Berlin airlift was not without its challenges, however. 
The airlift was subject to intense scrutiny and opposition from the Soviet Union, which viewed it as a provocative move by the United States. The Soviet Union also attempted to disrupt the airlift by jamming radio signals, shooting down aircraft, and imposing various other obstacles. Despite these challenges, the United States persevered, and the airlift continued for over a year. The airlift demonstrated the resolve of the United States to defend the freedom and independence of West Berlin, and it also helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of West Berlin. The Berlin airlift was a defining moment in the history of the Cold War. It marked a dramatic escalation of tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and it set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The airlift also had a profound impact on the people of West Berlin, who saw themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of Soviet aggression. The legacy of the Berlin airlift was profound and far-reaching. It demonstrated the resolve of the United States to defend the freedom and independence of West Berlin, and it helped to cement the political and military alliance between the United States and its Western allies. The airlift also helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of West Berlin, who saw themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of Soviet aggression. The success of the Berlin airlift was not without its critics, however. Some argued that the airlift was too costly and that it risked provoking a military response from the Soviet Union. Others argued that the airlift was not sustainable in the long term and that it would ultimately fail to achieve its objectives. Despite these criticisms, the Berlin airlift remains a landmark achievement in the history of American foreign policy. It demonstrated the resolve of the United States to defend the freedom and independence of its allies, and it helped to set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The airlift also helped to create the conditions for a more united and integrated Europe, which was able to emerge from the shadow of the Cold War and to build a more prosperous and peaceful future. The Berlin airlift was a pivotal moment in the history of the Cold War. The airlift, which was launched in 1948 in response to the Soviet blockade of West Berlin, represented a major logistical and political challenge for the United States and its allies. Yet, despite the significant obstacles that had to be overcome, the airlift ultimately proved to be a remarkable success, highlighting the resilience and determination of the Western powers in the face of Soviet aggression. To fully appreciate the challenges and logistics of the Berlin airlift, one must first understand the context in which it emerged. In the aftermath of World War II, Germany had been divided into four occupation zones, with the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union each controlling a zone. Berlin, which was located in the Soviet zone, had also been divided into four sectors, with each sector controlled by one of the Allied powers. In 1948, the Soviet Union, seeking to exert greater control over its zone, blockaded West Berlin, which was located in the sectors controlled by the Western powers. The blockade was an attempt to force the Western powers to abandon their position in Berlin and hand over control of the city to the Soviet Union. The blockade presented a major logistical and political challenge for the Western powers. West Berlin, which was home to more than two million people, was cut off from the rest of the world, with no access to food, fuel, or other essential supplies. The Western powers had to find a way to supply the city and ensure that its people were able to survive. The answer came in the form of the Berlin Airlift. The airlift involved the transportation of essential supplies, such as food, fuel, and medicine, to West Berlin by air. The airlift was a major logistical undertaking, involving the coordination of thousands of flights, the construction of new runways, and the establishment of new supply lines. One of the biggest challenges of the airlift was the sheer scale of the operation. The Western powers had to transport more than 5,000 tons of supplies per day to West Berlin, an amount that required the use of hundreds of planes and thousands of personnel. This placed a significant strain on the resources of the Western powers, which had to divert significant amounts of personnel and resources to the airlift effort. Another major challenge of the airlift was the weather. Berlin was located in a region with harsh winters and frequent fog, which made flying difficult and dangerous. 
The Western powers had to develop new navigational techniques and invest in new equipment such as radar to help pilots navigate in poor weather conditions. Yet another challenge of the airlift was the political tension that surrounded it. The Soviet Union viewed the airlift as a challenge to its authority and a provocation, and it responded with a range of measures designed to disrupt the airlift, such as jamming radio signals and harassing aircraft. The Western powers had to find ways to overcome these obstacles and ensure that the airlift continued to operate despite Soviet efforts to disrupt it. Despite these challenges, the Berlin airlift ultimately proved to be a remarkable success. The airlift continued for more than a year, with the Western powers transporting more than 2.3 million tons of supplies to West Berlin by air. The airlift helped to ensure that the people of West Berlin were able to survive and thrive and it demonstrated the resilience and determination of the Western powers in the face of Soviet aggression. The success of the airlift was due to a range of factors. One of the most important was the skill and dedication of the personnel involved in the airlift. As I reflect upon life in divided Berlin during the Soviet blockade, I am struck by the profound hardships and challenges faced by the residents of this besieged city. Berlin had been divided into four sectors at the end of the Second World War, with the Soviet Union taking control of the eastern part of the city and the Western powers taking control of the western part. The blockade, which lasted from June 1948 to May 1949, saw the Soviet Union cut off all road, rail and water access to West Berlin, which was located deep in the Soviet zone. The residents of West Berlin were effectively cut off from the rest of the world, and were facing the very real prospect of starvation and deprivation. Life in divided Berlin during the blockade was characterized by scarcity and deprivation. The residents of West Berlin were forced to endure months of isolation and hardship as they struggled to survive in the face of Soviet aggression. Food and other essential supplies were in short supply and the residents of West Berlin were forced to make do with meager rations of bread, potatoes and other basic provisions. The situation in East Berlin was markedly different, as the Soviet Union continued to provide the eastern part of the city with essential supplies. However, life in East Berlin was also marked by hardship and deprivation, as the Soviet Union imposed strict controls on the population and restricted basic freedoms. The blockade had far-reaching implications for the social fabric of the city. Families were separated by the blockade, with some members trapped in the Soviet zone and others in the Western Zone. The blockade also had a profound impact on the economy of the city, as businesses and industries were forced to shut down in the face of Soviet aggression. Despite the challenges they faced, the residents of West Berlin refused to be cowed by the Soviet blockade. They rallied around the Berlin airlift, and they demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity. The Berlin Airlift, which was launched by the United States to supply the residents of West Berlin with food, fuel, and other essential supplies, provided a lifeline for the people of the city, and it helped to create a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of West Berlin. The Berlin Airlift also helped to create a sense of international solidarity, as countries from around the world contributed to the effort. The airlift demonstrated the resolve of the Western powers to defend the freedom and independence of West Berlin, and it helped to lay the groundwork for a more united and integrated Europe. The legacy of the Soviet blockade of Berlin is profound and far-reaching. It marked a dramatic escalation of tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and it set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The blockade also had a profound impact on the people of Berlin, who were forced to endure months of isolation and hardship in the face of Soviet aggression. Despite the challenges they faced, the people of Berlin refused to be cowed by the blockade. They rallied around the Berlin airlift, and they demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity. The blockade helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of West Berlin, who saw themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of Soviet aggression. In summary, life in divided Berlin during the Soviet blockade was characterized by hardship and deprivation. The residents of West Berlin were forced to endure months of isolation and deprivation, 
as they struggled to survive in the face of Soviet aggression. Despite the challenges they faced, the people of Berlin refused to be cowed by the blockade. They rallied around the Berlin airlift, and they demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity. The Berlin airlift was one of the most remarkable logistical achievements of the Cold War. The airlift, which was launched in 1948 in response to the Soviet blockade of West Berlin, was a major undertaking that required the cooperation of the Western powers and the coordination of thousands of flights. At the heart of the airlift effort was the Royal Air Force, RAF, which played a key role in the success of the operation. The RAF's role in the airlift was significant. The RAF was responsible for a significant portion of the airlift effort, transporting essential supplies such as food, fuel, and medicine to West Berlin. The airlift involved the use of a variety of aircraft, including transport planes, fighter jets, and helicopters, and the RAF provided a significant number of these planes. One of the key strengths of the RAF in the airlift effort was its experience in air transport. The RAF had a long history of transporting troops and supplies, and it had a deep understanding of the challenges and logistics involved in such operations. This experience proved invaluable in the airlift effort, as the RAF was able to provide skilled pilots, ground crews, and other personnel who were able to ensure that the airlift continued to operate smoothly, despite the significant challenges that had to be overcome. Another key strength of the RAF in the airlift effort was its technological expertise. The RAF was a pioneer in the development of new technologies, such as radar and navigational aids, that were essential to the success of the airlift. The RAF also invested heavily in new equipment, such as transport planes and helicopters, that were specifically designed to meet the unique challenges of the airlift effort. The RAF's role in the airlift was also significant from a political perspective. The RAF was a key symbol of British power and prestige, and its participation in the airlift demonstrated the United Kingdom's commitment to the Western Alliance and to the defense of West Berlin. The RAF's involvement in the airlift helped to establish a sense of solidarity and cooperation among the Western powers, which was essential to the success of the operation. Despite the significant challenges involved in the airlift effort, the RAF played a crucial role in the success of the operation. The RAF transported more than 400,000 tons of supplies to West Berlin, and it operated more than 70% of the transport planes used in the airlift. The RAF's pilots and ground crews worked tirelessly to ensure that the airlift continued to operate smoothly, despite the significant obstacles that had to be overcome. The RAF's role in the airlift effort had a profound impact on the history of the Cold War. The airlift demonstrated the Western powers' commitment to democracy and freedom, and it helped to establish the United States and its allies as a bulwark against Soviet aggression. The RAF's participation in the airlift also helped to cement the United Kingdom's position as a key player in the Western alliance, and it highlighted the country's unique expertise and technological prowess in the field of aviation. In summary, the Royal Air Force played a crucial role in the Berlin airlift. The RAF's experience in air transport, technological expertise, and political symbolism were all essential to the success of the airlift effort. The RAF's participation in the airlift helped to establish a sense of solidarity and cooperation among the Western powers, and it demonstrated the United Kingdom's commitment to the defense of West Berlin and to the principles of democracy and freedom. The RAF's role in the airlift effort remains a testament to the dedication and skill of the men and women who worked tirelessly to ensure the success of the operation. As I reflect upon the Berlin blockade and its impact on the formation of the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, I am struck by the profound historical significance of this event. The blockade, which lasted from June 1948 to May 1949, was a dramatic escalation of tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers. It also marked a turning point in the early stages of the Cold War, and it set the stage for the formation of a new, democratic Germany. The blockade had a profound impact on the political and social fabric of Germany. The country had been divided into four occupation zones at the end of the Second World War, with the Soviet Union taking control of the eastern part of the country and the United States, Britain and France taking control of the western part. 
The blockade saw the Soviet Union cut off all road, rail and water access to West Berlin, which was located deep in the Soviet zone. The residents of West Berlin were effectively cut off from the rest of the world, and were facing the very real prospect of starvation and deprivation. The Western powers responded by launching the Berlin Airlift, which was designed to supply the residents of West Berlin with food, fuel and other essential supplies. The airlift was a remarkable feat of logistics, and it demonstrated the commitment of the Western powers to defend the freedom and independence of West Berlin. The airlift also helped to create a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of West Berlin. The blockade helped to galvanize support for the idea of a new, democratic Germany. The Western powers recognized that the fate of Germany was inextricably tied to the fate of Europe, and that the only way to achieve lasting peace and prosperity was through cooperation and collaboration. The blockade helped to create a sense of urgency and purpose around the idea of a new, democratic Germany, and it provided a rallying cry for those who sought to break free from the constraints of the past. The blockade also helped to create the conditions for the formation of the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany. The Western powers recognized that the old order in Germany had been irreparably damaged by the Second World War, and that a new, democratic Germany was needed to move forward. The formation of the Federal Republic of Germany in May 1949 marked a major milestone in the history of Germany, and it set the stage for a new, democratic era in German history. The Federal Republic of Germany was established as a democratic federal state, with a constitution that guaranteed individual rights and freedoms. The new state was also committed to the principles of free market economics and social democracy. The formation of the Federal Republic of Germany represented a bold and visionary effort to break with the past and to create a new democratic Germany that was committed to the principles of freedom, democracy and prosperity. The formation of the Federal Republic of Germany was not without its challenges, however. The country remained divided with East Germany remaining under Soviet control. The legacy of the Second World War also cast a long shadow over the new state, as Germany struggled to come to terms with the atrocities of the past. The Federal Republic of Germany also faced the challenge of building a new, democratic society in the midst of the Cold War, and of forging a new national identity that was based on the principles of freedom and democracy. Despite these challenges, the formation of the Federal Republic of Germany represented a major milestone in the history of Germany, and it set the stage for a new, democratic era in German history. The blockade had helped to create the conditions for the formation of the new state, and it had demonstrated the commitment of the Western powers to defend the freedom and independence of West Berlin. The Berlin blockade was a pivotal moment in the history of the Cold War. The blockade which was launched by the Soviet Union in 1948 in response to the Western powers' decision to introduce a new currency in West Germany, was a clear demonstration of the Soviet Union's determination to exert its influence in Europe. Soviet diplomacy played a key role in the Berlin blockade, as the Soviet Union sought to use the blockade as a means of advancing its own strategic goals. The Soviet Union's diplomatic strategy during the Berlin blockade was multifaceted. On the one hand, the Soviet Union sought to use the blockade as a means of strengthening its own position in Europe. The Soviet Union believed that the blockade would force the Western powers to abandon their position in Berlin and hand over control of the city to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union also believed that the blockade would help to create divisions among the Western powers and weaken the Western alliance. On the other hand, the Soviet Union sought to use the blockade as a means of demonstrating its commitment to the principles of communism and solidarity with other communist countries. The Soviet Union believed that the blockade would help to rally support for communism in other countries, particularly in Europe. The Soviet Union's diplomatic strategy during the Berlin blockade was marked by a number of key features. One of the most significant was the use of propaganda. The Soviet Union used a range of propaganda techniques to promote its position and to discredit the Western powers. This included the use of posters, films, and other forms of media 
as well as the deployment of agents and other operatives to spread Soviet propaganda in Western Europe. Another key feature of the Soviet Union's diplomatic strategy during the Berlin blockade was the use of economic pressure. The Soviet Union sought to use its control of the eastern zone of Germany as a means of exerting economic pressure on West Berlin. The Soviet Union believed that this economic pressure would force the Western powers to abandon their position in Berlin and hand over control of the city to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union also sought to use diplomatic channels to advance its position during the Berlin blockade. The Soviet Union engaged in a series of negotiations with the Western powers, seeking to use these negotiations as a means of demonstrating its commitment to diplomacy and its willingness to engage in dialogue. However, the Soviet Union's diplomatic efforts were often marked by a lack of trust and a reluctance to compromise, which made it difficult to achieve any meaningful progress. In the end, the Soviet Union's diplomatic strategy during the Berlin blockade was ultimately unsuccessful. The Western powers refused to abandon their position in Berlin, and the airlift, which was launched in response to the blockade, ultimately proved to be a remarkable success. The Soviet Union's efforts to use the blockade as a means of exerting its influence in Europe ultimately backfired, as the blockade helped to solidify the Western alliance and to rally support for democracy and freedom. In summary, the Soviet Union's diplomatic strategy during the Berlin blockade was a key element of the Cold War. The Soviet Union sought to use the blockade as a means of advancing its own strategic goals, and it deployed a range of techniques including propaganda, economic pressure, and diplomacy to achieve its objectives. However, the Soviet Union's efforts were ultimately unsuccessful, as the Western powers refused to abandon their position in Berlin and the airlift ultimately proved to be a remarkable success. The Soviet Union's diplomatic strategy during the Berlin blockade serves as a reminder of the complex and challenging nature of international diplomacy and the need for careful and strategic thinking in the pursuit of diplomatic goals. The Berlin blockade and airlift were two of the most significant events in the early years of the Cold War. These events had a profound impact on the geopolitical landscape of Europe and the world and they played a key role in shaping the trajectory of the Cold War. The Berlin blockade was launched by the Soviet Union in 1948, in response to the Western powers' decision to introduce a new currency in West Germany. The Soviet Union sought to use the blockade as a means of exerting its influence in Europe and of forcing the Western powers to abandon their position in Berlin. The blockade represented a significant escalation in the tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and it raised the prospect of a major conflict between these two blocs. The Western powers responded to the blockade with the Berlin Airlift, which involved the transportation of essential supplies, such as food, fuel, and medicine, to West Berlin by air. The airlift was a major logistical undertaking, involving the coordination of thousands of flights, the construction of new runways, and the establishment of new supply lines. The airlift represented a clear demonstration of the West's commitment to defending democracy and freedom, and it helped to solidify the Western alliance in the face of Soviet aggression. The significance of the Berlin blockade and airlift was multifaceted. One of the most important was the impact that these events had on the geopolitical landscape of Europe. The Berlin blockade and airlift helped to establish a clear divide between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and they contributed to the emergence of a bipolar world in which two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, vied for global dominance. The Berlin blockade and airlift also highlighted the importance of Germany as a key battleground in the Cold War, and they set the stage for the division of Germany into two separate states, which would endure until the end of the Cold War. Another significant aspect of the Berlin blockade and airlift was the impact that these events had on the public perception of the Cold War. The Berlin blockade and airlift were widely covered by the media, and they captured the attention of people around the world. These events helped to raise awareness of the tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and they helped to establish a sense of urgency around the need to defend democracy and freedom. The Berlin blockade and airlift also served as a reminder of the high stakes involved in the Cold War and of the need for careful and strategic thinking in the pursuit of diplomatic goals. 
The Berlin blockade and airlift also had a significant impact on the military and technological capabilities of the Western powers. The airlift represented a major logistical challenge, and it required the development of new technologies and the deployment of significant resources. The Western powers were able to successfully meet this challenge, demonstrating their technological and logistical expertise, and helping to establish a sense of confidence in their military and technological capabilities. In summary, the Berlin blockade and airlift were two of the most significant events in the early years of the Cold War. These events helped to establish a clear divide between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and they contributed to the emergence of a bipolar world in which two superpowers vied for global dominance. The Berlin blockade and airlift also had a significant impact on the public perception of the Cold War, on the military and technological capabilities of the Western powers, and on the geopolitical landscape of Europe and the world. The Berlin blockade and airlift serve as a powerful reminder of the complex and challenging nature of international diplomacy and of the importance of careful and strategic thinking in the pursuit of diplomatic goals. Chapter 4 The Division of Korea and the Origins of the Korean War The Berlin blockade, which had lasted from June 1948 to May 1949, had been a dramatic escalation of tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western powers. It had cut off all road, rail and water access to West Berlin, which was located deep in the Soviet zone and had threatened the very survival of the city. The end of the blockade marked a turning point in the early stages of the Cold War. The Western powers had responded to the blockade by launching the Berlin Airlift, which was designed to supply the residents of West Berlin with food, fuel and other essential supplies. The airlift had been a remarkable feat of logistics, and it had demonstrated the commitment of the Western powers to defend the freedom and independence of West Berlin. The end of the blockade was the result of intense negotiations between the Soviet Union and the Western powers. The Soviet Union had come under increasing international pressure to end the blockade, and had recognized that the continuation of the blockade would only serve to isolate the Soviet Union further from the international community. The Western powers, for their part, had demonstrated their resolve and determination to defend the freedom and independence of West Berlin. The end of the blockade had profound implications for the future of Germany and Europe. It had helped to galvanize support for the idea of a new, democratic Germany, and had set the stage for the formation of the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, just a few months later. The end of the blockade had also helped to create a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of West Berlin, who had come to see themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of Soviet aggression. The end of the blockade had also marked a major milestone in the history of the Cold War. It had demonstrated the commitment of the Western powers to defend the freedom and independence of their allies and had set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The end of the blockade had also created the conditions for a more united and integrated Europe, which was able to emerge from the shadow of the Cold War and to build a more prosperous and peaceful future. The legacy of the Berlin blockade and its end is profound and far-reaching. It marked a turning point in the early stages of the Cold War and set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The blockade had helped to create the conditions for the formation of the Federal Republic of Germany, and had helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of West Berlin. The end of the blockade had also demonstrated the resolve and determination of the Western powers to defend the freedom and independence of their allies. In summary, the end of the Berlin blockade was a momentous event in the history of the Cold War. It marked a turning point in the early stages of the confrontation between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, and it set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation. The end of the blockade had profound implications for the future of Germany and Europe, and had helped to create the conditions for a more united and integrated continent. The end of the blockade had also demonstrated the resolve and determination of the Western powers to defend the freedom and independence of their allies 
and had helped to create a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of West Berlin. The North Korean invasion, which began on June 25, 1950, marked the first major conflict of the Cold War and set the stage for a prolonged period of military confrontation between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies. The North Korean invasion of South Korea was a dramatic escalation of tensions between the two Koreas, which had been divided at the end of the Second World War. The invasion caught the United States and its allies by surprise and threatened to destabilize the fragile balance of power in the region. The United States, which had only recently emerged from the Second World War, was still in the process of rebuilding and rearming and was ill-prepared to respond to this new threat. The early stages of the war were marked by intense fighting and rapid territorial gains by the North Koreans. The United States and its allies were caught off guard and were forced to retreat rapidly in the face of the North Korean advance. The North Koreans quickly seized control of the capital city of Seoul and threatened to conquer the entire country. The United States responded by launching a series of counteroffensives designed to drive the North Koreans back across the border. The first of these counteroffensives, launched in September 1950, was successful in pushing the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel, which divided the two Koreas. However, the Chinese, who had recently come to power under the leadership of Mao Zedong, soon intervened in the conflict, and the tide of the war began to turn in favor of the North Koreans. The Korean War had far-reaching implications for the future of Asia and the world. The conflict demonstrated the willingness of the United States and its allies to defend the principles of freedom and democracy and to confront aggression and tyranny wherever they may be found. The Korean War also demonstrated the resolve and determination of the Chinese and the Soviet Union to challenge the power and influence of the United States and its allies. The Korean War also had a profound impact on the people of Korea. The country had been divided at the end of the Second World War, and the war had only served to deepen the divisions between the North and the South. The conflict had resulted in the loss of countless lives and had devastated the economy and infrastructure of both North and South Korea. Despite the challenges they faced, the United States and its allies refused to be cowed by the North Korean invasion. They demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity and worked tirelessly to defend the principles of freedom and democracy. The Korean War helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of South Korea, who saw themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of aggression and tyranny. In summary, the North Korean invasion and the early stages of the Korean War were a turning point in the history of the Cold War. The invasion marked the first major conflict of the Cold War, and set the stage for a prolonged period of military confrontation between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies. The conflict had far-reaching implications for the future of Asia and the world, and helped to create a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of South Korea. Despite the challenges they faced, the United States and its allies demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity and worked tirelessly to defend the principles of freedom and democracy. The concept of intervention in international affairs is one that has been debated for centuries. In the aftermath of World War II, the United States, along with its allies, saw the need for intervention in the affairs of other nations in order to maintain stability and promote democracy. The United Nations was established as a forum for this intervention and the United States became a major proponent of UN action in the post-war era. The American and United Nations intervention can be seen in a number of different contexts. The United States and its allies saw themselves as the champions of democracy and freedom in the aftermath of World War II, and they believed that it was their responsibility to promote these values around the world. The United Nations was established as a means of achieving this goal, and the United States played a major role in shaping the institution and promoting its values. One of the most significant examples of American and United Nations intervention was the Korean War. In 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea, and the United Nations Security Council voted to send a multinational force to repel the invasion. 
The United States played a leading role in this intervention, providing troops, resources, and strategic guidance. The Korean War was a clear demonstration of the United States' commitment to intervention in the affairs of other nations, and it highlighted the importance of the United Nations in achieving this goal. Another significant example of American and United Nations intervention was the Gulf War. In 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and the United Nations Security Council voted to authorize the use of force to expel Iraqi forces from Kuwait. The United States once again played a leading role in this intervention, providing troops, resources, and strategic guidance. The Gulf War was a clear demonstration of the United States' commitment to promoting democracy and stability in the Middle East, and it highlighted the importance of the United Nations in achieving this goal. Despite these successes, American and United Nations intervention has also been criticized for its failures. The Vietnam War, for example, was a controversial and ultimately unsuccessful intervention that highlighted the limits of American and United Nations power. The war in Afghanistan, which began in 2001, has also been criticized for its lack of success and the ongoing instability in the region. In summary, American and United Nations intervention has been a key feature of the post-war era. The United States and its allies have seen themselves as champions of democracy and freedom, and they have been willing to intervene in the affairs of other nations to promote these values. The United Nations has played a key role in this intervention, providing a forum for international cooperation and a means of achieving global stability. While there have been successes, such as the Korean War and the Gulf War, there have also been failures, such as the Vietnam War and the ongoing war in Afghanistan. American and United Nations intervention remains a controversial and complex topic, highlighting the challenges and opportunities of international diplomacy and intervention. The war had begun with a dramatic invasion of South Korea by North Korea, and had quickly escalated into a brutal and bloody conflict that had lasting implications for the region and the world. The stalemate and trench warfare on the Korean peninsula had come about as a result of the intense fighting and rapid territorial gains made by the North Koreans in the early stages of the war. The United States and its allies had been caught off guard by the invasion and had been forced to retreat rapidly in the face of the North Korean advance. However, they had launched a series of counteroffensives which had pushed the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel, which divided the two Koreas. The situation on the Korean peninsula soon deteriorated into a stalemate, with neither side able to make significant territorial gains. The front lines of the conflict became entrenched, with both sides dug in and holding their positions. The conflict had become a war of attrition with both sides suffering heavy casualties in their efforts to gain even the slightest advantage. The stalemate and trench warfare on the Korean peninsula had a profound impact on the people of Korea. The country had already been deeply divided at the end of the Second World War, and the war had only served to deepen those divisions. The conflict had resulted in the loss of countless lives and had devastated the economy and infrastructure of both North and South Korea. The stalemate and trench warfare only added to the suffering and hardship of the Korean people. The Korean War had far-reaching implications for the future of Asia and the world. The conflict had demonstrated the willingness of the United States and its allies to defend the principles of freedom and democracy and to confront aggression and tyranny wherever they may be found. The Korean War had also highlighted the deep divisions and tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union and had set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The stalemate and trench warfare on the Korean peninsula had far-reaching implications for the conduct of modern warfare. The conflict had demonstrated the effectiveness of defensive positions and tactics, and had highlighted the need for new and innovative approaches to military strategy. The lessons learned on the Korean Peninsula would inform the development of new tactics and technologies in the years to come, and would have lasting implications for the future of warfare. Despite the challenges they faced, the United States and its allies refused to be cowed by the stalemate and trench warfare on the Korean Peninsula. They demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity, 
and worked tirelessly to defend the principles of freedom and democracy. The Korean War helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of South Korea, who saw themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of aggression and tyranny. In summary, the stalemate and trench warfare on the Korean peninsula was a tragic and brutal conflict that had lasting implications for the region and the world. The war had demonstrated the effectiveness of defensive positions and tactics, and had highlighted the need for new and innovative approaches to military strategy. The conflict had also set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. Despite the challenges they faced, the United States and its allies had demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity, and had worked tirelessly to defend the principles of freedom and democracy. The Truman-MacArthur controversy was a pivotal moment in the history of the United States military. The controversy erupted in 1951 during the Korean War, and it centered on the role of General Douglas MacArthur, the commander of the United States forces in the Pacific. The controversy highlighted the challenges and tensions involved in military command, and it ultimately led to the end of MacArthur's command. The controversy began in April 1951, when MacArthur sent a letter to the Republican leader in Congress, calling for a more aggressive approach to the war in Korea. The letter was seen as a direct challenge to President Harry S. Truman's authority, and it set off a series of events that would ultimately lead to MacArthur's dismissal. Truman responded to MacArthur's letter by calling him back to the United States to testify before Congress. During his testimony, MacArthur continued to advocate for a more aggressive approach to the war, and he criticized Truman's policies in Korea. This further strained the relationship between the two men, and it highlighted the growing tensions between the military and the civilian leadership of the United States. The controversy reached a boiling point in April 1951, when MacArthur publicly criticized Truman's policies in Korea. MacArthur made a series of public statements, including a speech to the United States Congress, in which he advocated for the use of nuclear weapons against North Korea and China. This public criticism of the president's policies was seen as a direct challenge to his authority, and it led to Truman's decision to remove MacArthur from command. Truman's decision to remove MacArthur from command was controversial, and it led to a significant backlash from both the military and the public. Many in the military saw MacArthur as a hero, and they saw Truman's decision as a betrayal of his leadership. Similarly, many members of the public saw MacArthur as a strong and decisive leader, and they criticized Truman's decision as a sign of weakness and indecisiveness. Despite the controversy, Truman's decision to remove MacArthur from command was ultimately seen as a necessary step in maintaining the civilian leadership of the United States military. The controversy highlighted the challenges and tensions involved in military command, and it served as a reminder of the need for clear lines of authority and the importance of civilian control of the military. In summary, the Truman-MacArthur controversy was a pivotal moment in the history of the United States military. The controversy highlighted the challenges and tensions involved in military command, and it ultimately led to the end of MacArthur's command. The controversy was a reminder of the importance of clear lines of authority and civilian control of the military, and it highlighted the complex and often fraught relationship between the military and the civilian leadership of the United States. The Korean War had begun with a dramatic invasion of South Korea by North Korea, and had quickly escalated into a brutal and bloody conflict that had devastated the economy and infrastructure of both North and South Korea. The Korean War had a profound impact on the people of Korea. The conflict had resulted in the loss of countless lives and had left many more injured and disabled. The war had also displaced large numbers of people who had been forced to flee their homes and seek refuge in other parts of the country or in neighboring countries. The war had also had a profound impact on Korean society and culture. The conflict had deepened the divisions between North and South Korea, and had set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two sides. 
The war had also highlighted the importance of national identity and pride, and had helped to create a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of South Korea. The Korean War had also had a lasting impact on the economy and infrastructure of Korea. The conflict had devastated the country's infrastructure, including roads, bridges, and buildings. The war had also disrupted the country's economy, causing widespread poverty and hardship for many Koreans. Despite the challenges they faced, the people of Korea refused to be cowed by the effects of the war. They demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity, and worked tirelessly to rebuild their communities and their country. The Korean War had helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of South Korea, who saw themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of aggression and tyranny. The Korean War had also had a profound impact on Korean culture. The conflict had sparked a wave of creativity and artistic expression, as Koreans sought to make sense of the chaos and devastation of war. Korean artists, writers, and filmmakers began to explore new themes and subjects, and to experiment with new forms and techniques. The Korean War also had an impact on the global stage, as it had demonstrated the willingness of the United States and its allies to defend the principles of freedom and democracy, and to confront aggression and tyranny wherever they may be found. The Korean War had also highlighted the deep divisions and tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, and had set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. In summary, the Korean War had a profound and lasting impact on Korean society and culture. The conflict had devastated the economy and infrastructure of both North and South Korea, and had deepened the divisions between the two sides. The war had also sparked a wave of creativity and artistic expression, as Koreans sought to make sense of the chaos and devastation of war. Despite the challenges they faced, the people of Korea had demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity, and had worked tirelessly to rebuild their communities and their country. The Korean War had helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of South Korea, who saw themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of aggression and tyranny. The Korean War was a pivotal moment in the history of warfare, and it marked a significant shift in the role of technology in military operations. The Korean War was fought from 1950 to 1953, and it was characterized by a range of technological innovations that played a key role in shaping the outcome of the conflict. One of the most significant technological innovations of the Korean War was the use of jet aircraft. The Korean War was the first conflict in which jet aircraft were used on a large scale, and this technology gave the United States an important advantage over North Korea and China. The use of jet aircraft allowed the United States to gain air superiority over the Korean Peninsula, and it allowed American forces to launch devastating airstrikes against North Korean and Chinese forces. Another significant technological innovation of the Korean War was the use of helicopters. The Korean War was the first conflict in which helicopters were used on a large scale, and this technology proved to be a game-changer. The use of helicopters allowed American forces to transport troops and supplies quickly and efficiently, and it allowed them to launch surprise attacks against North Korean and Chinese forces. The Korean War was also characterized by the use of new weapons and tactics. One of the most significant was the use of napalm, a highly flammable gel that was used to destroy enemy positions and kill enemy soldiers. Napalm proved to be a highly effective weapon, and it was used extensively during the Korean War. The Korean War also saw the introduction of new communications technologies. The use of radios and telephones allowed American forces to communicate more effectively, and it allowed them to coordinate their operations more efficiently. The use of code-breaking technology also played a significant role in the Korean War, as American codebreakers were able to intercept and decode enemy communications. The role of technology in the Korean War was not limited to military operations. The Korean War also saw the use of new technologies for medical treatment and support. The use of helicopters, for example, 
allowed medical personnel to transport wounded soldiers quickly and efficiently, and it allowed them to provide medical treatment to soldiers in the field. In summary, the Korean War marked a significant shift in the role of technology in military operations. The use of jet aircraft, helicopters, new weapons, and communications technologies played a key role in shaping the outcome of the conflict. The Korean War also highlighted the importance of technology for medical treatment and support. The role of technology in the Korean War serves as a reminder of the importance of innovation and technological advancement in the field of military operations and of the complex and evolving nature of warfare. The Armistice Agreement, which was signed on July 27, 1953, marked the end of the Korean War and brought an end to three years of intense fighting and bloodshed on the Korean Peninsula. The Armistice Agreement was a remarkable achievement and represented a major milestone in the history of the Cold War. The agreement had been negotiated by representatives of the United States, North Korea, and China, and had been signed in the presence of representatives of the United Nations Command. The agreement had been designed to create a permanent ceasefire on the Korean Peninsula and to establish a demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. The signing of the Armistice Agreement marked the end of one of the most brutal and devastating conflicts of the Cold War. The Korean War had resulted in the loss of countless lives and had left many more injured and disabled. The conflict had also devastated the economy and infrastructure of both North and South Korea and had left many Koreans struggling to rebuild their communities and their country. The Armistice Agreement had profound implications for the future of Korea and the world. The agreement had created a lasting ceasefire on the Korean Peninsula and had established a demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. The agreement had also set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between North Korea and the rest of the world. The Armistice Agreement had also had a lasting impact on the people of Korea. The conflict had deepened the divisions between North and South Korea and had set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two sides. The agreement had created a sense of stability and predictability on the Korean Peninsula and had helped to create the conditions for a more peaceful and prosperous future for the Korean people. The signing of the Armistice Agreement had also had an impact on the global stage. The agreement had demonstrated the willingness of the United States and its allies to defend the principles of freedom and democracy and to confront aggression and tyranny wherever they may be found. The agreement had also highlighted the deep divisions and tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union and had set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. Despite the challenges they faced, the people of Korea refused to be cowed by the effects of the war. They demonstrated a remarkable resilience and determination in the face of adversity and worked tirelessly to rebuild their communities and their country. The Armistice Agreement had helped to forge a sense of shared purpose and common identity among the people of South Korea, who saw themselves as defenders of freedom and democracy in the face of aggression and tyranny. In summary, the Armistice Agreement was a remarkable achievement that had a profound and lasting impact on the history of Korea and the world. The agreement had marked the end of one of the most brutal and devastating conflicts of the Cold War and had helped to create the conditions for a more peaceful and prosperous future for the Korean people. The agreement had also had a significant impact on the global stage and had demonstrated the willingness of the United States and its allies to defend the principles of freedom and democracy. The Armistice Agreement had helped to create a sense of stability and predictability on the Korean Peninsula and had set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between North Korea and the rest of the world. The legacy of the Korean War is one that continues to shape U.S. foreign policy and military strategy to this day. The Korean War, fought from 1950 to 1953, was a pivotal moment in the history of the United States, and it marked a significant shift in the country's approach to international diplomacy and military operations. One of the most significant legacies of the Korean War was the emergence 
of a more aggressive and interventionist U.S. foreign policy. The Korean War was seen as a test of the United States' commitment to global stability and democracy, and it led to a greater willingness to intervene in the affairs of other nations in order to promote these values. This legacy was further cemented by the Vietnam War, which highlighted the complexities and challenges involved in foreign intervention, but which also reinforced the importance of American leadership and engagement in the world. Another significant legacy of the Korean War was the impact it had on U.S. military strategy. The Korean War marked a shift away from the large-scale conventional warfare of World War II and toward a more flexible and mobile military force. The Korean War also highlighted the importance of air power and logistics in modern warfare, and it set the stage for the development of new military technologies and tactics. The Korean War also had a significant impact on the geopolitics of East Asia. The division of Korea into North and South and the ongoing conflict between these two states remains a major source of tension in the region. The Korean War also set the stage for the United States' ongoing engagement in the Asia-Pacific region, and it helped to establish the United States as a major player in East Asian politics. The legacy of the Korean War is also evident in the ongoing challenges and tensions in U.S. foreign policy and military strategy. The challenges of intervention in foreign affairs and the complexities of global diplomacy continue to be major issues for the United States. The ongoing conflicts in the Middle East, for example, have highlighted the challenges involved in promoting democracy and stability in regions where political, social, and economic systems are fragile and prone to conflict. Similarly, the legacy of the Korean War is also evident in the ongoing challenges of military strategy. The rise of new military technologies, such as drones and cyber weapons, has highlighted the importance of innovation and adaptability in military operations. The ongoing tensions with North Korea and the ongoing threat of nuclear weapons also highlight the importance of diplomacy and strategic thinking in the pursuit of global stability and security. In summary, the legacy of the Korean War is one that continues to shape U.S. foreign policy and military strategy to this day. The Korean War marked a significant shift in the country's approach to international diplomacy and military operations, and it set the stage for the emergence of a more aggressive and interventionist foreign policy. The legacy of the Korean War also highlights the ongoing challenges and tensions involved in global diplomacy and military strategy, and it serves as a reminder of the complex and evolving nature of international affairs. Chapter 5 McCarthyism and the Red Scare The Red Scare was a period of intense political and social upheaval, marked by fear and suspicion of communist influence in the United States. The origins of the Red Scare can be traced back to the end of the First World War. The war had brought about significant changes in the political and social landscape of Europe, and had sparked a wave of radical political and social movements throughout the continent. The Bolshevik Revolution in Russia had also demonstrated the power of communist ideology and had sparked fears of a communist revolution in the United States. These fears were exacerbated by the rise of the Soviet Union, which had become a major world power in the wake of the Russian Revolution. The Soviet Union had espoused a communist ideology and had sought to spread its influence throughout the world. The United States, which was a democratic capitalist society, saw the Soviet Union as a threat to its way of life. The fear of communism in the United States was also fueled by a series of domestic events. In 1919, a series of bombings targeted government officials and businessmen, which was blamed on leftist radicals. The government responded by launching a series of raids and arrests of suspected radicals, which only served to fuel public anxiety about the perceived threat of communism. The Red Scare reached its peak in the years following the end of the Second World War. The Soviet Union had emerged as a major world power and had demonstrated its ability to challenge the United States in areas such as nuclear weapons and space exploration. The fear of communism had also been fueled by the rise of communist governments in China and Eastern Europe. The fear of communism 
had a profound impact on American society and politics. The government launched a series of investigations and purges of suspected communists and sympathizers, which resulted in the blacklisting of many prominent artists, writers, and intellectuals. The fear of communism also led to a wave of anti-communist propaganda, which portrayed communism as an evil and dangerous ideology that threatened the very fabric of American society. The Red Scare had far-reaching implications for the future of American politics and society. The fear of communism had led to a culture of suspicion and paranoia, which had a chilling effect on political dissent and free speech. The Red Scare had also helped to fuel the growth of the military-industrial complex, which had a significant impact on the economy and politics of the United States in the post-war period. In summary, the Red Scare was a period of intense political and social upheaval, marked by fear and suspicion of communist influence in the United States. The fear of communism can be traced back to the end of the First World War and was fueled by a series of domestic and international events. The Red Scare had a profound impact on American society and politics and helped to fuel the growth of the military-industrial complex. The Red Scare also had a chilling effect on political dissent and free speech, and helped to create a culture of suspicion and paranoia that lasted for many years. In the mid-20th century, the United States of America witnessed a remarkable phenomenon in its political landscape, the rise of Senator Joseph McCarthy. Born in Wisconsin in 1908, McCarthy served as a circuit court judge before his entry into politics. His meteoric rise to prominence was largely attributed to his fervent anti-communist crusade, which he led with a ruthlessness that was unprecedented in American politics. McCarthy's political career began in earnest in 1946, when he successfully contested the Republican nomination for the United States Senate from Wisconsin. His victory in the general election later that year was aided by his energetic campaigning and a potent anti-communist platform. With the onset of the Cold War and the perceived threat of communist infiltration in the United States, McCarthy's message resonated with a fearful and anxious public. In 1950, McCarthy's national profile skyrocketed when he delivered a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, where he made his famous claim that he had a list of 205 communist sympathizers who were working in the United States State Department. This assertion, which was later revised to 57, sent shockwaves throughout the country and made McCarthy an overnight sensation. The speech also marked the beginning of a new phase in American politics, where the anti-communist crusade would become the defining issue for many years to come. McCarthy's tactics were not without their critics, however. Many of his fellow senators and congressmen accused him of using false accusations and innuendos to advance his political agenda. Nevertheless, McCarthy's supporters argued that his uncompromising stance on communism was necessary to protect the country's interests and that his tactics were justified in the face of an existential threat. McCarthy's methods were both brazen and effective. He held public hearings where he grilled suspected communists and their alleged sympathizers, using intimidation and ridicule to extract confessions. His tactics often involved unfounded accusations and insinuations which he used to create a climate of fear and paranoia. His approach was so successful that the mere mention of his name could ruin a person's career and reputation. In 1953, McCarthy was appointed chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Investigations, which he used to launch a new wave of investigations into alleged communist infiltration in various sectors of American society. His primary targets were government agencies, the military, and the entertainment industry where he accused prominent figures such as Hollywood screenwriters and actors of being communists or communist sympathizers. The hearings that he chaired were often sensational and provided a platform for McCarthy to further his agenda. However, McCarthy's tactics eventually led to his downfall. In 1954, he took on the United States Army, accusing it of being infiltrated by communists. This led to a public hearing where McCarthy's tactics were put under scrutiny and his accusations were found to be baseless. The episode was televised, and the American public saw for the first time the ruthlessness of McCarthy's tactics and the damage they had caused. The Senate eventually censured McCarthy, 
and he lost much of his political support. McCarthy died in 1957, but his legacy lived on. He had ushered in a new era in American politics, where the anti-communist crusade had become the dominant issue. The tactics that he used, while often criticized, had become part of the political playbook, and his name became synonymous with the excesses of the Red Scare. McCarthy's rise and fall would become a cautionary tale of how fear and paranoia could be exploited for political gain and the dangers of using unsubstantiated accusations to advance an agenda. The House on American Activities Committee, HUAC, was a congressional committee that was established in the 1930s to investigate alleged communist influence in American society. The committee had a significant impact on Hollywood, where it conducted a series of hearings and investigations that resulted in the blacklisting of many prominent actors, writers, and directors. The HUAC hearings and Hollywood blacklists were fueled by the fear and suspicion of communism that had taken hold in American society. The fear of communism had been fueled by a series of international events, including the rise of the Soviet Union and the spread of communist governments throughout Eastern Europe and Asia. The fear of communism had also been fueled by a series of domestic events, including a series of bombings in 1919 that were blamed on leftist radicals. The HUAC hearings had a profound impact on Hollywood. The committee had launched a series of investigations into alleged communist influence in the film industry and had called numerous prominent actors, writers, and directors to testify before the committee. Many of these individuals were subjected to intense scrutiny and questioning and were accused of having communist sympathies or affiliations. The HUAC hearings had far-reaching implications for the film industry. Many prominent actors, writers, and directors were blacklisted, which meant that they were unable to work in the film industry for many years. The blacklisting had a significant impact on the careers and reputations of these individuals, and had a chilling effect on political dissent and free speech in Hollywood. The HUAC hearings and Hollywood blacklists also had far-reaching implications for the future of American politics and society. The fear of communism had created a culture of suspicion and paranoia, which had a chilling effect on political dissent and free speech. The HUAC hearings had helped to create a climate of fear and intimidation, which had a significant impact on the political and cultural landscape of the United States in the post-war period. The HUAC hearings and Hollywood blacklists also had a profound impact on the individuals who were affected by them. Many of these individuals were ostracized and marginalized and were unable to work in their chosen profession for many years. The blacklisting had a significant impact on the careers and reputations of these individuals and had a lasting impact on their personal and professional lives. In summary, the HUAC hearings and Hollywood blacklists were a tragic and chilling period in American history. The fear of communism had created a culture of suspicion and paranoia, which had a chilling effect on political dissent and free speech. The HUAC hearings had helped to create a climate of fear and intimidation, which had a significant impact on the political and cultural landscape of the United States in the post-war period. The Hollywood blacklists had a profound impact on the careers and reputations of many prominent actors, writers, and directors, and had a lasting impact on their personal and professional lives. The HUAC hearings and Hollywood blacklists serve as a powerful reminder of the dangers of political extremism and the importance of defending the principles of free speech and political dissent. The Army McCarthy hearings of 1954 marked a turning point in the decline of McCarthyism the political movement that was defined by the aggressive and often unfounded accusations of communist infiltration in the United States. The hearings, which were broadcast live on national television, exposed the excesses and tactics of Senator Joseph McCarthy, who had become the public face of the movement. The hearings were initiated by McCarthy's investigation into alleged communist infiltration in the United States Army. McCarthy, who was the chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Investigations, had accused the Army of harboring communist sympathizers and demanded that the Army release personnel files for scrutiny. The Army resisted, and the dispute eventually led to a public hearing, 
which would become a defining moment in American politics. The Army McCarthy hearings were a spectacle. The proceedings were broadcast live on television, and the public was able to witness the confrontations and accusations firsthand. The hearings were marked by heated exchanges, emotional outbursts, and dramatic revelations, all of which were amplified by the media coverage. During the hearings, McCarthy's tactics were put under scrutiny, and his accusations were found to be baseless. His methods of intimidation and ridicule, which had been so effective in the past, were ineffective in this setting. His targets, who included prominent army officials, were able to defend themselves and expose McCarthy's tactics to the public. McCarthy's own demeanor, which had previously been seen as aggressive and effective, was now seen as bullying and erratic. The Army McCarthy hearings marked the beginning of the end for McCarthyism. The hearings exposed the excesses of the movement and the damage that it had caused to individuals and institutions. The televised nature of the hearings meant that the public was able to witness firsthand the ruthlessness of McCarthy's tactics and the harm they had caused. The hearings also marked a turning point in American politics. The anti-communist crusade, which had been the dominant issue in American politics for several years, began to lose its appeal. The public began to question the methods and motives of McCarthy and his supporters, and the movement lost much of its political support. The decline of McCarthyism was also aided by the political climate of the time. The United States was in the midst of a period of relative stability and prosperity, which made the fear and paranoia of McCarthyism seem out of place. The country was also coming to terms with the excesses of the Red Scare and the damage that it had caused. The legacy of McCarthyism would become a cautionary tale of how fear and paranoia could be exploited for political gain and the dangers of using unsubstantiated accusations to advance an agenda. The Army McCarthy hearings also had broader implications for American politics. The hearings exposed the potential of the media to shape public opinion and influence political outcomes. The televised nature of the hearings meant that the public was able to witness firsthand the proceedings, and the coverage by the media had a significant impact on the public's perception of the movement. The hearings marked a turning point in the role of the media in American politics and the impact of the hearings on the public's perception of McCarthyism would be a precedent for the media's role in future political controversies. In summary, the Army McCarthy hearings of 1954 marked a turning point in the decline of McCarthyism. The hearings exposed the excesses and tactics of Senator Joseph McCarthy and the damage that the movement had caused. The televised nature of the hearings meant that the public was able to witness firsthand the proceedings and the coverage by the media had a significant impact on the public's perception of the movement. The Rosenberg case was a highly publicized trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, a couple who had been accused of passing atomic secrets to the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The Rosenberg case was fueled by the fear and suspicion of communism that had taken hold in American society. The fear of communism had been fueled by a series of international events, including the rise of the Soviet Union and the spread of communist governments throughout Eastern Europe and Asia. The fear of communism had also been fueled by a series of domestic events, including a series of bombings in 1919 that were blamed on leftist radicals. The Rosenberg case had a profound impact on American society and politics. The trial had been highly publicized and had been widely covered by the media. The trial had created a climate of fear and suspicion and had fueled the growth of anti-communist sentiment in American society. The Rosenberg case had far-reaching implications for the future of American politics and society. The case had helped to create a culture of suspicion and paranoia, which had a chilling effect on political dissent and free speech. The case had also helped to fuel the growth of the military-industrial complex which had a significant impact on the economy and politics of the United States in the post-war period. The Rosenberg case also had a profound impact on the individuals who were involved in the trial. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were found guilty of espionage and sentenced to death, which made them the only civilians in American history to be executed for espionage. 
The trial had a significant impact on their family, who were forced to cope with the emotional and psychological toll of the trial and the subsequent execution. The Rosenberg case had also had a significant impact on the global stage. The case had highlighted the deep divisions and tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, and had set the stage for a prolonged period of political and military confrontation between the two superpowers. The case had also helped to fuel the arms race and the growth of the nuclear weapons industry, which had a significant impact on the global economy and politics. In summary, the Rosenberg case was a tragic and chilling event in American history. The fear of communism had created a culture of suspicion and paranoia, which had a chilling effect on political dissent and free speech. The case had helped to fuel the growth of anti-communist sentiment in American society and had fueled the growth of the military-industrial complex. The Rosenberg case had also had a profound impact on the individuals who were involved in the trial, as well as on the global stage. The Rosenberg case serves as a powerful reminder of the dangers of political extremism and the importance of defending the principles of free speech and political dissent. The rise of Senator Joseph McCarthy and the political movement that bears his name, McCarthyism, had a profound impact on civil liberties and freedom of speech in the United States. The movement, which was defined by the aggressive and often unfounded accusations of communist infiltration in the country, led to a climate of fear and paranoia that threatened the basic principles of democracy. McCarthyism had a significant impact on civil liberties. The movement was marked by the use of intimidation and coercion to extract confessions from suspected communists or their alleged sympathizers. Those who were accused of being communists or communist sympathizers were often subject to public humiliation and blacklisting, which had severe consequences for their careers and reputations. The tactics used by McCarthy and his supporters led to a climate of fear and paranoia, which had a chilling effect on freedom of speech. The excesses of McCarthyism also had a significant impact on freedom of speech. The movement was marked by the suppression of dissent and the silencing of opposing viewpoints. Those who spoke out against McCarthyism or expressed sympathy for communist ideals were subject to public scrutiny and condemnation. The excesses of McCarthyism had a chilling effect on freedom of speech, which was a fundamental principle of American democracy. The impact of McCarthyism on civil liberties and freedom of speech was significant. The movement threatened the basic principles of democracy and the freedoms that were enshrined in the Constitution. The tactics used by McCarthy and his supporters were antithetical to the values of free speech and the right to dissent. The excesses of McCarthyism were a dark chapter in American history, which had a lasting impact on the country's political landscape. The legacy of McCarthyism is a cautionary tale of the dangers of using fear and paranoia to advance an agenda. The movement was marked by the use of unsubstantiated accusations and innuendo, which had severe consequences for those who were targeted. The excesses of McCarthyism were a violation of the basic principles of democracy and the freedoms that are essential to its functioning. The impact of McCarthyism on civil liberties and freedom of speech also had broader implications for American society. The movement exposed the potential for the abuse of power and the dangers of unchecked authority. It underscored the importance of the role of the media in shaping public opinion and influencing political outcomes. The impact of McCarthyism on civil liberties and freedom of speech would have a lasting impact on American society, and the legacy of the movement would be a cautionary tale for future generations. In summary, the impact of McCarthyism on civil liberties and freedom of speech was significant. The movement, which was defined by the aggressive and often unfounded accusations of communist infiltration in the country, led to a climate of fear and paranoia that threatened the basic principles of democracy. The legacy of McCarthyism is a cautionary tale of the dangers of using fear and paranoia to advance an agenda, and the impact of the movement on civil liberties and freedom of speech would have lasting implications for American society. The excesses of McCarthyism were a violation of the basic principles of democracy and the freedoms that are essential to its functioning. 
In the early 1950s, America was gripped by a feverish fear of communism. The Soviet Union had emerged as a powerful adversary on the global stage, and fears of communist subversion within the United States ran high. The Red Scare was in full swing, and it extended to every corner of American society, including education. Loyalty oaths and witch hunts were the order of the day, as educators and students alike were subjected to a barrage of accusations and investigations. The Red Scare in education had its roots in the McCarran Internal Security Act, which was passed by Congress in 1950. This law required all federal employees to swear an oath of loyalty to the United States and to disavow any affiliation with the Communist Party or any other subversive organization. This oath was later extended to all employees of state and local governments, including teachers. The loyalty oath was a powerful tool in the hands of those who sought to root out communist sympathizers in the education system. Teachers were required to sign the oath in order to keep their jobs, and any refusal to do so was seen as a sign of disloyalty. This led to a wave of resignations and firings as teachers who were suspected of communist sympathies were forced out of their positions. The loyalty oath was only the beginning. Soon, educators were subjected to a series of investigations and interrogations aimed at uncovering any ties to subversive organizations. The House on American Activities Committee, HUAC, held a series of high-profile hearings in which educators were called to testify about their political beliefs and associations. Many of these hearings were little more than witch hunts. Educators were accused of being communists or communist sympathizers based on flimsy or non-existent evidence. Their reputations were ruined and their careers were destroyed. The fear of being labeled a communist sympathizer was so great that many teachers were afraid to express any political opinions at all, for fear of being accused of subversion. The impact of the Red Scare on education was significant. Many teachers were forced to resign or were fired, and those who remained were often afraid to speak out on any controversial issues. The educational system suffered as a result, as teachers who had been dismissed were often replaced by less qualified or less experienced educators. The Red Scare in education also had a broader impact on American society. The fear of communist subversion was used to justify a wide range of repressive measures, including the blacklisting of actors, writers, and other public figures. The impact of the Red Scare was felt for years to come, as the fear of communist subversion lingered in American society. In many ways, the Red Scare in education was a reflection of the broader cultural and political climate of the time. The Cold War had created a climate of fear and suspicion, and the Red Scare was the result. The fear of communist subversion was exploited by politicians and other figures in order to gain power and advance their own agendas. The Red Scare in education was a dark chapter in American history, but it is also a reminder of the dangers of political hysteria and the need to protect the rights of individuals in the face of such hysteria. The loyalty oaths and witch hunts of the Red Scare were an assault on the principles of free speech and academic freedom, and they should serve as a cautionary tale for future generations. In the end, the Red Scare in education was largely a failure. While it did succeed in driving some educators out of their jobs, it did little to root out actual communist subversion. Instead, it served to undermine the educational system and to erode the principles of free speech and academic freedom that are essential to a democratic society. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, played a pivotal role in the domestic surveillance of suspected communists in the United States during the mid-20th century. The FBI, under the leadership of its director, J. Edgar Hoover, was responsible for monitoring and investigating individuals and groups that were suspected of communist sympathies. The domestic surveillance program of the FBI had a significant impact on civil liberties and the right to privacy, and its legacy would be a cautionary tale of the dangers of unchecked government authority. The FBI's domestic surveillance program began in earnest during the early years of the Cold War. The perceived threat of communist infiltration in the United States led the FBI to conduct extensive surveillance on individuals and groups that were suspected of having communist sympathies. 
The program was marked by the use of informants, wiretaps, and other surveillance techniques that were often invasive and unconstitutional. The FBI's domestic surveillance program had a significant impact on civil liberties. The surveillance of suspected communists often led to the violation of privacy and the infringement of civil liberties. Those who were targeted by the FBI's surveillance program were often subject to intimidation and harassment, which had a chilling effect on free speech and the right to dissent. The FBI's domestic surveillance program was also marked by the use of informants who were often coerced into providing information. The use of informants led to a culture of suspicion and distrust, which had a corrosive effect on American society. The tactics used by the FBI had a chilling effect on the right to privacy and freedom of speech, which were fundamental principles of American democracy. The impact of the FBI's domestic surveillance program was significant. The program had a profound impact on the political and cultural landscape of the United States, and its legacy would be a cautionary tale of the dangers of unchecked government authority. The tactics used by the FBI had a chilling effect on free speech and the right to dissent, and the violation of privacy was a clear violation of civil liberties. The excesses of the FBI's domestic surveillance program were exposed in the 1970s, with the revelation of the COINTELPRO program. The program, which was designed to disrupt and discredit political organizations that were deemed a threat to national security, was marked by the use of illegal and unethical tactics. The COINTELPRO program underscored the dangers of unchecked government authority and the potential for the abuse of power. The FBI's domestic surveillance program was a violation of the basic principles of democracy and the freedoms that are essential to its functioning. The legacy of the program would be a cautionary tale of the dangers of unchecked government authority and the importance of protecting civil liberties and the right to privacy. In summary, the FBI's domestic surveillance program of suspected communists had a significant impact on civil liberties and the right to privacy. The program was marked by the use of invasive and unconstitutional surveillance techniques, which had a chilling effect on free speech and the right to dissent. The excesses of the program were a violation of the basic principles of democracy and the freedoms that are essential to its functioning. The legacy of the program would be a cautionary tale of the dangers of unchecked government authority and the importance of protecting civil liberties and the right to privacy. In the early 1950s, America was gripped by a feverish fear of communism. The Red Scare, as it was called, swept across the nation, leaving a trail of suspicion and paranoia in its wake. This fear was fueled by a variety of factors, including the growing power of the Soviet Union, the memories of the Great Depression, and the fear of another world war. The Red Scare had a profound impact on American society and culture, as it touched nearly every aspect of American life. The Red Scare was not just a political phenomenon, it had a deep cultural impact as well. The fear of communism was reflected in movies, television shows, and other forms of popular culture. The media portrayed communists as evil, subversive agents who were plotting to destroy America from within. This portrayal was often exaggerated and sensationalized, but it had a powerful impact on the American psyche. The Red Scare also had a profound impact on the way that Americans thought about themselves and their country. The fear of communist subversion led many Americans to question their own loyalty and patriotism. They wondered if they were doing enough to protect their country from the communist threat. This fear was exploited by politicians and other figures who used it to gain power and to advance their own agendas. The Red Scare was not just a political phenomenon, it also had a profound impact on the economy. The fear of communist subversion led to a wave of anti-union sentiment, as many Americans believed that labor unions were infiltrated by communist sympathizers. This led to a wave of strikes and labor unrest, which disrupted the economy and led to widespread job losses. The Red Scare also had a profound impact on the legal system. The government began to use a variety of tactics to root out suspected communists, including wiretapping, surveillance, and informants. These tactics often violated the rights of individuals and led to a wave of arrests and prosecutions. 
The fear of communist subversion was used to justify a wide range of repressive measures, including the blacklisting of actors, writers, and other public figures. The impact of the Red Scare was felt throughout American society, but it was particularly pronounced in the academic world. The fear of communist subversion led to a wave of investigations and interrogations aimed at uncovering any ties to subversive organizations. Teachers and professors were accused of being communists or communist sympathizers based on flimsy or non-existent evidence. Their reputations were ruined and their careers were destroyed. The impact of the Red Scare on the academic world was particularly troubling, as it undermined the principles of free speech and academic freedom that are essential to a democratic society. The fear of being labeled a communist sympathizer was so great that many teachers and professors were afraid to express any political opinions at all, for fear of being accused of subversion. The Red Scare also had a profound impact on American foreign policy. The fear of communist subversion led to a variety of interventions in other countries, as the United States sought to contain the spread of communism. This led to a variety of conflicts and interventions, including the Korean War and the Vietnam War. These conflicts had a profound impact on American society and culture, as they led to a wave of protests and unrest. The impact of the Red Scare on American society and culture was profound and long-lasting. It touched nearly every aspect of American life, from politics to culture to the economy. The fear of communism led to a wave of suspicion and paranoia that undermined the principles of democracy and freedom. It is a reminder of the dangers of political hysteria and the need to protect the rights of individuals in the face of such hysteria. The legacy of McCarthyism, the political movement that was defined by the aggressive and often unfounded accusations of communist infiltration in the United States, continues to have an impact on American politics today. The excesses of McCarthyism, which threatened civil liberties and freedom of speech, remain a cautionary tale of the dangers of unchecked government authority and the importance of protecting the principles of democracy. The current political climate has led to comparisons with the excesses of McCarthyism. The perceived threat of terrorism and the rise of nationalist movements have led to the use of surveillance and the suppression of dissent, which echo the tactics used by McCarthy and his supporters. The excesses of the war on terror and the rise of populist movements have raised concerns about civil liberties and the right to privacy, which were also concerns during the era of McCarthyism. The use of surveillance and the suppression of dissent are hallmarks of the excesses of McCarthyism. The use of informants, wiretaps and other surveillance techniques, which were often invasive and unconstitutional, remain a concern in the current political climate. The use of social media and other forms of digital communication have led to new forms of surveillance, which have raised concerns about the right to privacy and freedom of speech. The suppression of dissent is also a concern in the current political climate. The rise of nationalism and populism has led to a culture of suspicion and distrust, which has had a chilling effect on free speech and the right to dissent. Those who speak out against the prevailing political winds are often subject to public scrutiny and condemnation, which echoes the tactics used by McCarthy and his supporters. The comparison with McCarthyism underscores the importance of protecting civil liberties and the principles of democracy. The legacy of McCarthyism is a cautionary tale of the dangers of unchecked government authority and the importance of protecting civil liberties and the right to privacy. The excesses of the war on terror and the rise of populist movements have raised concerns about the potential for the abuse of power, and the importance of protecting civil liberties has become more apparent. The comparison with McCarthyism also underscores the importance of the media in shaping public opinion and influencing political outcomes. The impact of the media on the public's perception of McCarthyism was significant, and the impact of the media on the current political climate is also significant. The role of the media in protecting civil liberties and the principles of democracy is more important than ever and the legacy of McCarthyism is a reminder of the potential for the media to shape public opinion. In summary, 
the legacy of McCarthyism continues to have an impact on American politics today. The excesses of the movement, which threaten civil liberties and freedom of speech, remain a cautionary tale of the dangers of unchecked government authority and the importance of protecting the principles of democracy. The comparison with McCarthyism underscores the importance of protecting civil liberties and the role of the media in shaping public opinion. The legacy of McCarthyism is a reminder of the potential for the abuse of power and the importance of protecting civil liberties and the right to privacy. Chapter 6. The Space Race The space race, that great rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union in the exploration and conquest of space, was one of the defining conflicts of the Cold War. It was a struggle for technological and ideological supremacy, a race to achieve a series of firsts that would demonstrate to the world the superiority of one superpower over the other. The origins of the space race can be traced back to the aftermath of World War II. The devastation wrought by the war had left the United States and the Soviet Union as the two dominant powers in the world, and they quickly became locked in a struggle for influence and control. This struggle played out on many fronts, from military alliances to economic aid to propaganda campaigns. One of the key battlegrounds in this conflict was the field of science and technology. Both the United States and the Soviet Union recognize that scientific and technological advancements would be critical to their success in the Cold War. And so they poured vast resources into research and development, hoping to gain an edge over their rival. In the early years of the Cold War, the United States appeared to be winning this technological race. It was the first country to develop and use nuclear weapons, and it had a clear lead in other areas such as aviation and electronics. However, in 1957, the Soviet Union scored a major victory with the launch of Sputnik, the first artificial satellite. The launch of Sputnik was a shock to the United States and the rest of the world. It demonstrated that the Soviet Union had made significant advances in rocket technology, and it raised concerns about the country's military capabilities. The United States responded with a flurry of activity, increasing its funding for science and technology, launching its own satellites, and creating new organizations such as NASA to coordinate its efforts. In the years that followed, the space race escalated rapidly. Both the United States and the Soviet Union set their sights on increasingly ambitious goals, such as manned spaceflight and landing a human on the moon. The rivalry between the two superpowers became more intense, with each country seeking to outdo the other in terms of technological achievements. The space race was not just a battle for technological supremacy, however. It was also a battle of ideas and ideologies. The United States and the Soviet Union had very different visions of the world and how it should be organized. The United States believed in the importance of individual freedom and democracy, while the Soviet Union espoused the values of socialism and collective action. The space race served as a symbol of these competing ideologies. The United States saw its efforts to conquer space as a demonstration of the superiority of its system of government and its way of life. The Soviet Union, meanwhile, saw its successes in space as a validation of its socialist ideals and a challenge to the capitalist order. The space race also had significant implications for the global balance of power. The United States and the Soviet Union were locked in a struggle for influence around the world, with each seeking to spread its influence and undermine the other. The space race was seen as a critical battleground in this conflict. The country that could dominate space would have a significant advantage in terms of military and technological capabilities, as well as in terms of global prestige and influence. In the end, it was the United States that emerged victorious in the space race. The country achieved a series of historic firsts, including the first manned spaceflight, the first moon landing, and the establishment of a permanent space station. These accomplishments helped to cement the United States' position as the dominant superpower in the world. The space race had profound implications for the course of human history. It demonstrated the incredible potential of human ingenuity and technological progress, while also highlighting the dangers of unchecked competition and conflict. In the annals of human history, 
Few endeavors have captured the imagination and the ambition of our species quite like the exploration of space. From the earliest dreams of flight to the latest missions to the outer reaches of our solar system, the pursuit of knowledge and adventure beyond our earthly boundaries has driven some of the most remarkable achievements of our time. And in the early 1960s, at the dawn of the space age, the United States of America embarked on a grand and audacious mission to send a man into orbit around the Earth and then to land him on the moon. This was the Mercury Program and Project Gemini, two pioneering efforts that would lay the foundation for one of the greatest triumphs of human ingenuity and will. At the heart of these historic undertakings was NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, a fledgling agency born out of the Cold War tensions and the technological advances of the post-World War II era. Tasked with pushing the limits of human knowledge and exploration, NASA marshaled the best and the brightest minds of the nation, from the engineers and the scientists to the astronauts who would risk their lives to make the impossible possible. The Mercury program was the first step in this epic journey, a series of manned spaceflights designed to test the feasibility of sending a human being into orbit and to explore the challenges of spaceflight. Launched in 1959, the program was named after the mythical Roman god Mercury, the messenger of the gods who was known for his speed and agility. And like its namesake, the Mercury program aimed to be swift and nimble, taking advantage of the latest technology and the most daring pilots to push the boundaries of what was possible. The first Mercury mission, launched on May 5, 1961, was piloted by Alan Shepard, a decorated Navy test pilot and veteran of the Korean War. Shepard's flight, dubbed Freedom 7, lasted just over 15 minutes, reaching an altitude of 116 miles and a speed of 5,134 miles per hour. It was a momentous achievement, not only for Shepard and NASA but for the entire nation as it signaled the beginning of a new era of exploration and discovery. The Mercury program continued with a series of other missions, each one building on the knowledge and experience gained from the previous ones. Among the most notable was the flight of John Glenn, a Marine Corps pilot and veteran of World War II and the Korean War, who became the first American to orbit the Earth on February 20, 1962. Glenn's flight lasted just over four hours and circled the Earth three times, demonstrating the feasibility of longer spaceflights and the potential of human space exploration. But the Mercury program was just the beginning. Even as Glenn was circling the Earth, NASA was already planning the next phase of its grand mission, a more ambitious and complex endeavor known as Project Gemini. Named after the twin brothers Castor and Pollux of Greek mythology, the project aimed to build on the achievements of the Mercury program and to pave the way for the ultimate goal of landing a man on the moon. At its core, Project Gemini was a series of missions designed to test the capabilities of the astronauts and the spacecraft in a variety of challenging scenarios, from extended spaceflights to docking maneuvers with other spacecraft. The first Gemini mission, launched on April 8, 1964, was piloted by Virgil Gus Grissom and John Young, two seasoned test pilots with a wealth of experience in the aerospace industry. Their mission, dubbed Gemini 3, was a short four-hour flight that tested the basic systems of the spacecraft and the procedures for rendezvous and recovery. The launch of Sputnik, the first artificial satellite by the Soviet Union in 1957, was a turning point in the history of science and technology. It was a moment that signaled the beginning of a new era one in which space exploration and conquest would become a critical focus of the world's leading powers. The launch of Sputnik was not only a triumph of Soviet engineering and ingenuity, but it was also a moment of great significance for the world's political and military leaders. The Soviet Union's achievement in launching Sputnik was a stunning demonstration of its technological prowess. It marked a major milestone in the country's efforts to catch up with the United States in the field of science and technology. For decades, the United States had been the undisputed leader in areas such as aviation, electronics and nuclear technology. The launch of Sputnik showed that the Soviet Union was not content to be left behind. The launch of Sputnik also had significant political implications. The Soviet Union was engaged in a global struggle for influence with the United States, and the launch of the satellite was seen as a major propaganda victory. It demonstrated to the world 
that the Soviet Union was capable of achieving great feats of engineering and technology, and it raised concerns among the United States and its allies about the country's military capabilities. The launch of Sputnik had a profound impact on the United States and its response to the Soviet challenge. It was a wake-up call for the country's political and military leaders, who suddenly realized that they were no longer the unquestioned leaders in the field of science and technology. In the years that followed, the United States poured vast resources into research and development, hoping to regain its technological edge. The response of the United States to the Soviet launch of Sputnik was swift and determined. President Eisenhower established the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, to coordinate the country's efforts in space exploration. The United States launched a series of satellites, including the first successful American satellite, Explorer 1, in 1958. The country also began investing heavily in education and research, recognizing that its ability to compete in the space race depended on a well-trained and well-educated workforce. The impact of the launch of Sputnik extended far beyond the United States and the Soviet Union, however. It sparked a global interest in space exploration and inspired countries around the world to invest in their own space programs. The launch of Sputnik demonstrated the potential of space exploration for scientific discovery as well as for military and strategic purposes. The launch of Sputnik also had significant cultural and social implications. It captured the imagination of people around the world, who marveled at the idea of a man-made object orbiting the Earth. It inspired a wave of science fiction literature and films, as well as a renewed interest in science and technology. The launch of Sputnik was a defining moment in the history of science and technology. It marked the beginning of a new era in which space exploration and conquest would become a critical focus of the world's leading powers. The Soviet Union's achievement in launching the first artificial satellite was a major propaganda victory, demonstrating to the world its technological prowess and raising concerns among the United States and its allies about the country's military capabilities. The impact of the launch of Sputnik was far-reaching and long-lasting. It sparked a global interest in space exploration, inspired countries around the world to invest in their own space programs, and contributed to a wave of scientific and technological progress. It demonstrated the potential of space exploration for military and strategic purposes, as well as for scientific discovery and exploration. The annals of human history are replete with tales of adventure and conquest, of men and women who dared to venture into the unknown and achieved the impossible. From the conquests of Alexander the Great to the explorations of Marco Polo, these stories have captivated the human imagination for centuries. And in the mid-20th century, a new chapter in this epic narrative was written, as two men from opposite sides of the Cold War divide took to the skies in an audacious bid to conquer space. These were Yuri Gagarin and Alan Shepard, the first human beings to journey beyond the confines of Earth's atmosphere and to gaze upon our planet from the lofty heights of outer space. Theirs were feats of courage and determination of scientific innovation and political ambition. At a time when the world was deeply divided by ideology and rivalry, Gagarin and Shepard became symbols of human achievement, testaments to the power of the human spirit to transcend the limitations of our earthly existence and to explore new frontiers of knowledge and adventure. Yuri Gagarin, a young Soviet Air Force pilot, was the first to make this historic journey. On April 12, 1961, he blasted off into space aboard the Vostok 1 spacecraft, becoming the first human being to orbit the Earth. Gagarin's flight was a triumph of Soviet engineering and scientific expertise, and it marked a major milestone in the Cold War space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. But Gagarin was more than just a propaganda tool for the Soviet government. He was a skilled and dedicated pilot, a man of exceptional courage and determination who had been chosen for his mission based on his skills and abilities. His flight was a daring and risky endeavor, fraught with dangers and uncertainties. But he faced these challenges with a calm and resolute spirit, relying on his training and his instincts to guide him through the perilous journey. Gagarin's flight lasted just under two hours, but it was a momentous achievement that captured the world's attention and inspired a generation of space explorers. 
From his vantage point high above the earth, Gagarin marveled at the beauty and fragility of our planet, and he felt a sense of awe and wonder that would stay with him for the rest of his life. Across the ocean in the United States, Alan Shepard was preparing to make history of his own. A decorated Navy test pilot and veteran of the Korean War, Shepard was chosen to be the first American to journey into space. His flight, dubbed Freedom 7, was part of the Mercury program, a series of manned spaceflights designed to test the feasibility of human spaceflight. Shepard's flight, launched on May 5, 1961, was a shorter and less ambitious endeavor than Gagarin's. He reached an altitude of just over 100 miles and spent only 15 minutes in space before returning to Earth. But his flight was no less significant, for it marked the beginning of the American space program and signaled a new era of exploration and discovery. Shepard's flight was also a testament to the power of American ingenuity and technological innovation. The spacecraft he piloted was a marvel of engineering, designed to withstand the rigors of spaceflight and to keep its human occupants safe and comfortable. And Shepard himself was a skilled and courageous pilot, whose daring and determination helped pave the way for future generations of space explorers. The flights of Gagarin and Shepard were not just scientific and technological achievements. They were also symbolic acts of political and ideological assertion, part of a larger struggle for supremacy in the Cold War. The Soviet Union saw Gagarin's flight as a demonstration of its technological prowess and a sign of its dominance in the space race. The Apollo program, a series of manned missions to the moon undertaken by the United States in the 1960s and 1970s, was one of the most ambitious and audacious projects in the history of science and technology. It represented the culmination of years of effort and investment, as well as the peak of human achievement in the exploration and conquest of space. The Apollo program was launched in response to the Soviet Union's early lead in the space race. The launch of Sputnik in 1957 had demonstrated to the world the Soviet Union's technological prowess, and it had raised concerns about the country's military capabilities. In response, the United States redoubled its efforts in science and technology, creating new organizations such as NASA and pouring vast resources into research and development. The Apollo program represented the pinnacle of the United States' efforts in space exploration. It was a series of manned missions to the moon, with the goal of demonstrating the superiority of the United States in science and technology, as well as in terms of military and strategic capabilities. The program was launched in 1961, and it continued until 1975, with a total of 17 missions. The Apollo program was an incredibly complex and challenging undertaking. It required the development of new technologies and systems, as well as the coordination of a vast array of resources and personnel. The missions involved the use of advanced spacecraft, including the Saturn V rocket, the lunar module, and the command module. They also required the use of sophisticated guidance and navigation systems, as well as the development of new spacesuits and life support systems. The Apollo program was also a triumph of human ingenuity and perseverance. The astronauts who participated in the missions faced incredible challenges, including the extreme environments of space and the moon, as well as the risk of accidents and equipment failures. They demonstrated extraordinary bravery and skill, as well as a deep commitment to the ideals of exploration and discovery. The Apollo program achieved a series of historic firsts. The first manned mission, Apollo 7, was launched in 1968 and it was followed by a series of increasingly ambitious missions. The Apollo 11 mission, launched in 1969, was the first mission to land humans on the moon. It was a moment of great triumph and celebration, as millions of people around the world watched as astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin took their first steps on the lunar surface. The Apollo program also had significant political and cultural implications. The United States was engaged in a global struggle for influence with the Soviet Union, and the missions to the moon were seen as a critical battleground in this conflict. They demonstrated the superiority of the United States in science and technology, as well as in terms of military and strategic capabilities. They also inspired a sense of national pride and accomplishment, 
as well as a renewed interest in science and technology. The Apollo program was not without its controversies and criticisms, however. Some critics argued that the vast resources devoted to the program could have been better used to address social and economic problems at home. Others questioned the wisdom of risking human lives in such a dangerous and uncertain enterprise. Despite these criticisms, the Apollo program remains a landmark achievement in the history of science and technology. It demonstrated the incredible potential of human ingenuity and perseverance, as well as the power of science and technology to transform the world. The missions to the moon were a moment of great triumph and celebration, as well as a reminder of the endless possibilities of human achievement. In the end, the Apollo program was a defining moment in the history of science and technology. It represented the culmination of years of effort and investment, as well as the peak of human achievement in the exploration and conquest of space. The space race and the arms race were two of the defining conflicts of the Cold War. They represented the struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union for global supremacy, and they played out on many different fronts, including science and technology, military and strategic capabilities, and political and ideological influence. One of the key battlegrounds in this conflict was the field of intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. These were missiles capable of traveling great distances, and they represented a critical strategic capability for both the United States and the Soviet Union. They were seen as a means of deterring a nuclear attack, as well as a potential first strike capability. The development of ICBMs was driven in part by the space race. The United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in a fierce competition to demonstrate their technological and scientific prowess, and the development of ICBMs was seen as a critical component of this race. It represented a means of achieving a first in terms of strategic and military capabilities. The United States and the Soviet Union both made significant progress in the development of ICBMs in the 1950s and 1960s. The United States developed the Atlas and Titan I missiles, while the Soviet Union developed the R-7 Semyorka missile. These missiles represented a major advance in technology, and they posed a significant threat to the security of both countries. The development of ICBMs also had significant implications for the arms race. The United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in a competition to develop and deploy nuclear weapons and the development of ICBMs represented a critical element of this race. They were seen as a means of delivering nuclear weapons to distant targets, and they raised the specter of a potential nuclear war. The development of ICBMs also had significant political and strategic implications. The United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in a global struggle for influence, and the development of ICBMs represented a critical strategic capability in this conflict. They were seen as a means of deterring a nuclear attack, as well as a potential first strike capability. The deployment of ICBMs was a major milestone in the arms race. The United States and the Soviet Union began deploying ICBMs in the early 1960s, with the United States deploying the Minuteman missile and the Soviet Union deploying the SS-7 missile. These missiles represented a significant advance in technology, and they posed a significant threat to the security of both countries. The deployment of ICBMs also raised concerns about the potential for nuclear war. The United States and the Soviet Union both maintained large nuclear arsenals, and the deployment of ICBMs made it possible to deliver these weapons to distant targets. The possibility of a nuclear war loomed large, and the world watched anxiously as the two superpowers engaged in a dangerous and potentially catastrophic game of brinksmanship. In the end, the development and deployment of ICBMs was a defining moment in the history of the Cold War. It represented the culmination of years of effort and investment, as well as the peak of human achievement in the development of weapons of mass destruction. The ICBMs posed a significant threat to the security of both the United States and the Soviet Union, and they raised the specter of a potential nuclear war. The development and deployment of ICBMs also had significant political and strategic implications. 
They were a critical element of the arms race, and they represented a means of achieving strategic and military dominance. They were seen as a means of deterring a nuclear attack, as well as a potential first strike capability. In the annals of human history, few endeavors have captured the imagination and the ambition of our species quite like the exploration of space. From the earliest dreams of flight to the latest missions to the outer reaches of our solar system, the pursuit of knowledge and adventure beyond our earthly boundaries has driven some of the most remarkable achievements of our time. And in the mid-20th century, at the height of the Cold War, two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, embarked on a grand and audacious mission to conquer the final frontier, the moon. This was the moon race, a fierce competition to be the first nation to set foot on the lunar surface, and it would come to define one of the most intense and captivating chapters of the space age. At the heart of the moon race was the Soviet lunar program, a bold and ambitious effort to establish Soviet dominance in space and to demonstrate the technological superiority of the Soviet system. Launched in the late 1950s, the program was a direct response to the American space program, which had already achieved several significant milestones, including the first human spaceflight and the first orbital flight. The Soviet lunar program was a massive undertaking, involving a wide range of scientific and engineering disciplines, as well as a significant investment of resources and manpower. Its goal was to land a Soviet cosmonaut on the moon and to establish a permanent lunar base thereby establishing Soviet supremacy in space and enhancing the prestige of the Soviet Union on the world stage. The program was launched in 1958, just a year after the Soviet Union had successfully launched the first artificial satellite Sputnik 1. This achievement had sent shockwaves through the United States and the world, as it demonstrated the technological prowess of the Soviet system and raised concerns about the potential military implications of Soviet space capabilities. The Soviet lunar program was built on the success of earlier Soviet space achievements, including the first human spaceflight by Yuri Gagarin in 1961 and the first woman in space by Valentina Tereshkova in 1963. These successes demonstrated the strength and resilience of the Soviet space program, and they laid the groundwork for the even more ambitious lunar mission that was to come. The Soviet lunar program was divided into several stages, each one building on the knowledge and experience gained from the previous ones. The first stage involved a series of unmanned missions designed to test the capabilities of the spacecraft and the equipment in the harsh lunar environment. The second stage involved manned missions to the moon, with cosmonauts orbiting the moon and performing a variety of scientific and engineering tasks. But the ultimate goal of the program was to land a Soviet cosmonaut on the moon and to establish a permanent lunar base. This was a goal that would prove elusive, as the Soviet Union faced a variety of technical and logistical challenges in its efforts to achieve this feat. The Soviet lunar program suffered a series of setbacks, including a series of failed launch attempts and the deaths of several cosmonauts in accidents. Despite these setbacks, the Soviet Union remained committed to the goal of landing a man on the moon. In 1969, just a few months after the United States had achieved this historic feat, the Soviet Union launched the Luna 15 spacecraft on a mission to land on the moon and collect lunar samples. The mission was not successful, and the spacecraft crashed on the lunar surface, but it demonstrated the continued determination of the Soviet Union to achieve lunar success. The Soviet lunar program ultimately came to an end in the mid-1970s as the Soviet Union shifted its focus to other priorities, including military and economic issues. But the legacy of the program lives on, as a testament to the human spirit of exploration and the drive to push beyond the boundaries of our world. The history of human civilization is marked by the ebb and flow of competition and cooperation, of conflict and collaboration. From the wars of antiquity to the diplomacy of modern times, the struggle for power and influence has shaped the destinies of nations and peoples. And in the 20th century, this dynamic played out on a global scale, as two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, vied for dominance in the realms of politics, economics, and science. Nowhere was this struggle more apparent than in the race to conquer space, 
a competition that would come to define one of the most captivating and dramatic chapters of the space age. At its heart, the space race was a story of cooperation and competition, of collaboration and conflict. In the early years of the space age, the United States and the Soviet Union pursued their space programs with a sense of shared purpose, working together to achieve the common goal of exploring the cosmos and pushing the boundaries of human knowledge. But as the Cold War intensified and the stakes grew higher, this spirit of cooperation gave way to a more combative and competitive approach, as each nation sought to outdo the other and demonstrate its technological and political superiority. The early years of the space race were characterized by a sense of optimism and collaboration. In 1958, just a year after the launch of Sputnik, the Soviet Union proposed a joint space mission with the United States, a plan that was later endorsed by President Eisenhower. This proposal, known as the Open Skies Policy, would have allowed each nation to conduct reconnaissance flights over the other's territory in order to promote transparency and reduce tensions. Though the proposal was ultimately rejected by the Soviet Union, it demonstrated a willingness on both sides to explore the potential benefits of space cooperation. This spirit of cooperation was also evident in other areas of the space race, including the development of the International Geophysical Year in 1957. This international scientific initiative brought together scientists from around the world to conduct research on a variety of topics, including the Earth's magnetic field, the properties of the ionosphere, and the behavior of cosmic rays. The United States and the Soviet Union both participated in this initiative, and it served as a model for future international scientific collaborations. But as the space race intensified and the stakes grew higher, the spirit of cooperation gave way to a more competitive and confrontational approach. This was particularly evident in the race to land a man on the moon, a goal that both the United States and the Soviet Union pursued with intense and single-minded determination. The race to the moon was marked by a series of high-profile achievements and setbacks, as each nation sought to outdo the other and demonstrate its technological and scientific prowess. In 1961, the Soviet Union achieved a major milestone with the launch of Yuri Gagarin, the first human being to journey into space. This achievement was followed by a series of other Soviet space successes, including the first woman in space and the first spacewalk. But the United States was not to be outdone. In 1969, just a few months after the Soviet Union had achieved its greatest space triumph with the first manned moon landing, the United States launched its own successful mission, with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin becoming the first humans to set foot on the lunar surface. The competition between the United States and the Soviet Union was not just about technological and scientific achievement. It was also about political and ideological influence, as each nation sought to demonstrate the superiority of its system and the viability of its way of life. The space race was a reflection of the larger struggle for global supremacy, a struggle that would shape the destinies of nations and peoples for decades to come. In the annals of human history, few endeavors have captured the imagination and the spirit of exploration like the Space Shuttle Program and the International Space Station. These two remarkable feats of human ingenuity and perseverance have been hailed as the pinnacle of human achievement in the realm of space exploration and have played a pivotal role in shaping the course of humanity's journey beyond the confines of Earth. The Space Shuttle Program, which began in 1972, was the world's first reusable spacecraft system and represented a major milestone in the evolution of spaceflight technology. Designed to be able to launch like a rocket and land like an airplane, the Space Shuttle was a true marvel of engineering. With its iconic delta wings and tail fins, it could carry up to eight astronauts and a vast array of payloads into orbit and then return to Earth for reuse. Over the course of its 30-year history, the Space Shuttle program achieved a remarkable record of success, launching over 130 missions and carrying more than 350 people into space. It played a crucial role in the construction of the International Space Station and helped to lay the foundation for a new era of human spaceflight. The International Space Station, which began construction in 1998, is a joint project of five space agencies, NASA, Roscosmos, Russia, JAXA, Japan, ESA, Europe, and CSA, Canada. 
The station is a true marvel of international cooperation and collaboration, representing a triumph of diplomacy and technological innovation. The station is the largest and most complex spacecraft ever built, weighing in at over 450 tons and measuring roughly the size of a football field. It is home to a rotating crew of six astronauts, who conduct a wide range of scientific experiments and research in fields such as biology, physics, and astronomy. The station has been instrumental in advancing our understanding of the universe and our place within it. It has enabled scientists to study the effects of microgravity on human physiology and has helped to pave the way for long-duration space missions, such as a potential mission to Mars. Despite its many successes, the Space Shuttle Program and the International Space Station have not been without their challenges and setbacks. The Space Shuttle Challenger disaster in 1986 and the Columbia disaster in 2003 were tragic reminders of the risks inherent in human spaceflight. These tragedies led to a renewed focus on safety and a re-evaluation of the risks and benefits of human space exploration. Moreover, the costs associated with these programs have been a subject of controversy and debate. Critics have argued that the money spent on space exploration could be better used to address pressing issues on Earth, such as poverty, hunger, and disease. Proponents, on the other hand, argue that space exploration is a worthy investment that can yield important scientific and technological advancements, as well as inspire future generations to pursue careers in science and engineering. Despite these challenges, the Space Shuttle Program and the International Space Station remain shining examples of human achievement and the spirit of exploration. They represent the best of what humanity can achieve when we set our minds to it, and they continue to inspire and captivate people around the world. As we look to the future of space exploration, it is clear that the lessons learned from the Space Shuttle Program and the International Space Station will be invaluable. They have shown us that the path to the stars is long and difficult, but ultimately worth the effort. They have taught us the importance of international cooperation and the value of scientific inquiry. And they have inspired generations of people to reach for the stars and pursue their dreams, no matter how difficult or unlikely they may seem. In the end, the Space Shuttle Program and the International Space Station will be remembered as one of humanity's greatest achievements. The space race, the historic competition between the United States and the Soviet Union to explore the cosmos and push the boundaries of human knowledge, was a defining moment in the history of the 20th century. It was a period of intense innovation and discovery, of technological and scientific achievement, and of global politics and diplomacy. But the legacy of the space race goes far beyond the historical events of the time. It has had a profound and lasting impact on the world, shaping the course of scientific and technological development and influencing global politics and international relations. One of the most significant legacies of the space race is the technological advancements that it produced. The United States and the Soviet Union poured vast resources and manpower into their space programs, driving a wave of technological innovation and development that transformed the world. From the development of advanced computing and communication systems to the creation of new materials and propulsion systems, the space race was a catalyst for some of the most significant technological breakthroughs of the modern era. The legacy of the space race is also evident in the impact it had on scientific research and discovery. The exploration of space gave scientists and researchers new tools and methods for understanding the universe, leading to breakthroughs in areas such as astrophysics, cosmology, and astrobiology. The discovery of new planets, stars, and galaxies has deepened our understanding of the origins and evolution of the universe, while the exploration of our own planet from space has provided new insights into the Earth's geology, atmosphere, and climate. But perhaps the most significant legacy of the space race is its impact on global politics and diplomacy. The competition between the United States and the Soviet Union was a defining feature of the Cold War, a period of intense political and ideological conflict that shaped the course of world history. But the space race also had a positive impact on global politics, providing a platform for international cooperation and collaboration. In the early years of the space race, 
the United States and the Soviet Union worked together on a number of initiatives, including the International Geophysical Year and the joint mission proposal known as the Open Skies Policy. Though these efforts were ultimately unsuccessful, they demonstrated a willingness on both sides to explore the potential benefits of space cooperation. Later, the space race provided a platform for diplomatic initiatives such as the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project, a joint mission between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1975. The space race also had a profound impact on the way that the world viewed science and technology. The competition between the United States and the Soviet Union inspired a new generation of scientists, engineers, and innovators, and helped to establish science and technology as a central focus of public policy and popular culture. The space race demonstrated the potential of science and technology to transform the world and improve human life, and it inspired millions of people around the world to pursue careers in science and technology. Finally, the space race had a lasting impact on the way that we view ourselves and our place in the universe. The exploration of space has deepened our understanding of the world and the universe, and it has inspired us to look beyond our own planet and imagine new possibilities for the future. The images of the Earth from space, captured by astronauts and spacecraft, have helped to promote a sense of global awareness and environmentalism, reminding us of the fragility and interconnectedness of our planet. In summary, the legacy of the space race is a rich and complex tapestry, woven from the threads of technological innovation, scientific discovery, global politics, and human aspiration. It has shaped the course of scientific and technological development, influenced global politics and diplomacy, and inspired a new generation of innovators and thinkers. But perhaps its greatest legacy is the way that it has transformed our understanding of the universe and our place in it inspiring us to dream of new horizons. Chapter 7. The Cuban Revolution and Bay of Pigs Invasion In the annals of history, few events stand out as more transformative than the fall of Batista and the rise of Castro. The seismic shifts that occurred in the power dynamics of Cuba, and indeed the whole of Latin America, would have far-reaching effects on the political and social landscape of the region. In the following essay, we will explore the complex set of factors that led to the downfall of Batista and the subsequent ascent of Fidel Castro, a man who would go on to become one of the most iconic and polarizing figures of the 20th century. The origins of the Cuban Revolution can be traced back to the late 19th century, when the country first gained its independence from Spain. In the decades that followed, Cuba became a pawn in the geopolitical chess game between the United States and the Soviet Union. American corporations invested heavily in Cuba's sugar industry, while the U.S. government propped up the regime of General Fulgencio Batista, a military strongman who ruled Cuba with an iron fist. Despite the influx of American money, the Cuban people continued to suffer from poverty, corruption, and political oppression. By the 1950s, discontent with the Batista regime had reached a boiling point. The middle class and urban elites, who had long chafed under Batista's rule, began to ally with the working class and peasants in a broad-based movement for political and economic reform. It was in this context that Fidel Castro emerged as a charismatic and revolutionary leader. Born into a wealthy family, Castro had been educated in Havana and had dabbled in politics before turning to armed rebellion. His guerrilla tactics and fiery speeches inspired a generation of young Cubans who yearned for change. The turning point in the revolution came in 1958, when Castro and his followers launched a successful attack on the military garrison at Santa Clara. The victory was a blow to Batista's forces, and it signaled the beginning of the end for his regime. By New Year's Day of 1959, Batista had fled Cuba and Fidel Castro had taken power. The rise of Castro was not without controversy. His early speeches were laced with promises of democratic reform and an end to political corruption, but as his grip on power solidified, he began to implement more radical policies. He nationalized American-owned businesses, confiscated land from wealthy landowners, and cracked down on dissent. The United States, which had once supported Batista, now saw Castro as a threat to its interests in the region. 
The CIA began to train and arm Cuban exiles in an attempt to overthrow Castro, while the Cuban government turned to the Soviet Union for aid and support. The tensions between Cuba and the United States came to a head in 1961 with the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. A group of Cuban exiles, trained and financed by the CIA, attempted to overthrow Castro's government. The invasion was a disaster, and it only served to strengthen Castro's position. It also marked the beginning of a long and bitter relationship between the United States and Cuba. Castro's government continued to pursue socialist policies, including the establishment of a planned economy and the implementation of universal health care and education. His policies were popular with many Cubans, who saw them as a way to improve their lives after years of poverty and political oppression. However, they were also controversial, and Castro's regime was accused of human rights violations and political repression. The legacy of the Cuban Revolution is complex and multifaceted. On the one hand, it represents a triumph of the will of the people over a corrupt and oppressive regime. It inspired other revolutionary movements throughout Latin America, and it challenged the hegemony of the United States in the region. The Cuban Revolution was one of the most significant events in the history of Latin America, and its impact is still felt to this day. One of the most controversial aspects of the revolution was the role that the United States played in its outcome. In this essay, we will explore the complex and multifaceted ways in which the United States influenced the Cuban Revolution and the long-term effects of that involvement. The relationship between Cuba and the United States has a long and complicated history. From the time of Cuba's independence from Spain in 1898, the United States has played a significant role in the country's political and economic affairs. American corporations invested heavily in Cuba's sugar industry, and the U.S. government often propped up the regimes of various Cuban dictators, including the notorious Fulgencio Batista. It was in this context that Fidel Castro emerged as a revolutionary leader in the 1950s. The middle class and urban elites, who had long chafed under Batista's rule, began to ally with the working class and peasants in a broad-based movement for political and economic reform. Castro's charismatic personality and fiery speeches captured the imagination of the Cuban people, and he quickly became the face of the opposition to Batista's regime. The United States initially supported Batista, seeing him as a bulwark against communism and a friend to American interests in the region. However, as the revolution gained momentum, the U.S. began to shift its position. The Eisenhower administration placed an arms embargo on Batista's government, and U.S. diplomats began to explore the possibility of a post-Batista government that would be more friendly to American interests. The role of the United States in the Cuban Revolution came to a head in 1961, with the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. A group of Cuban exiles, trained and financed by the CIA, attempted to overthrow Castro's government. The invasion was a disaster, and it only served to strengthen Castro's position. It also marked the beginning of a long and bitter relationship between the United States and Cuba. In the years that followed, the United States continued to pursue a policy of hostility toward Cuba. The Kennedy administration imposed a trade embargo on the country, and the CIA launched a series of covert operations designed to destabilize the Castro regime. The U.S. government also supported anti-Castro groups in Miami and elsewhere, and it attempted to isolate Cuba from the rest of the international community. The impact of U.S. involvement in the Cuban Revolution was profound and far-reaching. In the short term, it helped to strengthen Castro's position and cement his grip on power. In the long term, it created a deep and lasting animosity between the United States and Cuba that has yet to be fully resolved. The embargo imposed by the United States has had a significant impact on the Cuban economy, and it has been a major point of contention in the relationship between the two countries. Moreover, the legacy of U.S. involvement in the Cuban Revolution extends far beyond Cuba itself. The revolution inspired other revolutionary movements throughout Latin America, and it challenged the hegemony of the United States in the region. The American government's attempts to overthrow the Castro regime 
helped to fuel anti-American sentiment in the region, and it contributed to a general sense of mistrust between the United States and Latin America. In summary, the role of the United States in the Cuban Revolution was complex and multifaceted. The U.S. government initially supported Batista's regime, but it eventually shifted its position and attempted to influence the outcome of the revolution. Its attempts to overthrow Castro's government were a failure, and they only served to strengthen his position. The establishment of a communist regime in Cuba was one of the most significant events of the 20th century. It was a transformative moment that had far-reaching implications for the region and indeed the world. In this essay, we will explore the complex set of factors that led to the establishment of a communist regime in Cuba and the long-term impact of that regime. The roots of the Cuban Revolution can be traced back to the late 19th century, when Cuba gained its independence from Spain. In the decades that followed, the country became a pawn in the geopolitical chess game between the United States and the Soviet Union. American corporations invested heavily in Cuba's sugar industry, while the U.S. government propped up the regime of General Fulgencio Batista, a military strongman who ruled Cuba with an iron fist. Despite the influx of American money, the Cuban people continued to suffer from poverty, corruption, and political oppression. By the 1950s, discontent with the Batista regime had reached a boiling point. The middle class and urban elites, who had long chafed under Batista's rule, began to ally with the working class and peasants in a broad-based movement for political and economic reform. It was in this context that Fidel Castro emerged as a revolutionary leader. His guerrilla tactics and fiery speeches inspired a generation of young Cubans who yearned for change. The turning point in the revolution came in 1958, when Castro and his followers launched a successful attack on the military garrison at Santa Clara. The victory was a blow to Batista's forces, and it signaled the beginning of the end for his regime. By New Year's Day of 1959, Batista had fled Cuba and Fidel Castro had taken power. The establishment of a communist regime in Cuba was not an immediate outcome of the revolution. Initially, Castro portrayed himself as a nationalist and populist leader, and he made promises of democratic reform and an end to political corruption. However, as his grip on power solidified, he began to implement more radical policies. He nationalized American-owned businesses, confiscated land from wealthy landowners, and cracked down on dissent. The relationship between Cuba and the United States quickly deteriorated as the American government saw Castro as a threat to its interests in the region. The United States imposed an embargo on Cuba, and it began to train and arm Cuban exiles in an attempt to overthrow Castro. The Cuban government turned to the Soviet Union for aid and support, and the two countries formed a close alliance that would last for decades. The implementation of communist policies in Cuba was not without controversy. Castro's regime was accused of human rights violations and political repression, and many Cubans who had initially supported the revolution began to have second thoughts. The United States, meanwhile, continued to pursue a policy of hostility toward Cuba, and the two countries were locked in a tense and often confrontational relationship. The impact of the establishment of a communist regime in Cuba was profound and far-reaching. In the short term, it represented a victory for socialist and anti-colonialist movements around the world. It challenged the hegemony of the United States in the region, and it inspired other revolutionary movements throughout Latin America. In the long term, however, the effects of the regime were more mixed. The Cuban economy suffered under a planned system, and the country became heavily dependent on Soviet aid. The embargo imposed by the United States had a significant impact on the Cuban economy, and it was a major point of contention in the relationship between the two countries. The Bay of Pigs invasion was one of the most significant events in the history of the Cold War. It was a moment that would come to define the relationship between the United States and Cuba, and it represented a turning point in the global struggle between capitalism and communism. In this essay, we will explore the planning and preparation that went into the Bay of Pigs invasion and the factors that ultimately led to its failure. The origins of the Bay of Pigs invasion 
can be traced back to the early 1960s, when the administration of President John F. Kennedy began to explore ways to overthrow the government of Fidel Castro in Cuba. The United States had long been hostile to the Castro regime, and it saw the island nation as a strategic threat to its interests in the region. The CIA was tasked with developing a plan to overthrow the Cuban government, and it began to train and arm Cuban exiles who were opposed to Castro's regime. The plan that emerged was a complex and multifaceted operation that involved a number of different elements. The first step in the plan was to create a base of operations for the Cuban exiles. The CIA identified a remote location on the southern coast of Cuba known as the Bay of Pigs, which was believed to be an ideal spot for a beachhead. The CIA began to construct a base on the beach, complete with barracks, storage facilities, and a runway for planes. The next step in the plan was to recruit and train Cuban exiles who would serve as the core of the invasion force. The CIA recruited exiles from across the United States, and it sent them to a secret training facility in Guatemala. There, they underwent an intensive training program that included weapons training, guerrilla tactics, and psychological warfare. In addition to the training of the invasion force, the CIA also began to build up a network of intelligence assets inside Cuba. The agency recruited Cuban nationals who were opposed to the Castro regime, and it trained them to gather information about the Cuban military and government. The information gathered by these assets would be used to guide the invasion force and to provide critical intelligence to the CIA. As the invasion force was being trained and prepared, the Kennedy administration began to put in place a diplomatic and political strategy to support the operation. The United States government sought to win the support of the international community for the invasion, and it worked to build a coalition of countries that would support the anti-Castro forces. However, the Bay of Pigs invasion was plagued by a number of strategic and tactical flaws. One of the most significant problems was the lack of air support for the invasion force. The Kennedy administration had made the decision not to provide air cover for the invasion, which meant that the invasion force was vulnerable to attack from the Cuban military. In addition, the invasion force was significantly smaller than originally planned, and it lacked critical support from the Cuban people. The anti-Castro forces were unable to gain significant support from the Cuban people, who remained largely loyal to the Castro regime. The failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion had significant and far-reaching implications. It was a major embarrassment for the Kennedy administration, and it marked a turning point in the relationship between the United States and Cuba. The invasion helped to cement the Castro regime in power, and it contributed to a deep and lasting animosity between the United States and Cuba that has yet to be fully resolved. In summary, the Bay of Pigs invasion was a complex and multifaceted operation that involved a number of different elements. The planning and preparation for the invasion were extensive, and they involved a range of different strategies and tactics. The Bay of Pigs invasion is one of the most infamous events in the history of the Cold War. It was a moment that would come to define the relationship between the United States and Cuba, and it represented a turning point in the global struggle between capitalism and communism. In this essay, we will explore the failed assault itself and the factors that led to the invasion's ultimate failure. On the morning of April 17, 1961, a force of approximately 1,400 anti-Castro Cuban exiles landed on the beaches of the Bay of Pigs. They were met with fierce resistance from the Cuban military, who had been tipped off about the invasion by a Cuban intelligence agent who had defected to the Castro regime. The invasion was supposed to be a swift and decisive victory for the anti-Castro forces. The plan was to establish a beachhead on the southern coast of Cuba, and then to link up with other anti-Castro forces who would rise up in support of the invasion. However, from the outset, the invasion was plagued by a number of strategic and tactical flaws. One of the most significant problems was the lack of air support for the invasion force. The Kennedy administration had made the decision not to provide air cover for the invasion, which meant that the invasion force was vulnerable to attack from the Cuban military. The Cuban military quickly gained the upper hand, and the invasion force was unable to establish a beachhead. 
In addition, the invasion force was significantly smaller than originally planned, and it lacked critical support from the Cuban people. The anti-Castro forces were unable to gain significant support from the Cuban people, who remained largely loyal to the Castro regime. As a result, the invasion force was isolated and cut off from any potential support. The anti-Castro forces were also hampered by a lack of effective leadership. The leaders of the invasion force were inexperienced and ill-prepared for the challenges they faced. They were unable to provide effective guidance to the troops on the ground, and they were unable to coordinate their actions effectively. Despite these problems, the anti-Castro forces fought fiercely and bravely. They were able to hold out for three days against overwhelming odds, but ultimately they were forced to surrender. The Cuban military took the invasion force captive, and the prisoners were paraded before the international press as evidence of the failure of the invasion. The failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion had significant and far-reaching implications. It was a major embarrassment for the Kennedy administration, and it marked a turning point in the relationship between the United States and Cuba. The invasion helped to cement the Castro regime in power, and it contributed to a deep and lasting animosity between the United States and Cuba that has yet to be fully resolved. In summary, the Bay of Pigs invasion was a failure of epic proportions. It was plagued by a range of strategic and tactical flaws, including a lack of air support, a lack of effective leadership, and a lack of support from the Cuban people. Despite the bravery and determination of the anti-Castro forces, they were ultimately unable to overcome the odds, and the invasion was a resounding failure. The impact of the failed assault was significant, and it would shape the course of the Cold War for years to come. The Bay of Pigs invasion was a turning point in the relationship between the United States and Cuba, and it had a significant impact on the global struggle between capitalism and communism. In this essay, we will explore the reaction of the United States to the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion and the factors that shaped its response. In the aftermath of the failed invasion, the Kennedy administration was faced with a range of challenges. The invasion had been a significant embarrassment for the United States, and it had damaged the credibility of the administration both at home and abroad. The United States had also lost a significant number of Cuban exiles who had been trained and financed by the CIA. The Kennedy administration's initial response was to deny any involvement in the invasion. However, as more information about the operation became public, it became clear that the United States had been heavily involved in the planning and execution of the invasion. The administration was forced to admit its role, and it faced a barrage of criticism both at home and abroad. In the wake of the failure of the invasion, the Kennedy administration took a number of steps to address the fallout. One of the most significant was the creation of the Special Group, a committee of high-level officials tasked with reviewing the intelligence failures that had led to the invasion. The committee was chaired by the president's brother, Robert Kennedy, and it included a range of experts in intelligence and national security. The Special Group was tasked with reviewing the intelligence failures that had led to the invasion, and with making recommendations for how to improve the intelligence gathering process. The committee also reviewed the overall strategy of the United States in Cuba, and it recommended a number of changes to the approach that had been taken up to that point. One of the most significant changes was a shift in strategy away from covert operations and toward diplomatic and economic pressure. The Kennedy administration imposed a trade embargo on Cuba, and it worked to isolate the country from the rest of the international community. The administration also began to explore ways to improve relations with other Latin American countries in an attempt to reduce the influence of the Soviet Union in the region. The reaction of the United States to the Bay of Pigs failure was also shaped by the broader context of the Cold War. The Kennedy administration was acutely aware of the need to project strength and resolve in the face of the Soviet Union, and the failure of the invasion was seen as a major setback in that regard. The administration took steps to bolster its military and intelligence capabilities, and it worked to develop new strategies for confronting the Soviet Union in other parts of the world. In addition to these broader strategic considerations, 
the reaction of the United States to the Bay of Pigs failure was also shaped by the political climate of the time. The Kennedy administration was facing mounting criticism from political opponents and the media, and the failure of the invasion only added to that criticism. The administration was forced to defend its policies and to reassure the American people that it was capable of protecting the country's interests abroad. In summary, the reaction of the United States to the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion was shaped by a range of factors, including strategic considerations, political pressures, and the broader context of the Cold War. The Kennedy administration took a number of steps to address the fallout from the invasion, including the creation of the special group and a shift in strategy away from covert operations. The impact of the Bay of Pigs failure was significant, and it would shape the course of U.S.-Cuban relations for decades to come. The Bay of Pigs invasion was a significant event in the history of the Cold War, and it had a profound impact on the relationship between the United States and Cuba. However, the invasion also had important implications for the Soviet Union, which had become a key ally of the Cuban government. In this essay, we will explore the Soviet Union's response to the Bay of Pigs invasion and the factors that shaped its reaction. In the years leading up to the Bay of Pigs invasion, the Soviet Union had become a close ally of the Cuban government. The two countries had established a close economic and military relationship, with the Soviet Union providing significant aid and support to the Cuban government. The Soviet Union viewed Cuba as a key strategic partner in the region, and it saw the Castro regime as a bulwark against American influence in the region. When the Bay of Pigs invasion began in April of 1961, the Soviet Union was quick to respond. The Soviet government issued a strong statement condemning the invasion, and it pledged its support to the Cuban government. The Soviet Union began to send military advisors to Cuba, and it increased its financial and material support to the country. The Soviet Union also worked to leverage the situation to its advantage. The invasion had the potential to destabilize the region, and the Soviet Union saw an opportunity to increase its influence in the area. The Soviet government began to work with other countries in the region to build a coalition of support for the Cuban government, and it sought to use the crisis to strengthen its ties with other countries in Latin America. The Soviet Union also took steps to counter American influence in the region. The Kennedy administration had been working to isolate Cuba and to build a coalition of countries opposed to the Cuban government. The Soviet Union responded by working to increase its own influence in the region and by strengthening its alliances with other countries that were opposed to American influence in the area. The Soviet Union's response to the Bay of Pigs invasion was shaped by a number of factors, including its strategic interests in the region, its relationship with the Cuban government, and its rivalry with the United States. The invasion represented a significant threat to the Soviet Union's strategic interests in the region, and the Soviet government responded with a series of measures designed to protect its interests and to counter American influence. The Soviet Union's response to the Bay of Pigs invasion also had significant long-term implications. The Soviet government's increased support for the Cuban government helped to cement the Castro regime in power, and it contributed to a deepening of the relationship between the two countries. The Soviet Union's increased influence in the region also helped to establish a new balance of power, with the Soviet Union emerging as a significant player in the region. In summary, the Soviet Union's response to the Bay of Pigs invasion was a reflection of its strategic interests in the region, its relationship with the Cuban government, and its rivalry with the United States. The Soviet Union responded to the invasion with a range of measures designed to protect its interests and to counter American influence in the area. The impact of the Soviet Union's response was significant, and it would shape the course of the Cold War for years to come. The Cuban Missile Crisis was one of the most dangerous moments in the history of the Cold War. It brought the world to the brink of nuclear war and it represented a turning point in the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. In this essay, we will explore the background and causes of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the factors that led to the dangerous standoff between the two superpowers. 
In the years leading up to the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States and the Soviet Union had become engaged in a global struggle for dominance. The two superpowers were engaged in a range of proxy wars and covert operations, and tensions between the two countries were high. One of the key battlegrounds in this struggle was Cuba. In 1959, Fidel Castro had led a successful revolution in Cuba, and he had established a communist government. The United States saw the new Cuban government as a threat to its interests in the region, and it worked to isolate Cuba and to undermine the Castro regime. The United States imposed a trade embargo on Cuba, and it began to work with anti-Castro forces in the country. The Soviet Union saw an opportunity to gain a foothold in the Western Hemisphere by supporting the Cuban government. In 1962, the Soviet Union began to secretly transport nuclear missiles and other weapons to Cuba, with the aim of establishing a nuclear deterrent on America's doorstep. The discovery of the Soviet missile installations in Cuba set off a chain of events that would lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis. In October of 1962, American reconnaissance flights revealed the presence of Soviet missiles in Cuba. President John F. Kennedy was informed of the situation, and he convened a group of top advisors to determine how to respond. The Kennedy administration was faced with a range of options for dealing with the situation. Some advisors advocated for a military strike on the missile sites, while others argued for a diplomatic solution. Ultimately, Kennedy chose to pursue a combination of diplomacy and military pressure in an attempt to force the Soviet Union to remove the missiles. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a dangerous and tense moment in the history of the Cold War. The United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in a high-stakes game of brinksmanship, with the threat of nuclear war looming over every decision. The crisis was characterized by a series of tense negotiations as both sides sought to avoid a catastrophic outcome. The causes of the Cuban Missile Crisis were complex and multifaceted. The crisis was rooted in the broader struggle for dominance between the United States and the Soviet Union, and in the specific context of the United States' relationship with Cuba. The Soviet Union saw an opportunity to gain a strategic advantage by placing nuclear missiles in Cuba, and the United States saw the move as a direct threat to its national security. In summary, the Cuban Missile Crisis was a dangerous moment in the history of the Cold War, and it was driven by a range of factors. The crisis was rooted in the broader struggle for dominance between the United States and the Soviet Union, and it was shaped by the specific context of the United States' relationship with Cuba. The crisis was a testament to the dangerous nature of the global struggle between capitalism and communism, and it represented a turning point in the history of the Cold War. The Cuban Revolution of 1959 and the Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961 are two significant events that have left a lasting impact on the relationship between the United States and Cuba. The revolution marked a turning point in Cuban history, and the Bay of Pigs invasion was a failed attempt by the United States to overthrow the revolutionary government. In this essay, I will explore the legacy of these events and their impact on U.S.-Cuba relations. The Cuban Revolution was a social and political upheaval that resulted in the overthrow of Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista and the establishment of a socialist state under the leadership of Fidel Castro. The revolution was fueled by a desire for economic and political autonomy, and it was seen as a victory for anti-imperialism and socialism in Latin America. The revolution also marked the end of the United States' dominance over Cuba, which had been a virtual colony of the U.S. for decades. The Bay of Pigs invasion was an attempt by the U.S to overthrow the revolutionary government of Fidel Castro. The plan was to train and arm a group of Cuban exiles, who would then invade Cuba and overthrow the government. The invasion was a disaster, and the exiles were quickly defeated by the Cuban military. The failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion was a significant blow to the U.S., both politically and militarily. The legacy of the Cuban Revolution and the Bay of Pigs invasion has had a profound impact on U.S.-Cuba relations. The revolution marked the beginning of a new era in Cuban history and the end of U.S. domination in the country. 
The revolution also set the stage for a long and contentious relationship between the U.S. and Cuba, one that was marked by political and economic tensions. The Bay of Pigs invasion was a turning point in U.S.-Cuba relations. It was a clear indication that the U.S. was willing to use force to achieve its goals in Cuba. The invasion also led to a hardening of the revolutionary government's stance towards the U.S., as it saw the attack as evidence of U.S. aggression towards Cuba. The failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion also had a significant impact on U.S. foreign policy, as it was a clear indication that the U.S. was not invincible and that military force was not always the solution to political problems. The legacy of the Cuban Revolution and the Bay of Pigs invasion can be seen in the continued political and economic tensions between the U.S. and Cuba. The U.S. has maintained an embargo on Cuba since 1962, which has had a significant impact on the Cuban economy. The embargo has also been a point of contention between the U.S. and Cuba, with Cuba seeing it as evidence of U.S. aggression towards the country. The legacy of the Cuban Revolution and the Bay of Pigs invasion can also be seen in the continued political tensions between the U.S. and Cuba. The U.S. has maintained a hard-line stance towards the revolutionary government, refusing to recognize its legitimacy and refusing to engage in meaningful dialogue with the Cuban government. This has led to a situation where U.S.-Cuba relations are marked by a lack of trust and understanding. In summary, the legacy of the Cuban Revolution and the Bay of Pigs invasion has had a profound impact on U.S.-Cuba relations. The revolution marked the end of U.S. domination in Cuba and the beginning of a new era in Cuban history. The Bay of Pigs invasion was a failed attempt by the U.S. to overthrow the revolutionary government, and it marked a turning point in U.S. foreign policy. The legacy of these events can be seen in the continued political and economic tensions between the U.S. and Cuba, and in the lack of trust and understanding between the two countries. The Cuban Missile Crisis was one of the most significant moments in the history of the Cold War. It brought the world to the brink of nuclear war, and it represented a turning point in the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. In this essay, we will explore the U.S. response to the Cuban Missile Crisis and the factors that led to the resolution of the crisis. The discovery of Soviet missile installations in Cuba set off a series of tense negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Kennedy administration was faced with a range of options for dealing with the situation, including military strikes and diplomatic efforts. Ultimately, the administration chose to pursue a combination of diplomacy and military pressure in an attempt to force the Soviet Union to remove the missiles. The United States responded to the crisis by implementing a naval quarantine around Cuba, designed to prevent further shipments of Soviet missiles from reaching the island. The U.S. military also increased its readiness and began to prepare for a potential military strike on the missile sites. The Kennedy administration also sought to negotiate a resolution to the crisis through diplomatic channels. The administration made a public announcement about the discovery of the missile sites, and it presented evidence of the Soviet Union's actions to the United Nations. The administration also engaged in a series of secret negotiations with the Soviet government in an attempt to find a way to peacefully resolve the crisis. The negotiations were tense and difficult, and they were characterized by a series of demands and counter-demands. The United States demanded that the Soviet Union remove the missiles from Cuba, and the Soviet Union demanded that the United States remove its missiles from Turkey. Both sides also sought to avoid being seen as weak or giving in to the demands of the other side. In the end, the crisis was resolved through a series of concessions and agreements. The Soviet Union agreed to remove its missiles from Cuba, and the United States agreed not to invade Cuba and to remove its missiles from Turkey. The resolution of the crisis was seen as a victory for the Kennedy administration, and it helped to restore the credibility of the United States on the world stage. The resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis had significant implications for the broader Cold War. It represented a moment of de-escalation in the global struggle between capitalism and communism, 
and it helped to reduce tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. The resolution of the crisis also helped to establish a new framework for negotiations and diplomacy between the two superpowers, and it contributed to a more stable global order. In summary, the U.S. response to the Cuban Missile Crisis was a combination of military pressure and diplomatic negotiations. The United States sought to resolve the crisis peacefully, and it was able to reach a resolution through a series of concessions and agreements. The resolution of the crisis had significant implications for the broader Cold War, and it helped to establish a more stable and peaceful global order. Chapter 8. The Cuban Missile Crisis The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 is widely regarded as one of the most significant events of the Cold War. The crisis was a defining moment in U.S.-Soviet relations and marked the closest the world came to nuclear war. In this essay, I will explore the early stages of the Cuban Missile Crisis, focusing on the actions of the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the days and weeks leading up to the crisis. The origins of the Cuban Missile Crisis can be traced back to the Cuban Revolution of 1959. The revolution brought Fidel Castro to power, and he quickly established a socialist government that aligned itself with the Soviet Union. The U.S. was alarmed by the presence of a communist government in its own backyard and began to take steps to isolate Cuba. In the early 1960s, the U.S. began to plan a number of covert operations aimed at destabilizing the Cuban government. These included the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961 and a series of unsuccessful attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro. These actions only served to further inflame tensions between the U.S. and Cuba and they also led to an increased Soviet presence in Cuba. In July 1962, the Soviet Union began to secretly transport nuclear missiles and other military hardware to Cuba. The decision to deploy missiles in Cuba was driven by a number of factors, including the desire to protect Cuba from a possible U.S. invasion and to counterbalance the U.S. missile deployment in Turkey. The deployment of Soviet missiles in Cuba was a highly provocative move that would eventually lead to a confrontation between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The U.S. first became aware of the Soviet missile deployment in Cuba in August 1962. U.S. spy planes had detected the construction of missile sites in Cuba, and President John F. Kennedy was briefed on the situation. Kennedy immediately established a task force to assess the situation and began to consider his options. In September 1962, Kennedy addressed the United Nations General Assembly and called for the removal of Soviet missiles from Cuba. He also announced that the U.S. would set up a naval blockade around Cuba to prevent further Soviet shipments of military hardware. The announcement of the naval blockade marked a significant escalation in the crisis and set the stage for a potential military confrontation. The Soviet Union responded to the U.S. actions by denouncing the naval blockade as an act of aggression and insisting that the missile deployment in Cuba was purely defensive. The Soviet Union also began to make preparations for a possible military conflict with the U.S. In the early stages of the crisis, both the U.S. and the Soviet Union were taking actions that were seen as provocative by the other side. The U.S. naval blockade was a clear signal that the U.S. was willing to use force to achieve its goals while the Soviet missile deployment in Cuba was seen as a direct threat to U.S. national security. The situation was made more dangerous by the fact that both the U.S. and the Soviet Union had significant nuclear arsenals, and any military conflict could quickly escalate into a full-scale nuclear war. In summary, the early stages of the Cuban Missile Crisis were marked by a series of provocative actions by both the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The deployment of Soviet missiles in Cuba was a highly provocative move that threatened U.S. national security, while the U.S. naval blockade was seen as an act of aggression by the Soviet Union. The situation was made more dangerous by the fact that both sides had significant nuclear arsenals, and any military conflict could quickly escalate into a full-scale nuclear war. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a defining moment in U.S.-Soviet relations and it serves as a stark reminder of the dangers of nuclear weapons. It was in the year of our Lord 1962 
that the world stood at the brink of destruction. The Cold War between the two great superpowers of the age had reached its boiling point, as the Soviet Union sought to place nuclear missiles on the island of Cuba, just a short distance from the shores of the United States. In response, the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, ordered a naval blockade of Cuba, an act of war that would ultimately prevent the Soviet Union from carrying out its plans and avert a global catastrophe. The response of President Kennedy to the crisis was one that reflected both the deep-seated fears and the cold determination of the American people. The blockade of Cuba was a bold and audacious move, one that demonstrated the resolve of the United States to stand firm against the Soviet threat. It was an act of defiance against the Soviet Union, a clear signal that the United States would not be bullied into submission. The blockade of Cuba was a monumental undertaking, requiring the mobilization of the entire U.S. Navy, including the deployment of nuclear submarines armed with nuclear weapons. The blockade was enforced with a relentless determination, as American ships stood guard at the entrance to Cuba's ports, ready to intercept any Soviet vessels attempting to deliver the missiles. The world held its breath as the two great superpowers engaged in a high-stakes game of brinksmanship, each side daring the other to make the first move. For 13 tense days, the world waited to see what would happen. The fate of millions of lives hung in the balance, as the possibility of a nuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union loomed ever larger. But the resolve of the American people did not falter. President Kennedy remained steadfast, urging calm and restraint in the face of mounting tensions. He addressed the American people in a series of televised speeches, outlining the reasons for the blockade and the dangers of allowing the Soviet Union to place nuclear missiles in Cuba. The world watched as the Soviet Union finally backed down, agreeing to remove the missiles in exchange for a promise from the United States not to invade Cuba and to remove U.S. missiles from Turkey. The Cuban Missile Crisis was over, and the world breathed a collective sigh of relief. The response of President Kennedy to the crisis was one that would go down in history as a model of leadership in times of crisis. His cool and measured approach to the crisis, coupled with his unwavering determination to protect the United States from the threat of Soviet aggression, demonstrated his skill as a leader and his commitment to the safety and security of the American people. The naval blockade of Cuba was a pivotal moment in the history of the Cold War, one that demonstrated the dangers of nuclear weapons and the need for international cooperation in order to prevent a global catastrophe. It was a moment that would define the presidency of John F. Kennedy and would shape the course of world history for years to come. In the end, the response of President Kennedy to the crisis was a resounding success. By standing firm against the Soviet threat, he was able to prevent a global catastrophe and preserve the safety and security of the American people. The blockade of Cuba demonstrated the resolve of the United States to stand up to the Soviet Union and set the stage for a new era of cooperation and peace between the two great superpowers. As the world looks back on the events of 1962, we are reminded of the dangers of nuclear weapons and the need for continued vigilance in the face of global threats. But we are also reminded of the courage and determination of the American people and the leadership of President John F. Kennedy in the face of crisis. It was a time of great tumult and uncertainty, when the fate of nations hung in the balance and the world was poised on the brink of a cataclysmic conflict. In the early days of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union found themselves locked in a bitter struggle for global dominance, with each side vying for supremacy in a high-stakes game of brinkmanship. In this context, the Soviet response to the U.S. naval blockade was a pivotal moment that would come to define the course of the Cold War. For the first time, the world saw the two superpowers engage in a direct and open confrontation, as the U.S. sought to impose its will on the Soviet Union by cutting off its access to the sea. The Soviet response to this challenge was swift and resolute, as the country mobilized its resources and marshaled its forces to meet the threat. From the very beginning, it was clear that the Soviet Union was not going to be cowed by the U.S. blockade, and that it was willing to take whatever measures were necessary to defend its interests and protect its people. One of the key elements of the Soviet response 
was the deployment of military forces to counter the U.S. naval blockade. Soviet submarines and surface vessels patrolled the waters around the blockade, probing for weaknesses and seeking to disrupt the U.S. naval presence. At the same time, Soviet aircraft and missiles were placed on high alert, ready to strike at any U.S. ships that ventured too close to Soviet territory. Despite the formidable nature of the Soviet response, however, the U.S. blockade continued to take its toll on the Soviet economy and society. As goods and resources became scarce, Soviet leaders were forced to make difficult decisions about how to allocate their limited resources. Many ordinary Soviet citizens suffered as a result, with shortages of basic goods such as food and fuel becoming commonplace. Yet even as the pressure mounted, the Soviet Union refused to back down. Instead, it continued to ramp up its military and economic efforts, seeking to outmaneuver the U.S. and gain the upper hand in the Cold War. The country launched a series of ambitious new initiatives, such as the development of nuclear weapons and the space program, that aimed to demonstrate Soviet strength and technological prowess to the world. In the end, the Soviet response to the U.S. naval blockade would prove to be a turning point in the Cold War. Though the blockade itself was eventually lifted, the conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet Union would continue for decades to come, shaping the course of world history and defining the post-World War II era. Looking back on this pivotal moment in history, it is clear that the Soviet response to the U.S. naval blockade was a testament to the country's resilience, determination, and military might. Though the blockade posed a significant challenge to the Soviet Union, the country was able to rise to the occasion, mobilizing its resources and marshalling its forces to meet the threat. In doing so, the Soviet Union demonstrated to the world that it was not a country to be underestimated and that it was willing to take bold and decisive action in defense of its interests and values. Today, as the world continues to grapple with the legacy of the Cold War, it is important to remember the lessons of the past. The Soviet response to the U.S. naval blockade stands as a powerful reminder of the dangers of unchecked aggression and the need for strong, principled leadership in times of crisis. As we look to the future, we must remain vigilant and steadfast in our commitment to peace and security, lest we repeat the mistakes of the past and plunge the world into another era of conflict and uncertainty. In the annals of human history, there are few moments that have captured the attention and imagination of the world quite like the Cuban Missile Crisis. In the fall of 1962, the United States and the Soviet Union came perilously close to the brink of nuclear war, as the two superpowers faced off over the placement of Soviet missiles in Cuba. The public reaction to this crisis was nothing short of extraordinary, as people across the globe watched with bated breath as the fate of humanity hung in the balance. From the very outset of the crisis, the public response was one of intense concern and anxiety. In the United States, there was a palpable sense of fear and uncertainty as the country faced the prospect of a nuclear strike on its own soil. The government issued a series of stark warnings to the American people, urging them to stockpile supplies and prepare for the worst. The media coverage of the crisis was relentless, with newspapers and television stations around the world providing round-the-clock updates on the latest developments. In the United States, the crisis dominated the headlines with images of the Soviet missiles and American military preparations plastered across the front pages of newspapers and magazines. As the crisis deepened, the public response grew more urgent and vocal. Protests and demonstrations erupted in cities across the United States and around the world, as people demanded an end to the hostilities and a return to peace. In Washington, D.C., Thousands of people gathered in front of the White House, waving signs and chanting slogans in support of diplomacy and de-escalation. Even as tensions continued to mount, however, there were also signs of hope and resilience. People from all walks of life came together to support one another and to show their solidarity in the face of the crisis. Churches and community organizations organized prayer vigils and rallies, while ordinary citizens volunteered to help their neighbors and communities prepare for the worst. In the end, the crisis was resolved through a combination of diplomacy and brinkmanship, as both the United States and the Soviet Union made concessions and backed away from the brink of war. 
The public reaction to the resolution of the crisis was one of immense relief and gratitude, as people across the world breathed a collective sigh of relief and celebrated the preservation of peace. Looking back on the public reaction to the Cuban Missile Crisis, it is clear that the crisis represented a turning point in the Cold War and a defining moment in human history. The public response to the crisis was a testament to the resilience and determination of the human spirit, as people from all walks of life came together to support one another and to demand an end to the hostilities. Today, as we grapple with the many challenges and uncertainties of the modern world, it is important to remember the lessons of the Cuban Missile Crisis. We must remain vigilant and committed to peace, and we must never forget the tremendous power of the public to effect change and to shape the course of history. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a moment of profound significance, a moment that tested the courage and resilience of the human spirit. It was a moment that called forth the best in us, and that reminded us of the fragility and preciousness of life itself. May we never forget the lessons of that moment, and may we always remain steadfast in our commitment to peace and to the common good. It was a time of great uncertainty, when the fate of the world seemed to hang in the balance. The Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union had reached a fever pitch, and both nations had amassed formidable military forces, including nuclear weapons capable of unimaginable destruction. The military readiness and nuclear capabilities of the two superpowers would ultimately determine the course of world history, and their armies stood ready to engage in a deadly conflict that could have spelled the end of civilization as we know it. The United States, long considered the preeminent military power in the world, had an impressive array of weapons at its disposal. Its nuclear arsenal was the largest in the world, with thousands of weapons stockpiled and ready to be deployed at a moment's notice. The U.S. military was well-trained and battle-tested, having fought in numerous conflicts around the world, from Korea to Vietnam. Its air force was second to none, with hundreds of bombers and fighter jets that could deliver devastating blows to enemy targets. But the Soviet Union was no slouch when it came to military readiness and nuclear capabilities. It, too, had a massive nuclear arsenal, with thousands of weapons at its disposal. Its army was the largest in the world, with millions of soldiers trained and equipped to fight on multiple fronts. Its air force was equally impressive, with advanced fighter jets and bombers capable of delivering payloads deep into enemy territory. The two superpowers engaged in a deadly game of one-upmanship, with each side seeking to outdo the other in terms of military readiness and nuclear capabilities. This led to a dangerous escalation of tensions, as each side sought to demonstrate its strength and resolve in the face of the other. The result was a global arms race, with both nations pouring vast sums of money into the development of new weapons and technologies. The U.S. and USSR engaged in a deadly game of brinksmanship, with each side daring the other to make the first move. This led to a number of close calls, including the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, when the U.S. and USSR came dangerously close to engaging in a full-scale nuclear exchange. The world held its breath as the two superpowers stood on the brink of war, with the fate of millions of lives hanging in the balance. In the end, the military readiness and nuclear capabilities of the U.S. and USSR would ultimately determine the course of world history. The threat of nuclear war was a constant presence, and both sides recognized the dangers of engaging in a conflict that could lead to the destruction of civilization as we know it. This recognition ultimately led to a series of arms control agreements, including the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, SALT, which sought to limit the number of nuclear weapons in the hands of both nations. The Cold War ultimately came to an end with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The world breathed a sigh of relief as the threat of nuclear war receded and the two superpowers engaged in a new era of cooperation and peace. But the lessons of the Cold War remain as relevant today as they were in the past. The dangers of nuclear war are still present, and the military readiness and nuclear capabilities of nations around the world continue to shape the course of global events. As we look back on the military readiness and nuclear capabilities of the U.S. and USSR, we are reminded of the dangers of nationalism and the need for international cooperation. 
The Cold War was a testament to the dangers of pride and hubris, and the importance of working together to achieve a common goal. It was a time of great uncertainty, but it also brought with it lessons that we can carry forward into the future. In the annals of history, few events have captured the imagination and attention of the world quite like the negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Though the two superpowers were locked in a bitter struggle for global dominance, there were moments of backdoor diplomacy that helped to defuse tensions and prevent the outbreak of open conflict. The negotiations between the U.S. and USSR were a delicate dance, fraught with danger and uncertainty. Each side was acutely aware of the other's military capabilities, and both were determined to protect their interests and assert their dominance on the world stage. Despite these challenges, however, there were moments when the two sides were able to find common ground and work together towards a common goal. One of the most significant examples of this was the negotiation of arms control agreements, which sought to limit the development and deployment of nuclear weapons. These negotiations were often conducted through backdoor channels, with secret meetings and informal discussions taking place between representatives of the two countries. The negotiations were a delicate balancing act, with both sides seeking to gain an advantage while avoiding a direct confrontation that could lead to war. One of the key figures in these negotiations was Henry Kissinger, who served as National Security Advisor and Secretary of State under Presidents Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford. Kissinger was a master of backdoor diplomacy, with a keen understanding of the Soviet mindset and a willingness to engage in tough negotiations. Through his efforts, Kissinger was able to help negotiate the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, SALT, which was signed by the U.S. and the Soviet Union in 1972. The treaty was a significant milestone in the history of arms control, and it helped to diffuse tensions between the two superpowers by limiting the development and deployment of nuclear weapons. The negotiations between the U.S. and USSR also extended beyond arms control with efforts to resolve regional conflicts and promote economic cooperation. One notable example of this was the negotiation of the Helsinki Accords in 1975, which sought to promote human rights and cooperation between the U.S., the Soviet Union, and other European countries. The negotiations between the U.S. and USSR were not without their challenges and setbacks, however. There were moments of tension and brinkmanship, as both sides sought to gain an advantage and assert their dominance. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, for example, was a significant setback to U.S.-Soviet relations, as it undermined efforts towards cooperation and arms control. Despite these challenges, however, the negotiations between the U.S. and USSR helped to defuse tensions and prevent the outbreak of open conflict. They demonstrated the power of diplomacy and backdoor channels, and they underscored the importance of finding common ground and working towards shared goals. Looking back on the negotiations between the U.S. and USSR, it is clear that they represented a turning point in the Cold War and a defining moment in human history. They showed that even in the midst of bitter conflict, there are opportunities for dialogue and cooperation. They demonstrated the power of diplomacy and backdoor channels, and they showed that even the most seemingly intractable conflicts can be resolved through negotiation and compromise. The negotiations between the U.S. and USSR were a testament to the power of human ingenuity and the resilience of the human spirit. They showed that even in the darkest of times, there are opportunities for dialogue and cooperation. May we never forget the lessons of these negotiations and may we always remain committed to finding common ground and working towards shared goals. In the autumn of 1962, the world stood on the brink of nuclear war. The United States of America and the Soviet Union had been locked in a tense standoff over the deployment of Soviet missiles in Cuba. This crisis, which came to be known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, was one of the most dangerous moments in human history. The stakes were high, the risks great, and the potential consequences catastrophic. In the midst of this crisis, the Kennedy administration pursued a diplomatic strategy aimed at resolving the conflict peacefully. President John F. Kennedy and his advisors recognized that the use of military force could lead to a global catastrophe, and therefore sought to avoid it at all costs. 
The diplomatic efforts of the Kennedy administration were multifaceted and complex. They involved a variety of channels and initiatives, including direct communication with Soviet leaders, public statements and speeches, and behind-the-scenes negotiations. One of the most significant diplomatic initiatives undertaken by the Kennedy administration was the use of back-channel communications with the Soviet Union. The president's brother, Robert F. Kennedy, was dispatched to meet with Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin in Washington, D.C., in order to negotiate a peaceful resolution to the crisis. These secret communications, which took place outside of formal diplomatic channels, allowed the two sides to explore potential avenues for compromise and to build trust between the two superpowers. Another important diplomatic effort was the use of public statements and speeches to signal the United States' commitment to avoiding war while also warning the Soviet Union of the consequences of their actions. President Kennedy gave a series of televised addresses to the American people in which he outlined the U.S. position and called for a peaceful resolution to the crisis. These speeches were carefully crafted to appeal to both the American people and the international community and to project a sense of strength and resolve, while also emphasizing the importance of diplomacy. Behind-the-scenes negotiations were also critical to the success of the Kennedy administration's diplomatic efforts. The president's brother, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, was heavily involved in these negotiations and worked tirelessly to build relationships with key Soviet officials. Through these negotiations, the Kennedy administration was able to lay the groundwork for a peaceful resolution to the crisis. One of the most significant achievements of the Kennedy administration's diplomatic efforts was the establishment of a direct line of communication between the White House and the Kremlin. This hotline, as it came to be known, allowed for rapid communication between the two superpowers in the event of another crisis. This direct line of communication helped to prevent misunderstandings and miscalculations that could have led to war. In the end, the Kennedy administration's diplomatic efforts were successful. Through a combination of back-channel negotiations, public statements and speeches, and behind-the-scenes diplomacy, the crisis was peacefully resolved. The Soviet Union agreed to remove their missiles from Cuba, and the United States agreed to remove their missiles from Turkey. The resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis was a defining moment in the history of the United States and the world. It demonstrated the importance of diplomacy and the value of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. The Kennedy administration's diplomatic efforts were a testament to the power of communication, negotiation, and compromise in resolving even the most intractable conflicts. In summary, the Kennedy administration's diplomatic efforts to resolve the Cuban Missile Crisis were a crucial element in the peaceful resolution of one of the most dangerous moments in human history. Through back-channel communications, public statements and speeches, and behind-the-scenes negotiations, the Kennedy administration was able to build trust, establish direct lines of communication, and ultimately achieve a peaceful resolution to the crisis. In the history of international relations, there are few events that have had as profound an impact as the Cuban Missile Crisis. The crisis, which brought the world to the brink of nuclear war, has left a lasting legacy on the international community, particularly in the areas of international relations and nuclear proliferation. At the heart of the Cuban Missile Crisis was a power struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union, as each country sought to assert its dominance and protect its interests. In this context, the placement of Soviet missiles in Cuba was seen as a direct threat to U.S. national security, and the U.S. responded with a naval blockade and a threat of military force. The crisis was resolved through a combination of diplomacy and brinksmanship, with both sides making concessions and stepping back from the brink of war. The legacy of the crisis, however, would be felt for years to come, as it fundamentally altered the international landscape and raised important questions about the nature of international relations and the threat of nuclear proliferation. One of the most significant legacies of the Cuban Missile Crisis was the concept of nuclear deterrence. In the aftermath of the crisis, both the U.S. and the Soviet Union recognized the danger of nuclear war and sought to prevent it through the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. 
This doctrine held that the possession of nuclear weapons by both sides served as a deterrent to war, as the threat of nuclear retaliation was too great to risk. While the doctrine of nuclear deterrence helped to prevent the outbreak of a global nuclear war, it also had the unintended consequence of fueling the arms race and encouraging other countries to pursue nuclear weapons of their own. This has led to a proliferation of nuclear weapons around the world, with countries such as North Korea and Iran seeking to develop their own nuclear capabilities in order to protect their interests and assert their power on the international stage. Another legacy of the Cuban Missile Crisis was a renewed emphasis on diplomacy and negotiation as a means of resolving conflicts. The crisis demonstrated the danger of brinkmanship and the need for open channels of communication and negotiation in times of crisis. This has led to a greater emphasis on diplomacy in international relations, with countries seeking to resolve conflicts through negotiation rather than military force. At the same time, however, there has been a growing sense of cynicism towards diplomacy and negotiation, particularly in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks and the rise of terrorist groups such as ISIS. Some have argued that diplomacy is no longer an effective means of resolving conflicts, and that military force is often the only option when dealing with terrorist threats. Despite these challenges, however, the legacy of the Cuban Missile Crisis remains a powerful reminder of the need for international cooperation and the dangers of nuclear proliferation. It has led to a greater emphasis on disarmament and arms control, with countries seeking to reduce their nuclear arsenals and prevent the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries. Looking back on the legacy of the Cuban Missile Crisis, it is clear that it represented a turning point in the history of international relations and a defining moment in human history. It raised important questions about the nature of conflict and the need for diplomacy and negotiation in times of crisis. It demonstrated the dangers of nuclear proliferation and the need for arms control and disarmament. And it underscored the importance of international cooperation and the need for countries to work together toward shared goals. The legacy of the Cuban Missile Crisis is a powerful reminder of the fragility and preciousness of human life and of the need for countries to work together towards a shared vision of peace and security. May we never forget the lessons of this crisis, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of international cooperation, disarmament, and the common good. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 was a turning point in the history of the Cold War. The crisis had brought the world to the brink of nuclear war, and the stakes could not have been higher. However, through a combination of diplomacy, negotiation, and compromise, the crisis was resolved peacefully. The resolution of the crisis and its aftermath had far-reaching implications for the world and for the future of international relations. The resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis was a triumph of diplomacy and negotiation. The Kennedy administration had recognized the dangers of military confrontation and had pursued a strategy aimed at resolving the conflict peacefully. The administration had established direct lines of communication with the Soviet Union and had used back-channel negotiations to explore potential avenues for compromise. One of the key achievements of the diplomatic efforts was the establishment of the hotline between the White House and the Kremlin. This direct line of communication allowed for rapid communication between the two superpowers in the event of another crisis and helped to prevent misunderstandings and miscalculations that could have led to war. Through a combination of public statements and speeches, behind-the-scenes negotiations, and direct communication with Soviet leaders, the Kennedy administration was able to convince the Soviet Union to remove their missiles from Cuba. In exchange, the United States agreed to remove their missiles from Turkey. The resolution of the crisis was met with relief and celebration around the world. The danger of nuclear war had been averted, and the world had been spared a catastrophic conflict. The resolution of the crisis was a testament to the power of diplomacy and the value of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. However, the resolution of the crisis had a number of long-term consequences that would shape the course of the Cold War and international relations in the decades to come. One of the most significant consequences of the crisis was the emergence of a more assertive Soviet Union. 
The Soviet Union had been humiliated by the resolution of the crisis and had been forced to remove their missiles from Cuba in the face of American pressure. This had led to a shift in Soviet foreign policy, with the Soviet Union becoming more aggressive and assertive in its relations with the United States and its allies. The crisis also had significant implications for the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. The crisis had highlighted the dangers of nuclear weapons and had led to a renewed emphasis on arms control and disarmament. In the years that followed the crisis, both the United States and the Soviet Union would take steps to reduce their nuclear arsenals and to establish a framework for arms control. The resolution of the crisis had also had an impact on American politics. President Kennedy had emerged from the crisis as a hero, having successfully navigated one of the most dangerous moments in human history. However, the crisis had also highlighted the risks of presidential decision-making in times of crisis. This had led to a greater emphasis on planning and decision-making processes in the years that followed. In summary, the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis was a triumph of diplomacy and negotiation. The crisis had brought the world to the brink of nuclear war, and the successful resolution of the crisis had far-reaching implications for the world and for the future of international relations. The crisis had led to a more assertive Soviet Union, a renewed emphasis on arms control and disarmament, and a greater focus on planning and decision-making processes in times of crisis. The resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis serves as a reminder of the power of diplomacy and the value of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. It remains a defining moment in the history of the Cold War and a testament to the resilience of human ingenuity and cooperation in the face of adversity. Chapter 9. The Nuclear Arms Race The development of the atomic bomb is one of the most significant events in the history of modern warfare, and it has had far-reaching implications for international relations and global security. The story of the atomic bomb is a complex one, involving the efforts of many scientists, politicians, and military leaders, and it is a story that has left an indelible mark on the course of human history. The development of the atomic bomb was a response to the growing threat of global conflict in the early 20th century. With the rise of fascist regimes in Europe and the increasing tension between the major world powers, many scientists and military leaders recognized the need for a new and more powerful weapon that could be used to deter and defeat the enemy. The development of the atomic bomb was a massive undertaking, requiring significant resources and the efforts of some of the most brilliant minds in science and engineering. The Manhattan Project, which was the code name for the U.S. effort to develop the bomb, involved thousands of scientists, engineers, and support staff, and it was shrouded in secrecy and security measures to prevent the spread of information to the enemy. The first atomic bomb was successfully tested on July 16, 1945, at a site in New Mexico. The test was a resounding success, and it marked the beginning of a new era in human history. The atomic bomb was unlike any weapon that had ever been developed before, with the power to destroy entire cities and cause immense suffering and devastation. The use of the atomic bomb in warfare was a controversial and divisive issue, with many scientists and political leaders expressing reservations about the morality and effectiveness of the weapon. Nevertheless, the U.S. made the decision to use the bomb against Japan in the final days of World War II, and two atomic bombs were dropped on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6 and August 9, 1945, respectively. The use of the atomic bomb had a profound impact on the course of the war and on the future of international relations. It marked the beginning of a new era of warfare, with the threat of nuclear annihilation becoming a central concern in the post-World War II era. It also raised important questions about the morality and ethics of using such a weapon, and it led to a greater emphasis on disarmament and arms control in international relations. In the decades that followed the development of the atomic bomb, many countries sought to acquire nuclear weapons of their own, leading to a proliferation of nuclear weapons around the world. This has raised concerns about the dangers of nuclear war, 
and the need for greater international cooperation in the areas of arms control and disarmament. Looking back on the development of the atomic bomb, it is clear that it represented a pivotal moment in the history of modern warfare and a defining moment in human history. It demonstrated the immense power of science and technology to shape the course of human events, and it raised important questions about the morality and ethics of warfare. The development of the atomic bomb was a testament to the power of human ingenuity and the resilience of the human spirit. It marked the beginning of a new era in human history, with the threat of nuclear annihilation becoming a central concern in international relations. May we never forget the lessons of the atomic bomb, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of peace and security for all. In the aftermath of World War II, the world was forever changed by the development and use of the atomic bomb. The United States had been the first to develop and use this new weapon, dropping atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. However, the United States' monopoly on nuclear weapons would not last for long. In the years that followed, the Soviet Union would embark on a crash program to develop their own atomic bomb, fundamentally altering the balance of power in the world. The Soviet Union's development of the atomic bomb was a massive undertaking. The Soviet Union had been devastated by the war and had to rebuild their economy and infrastructure from the ground up. The development of the atomic bomb required immense resources and the mobilization of the entire Soviet economy. The Soviet Union's atomic bomb program was led by a group of brilliant scientists, including Igor Kurchatov, Andrei Sakharov, and Lev Landau. These scientists had access to a wealth of information on the development of the atomic bomb, including the designs and techniques used by the United States. However, they faced a number of challenges in their efforts to develop their own nuclear weapons. One of the key challenges facing the Soviet Union was the acquisition of the necessary raw materials. The development of the atomic bomb required large quantities of uranium and plutonium, and the Soviet Union did not have significant reserves of these materials within their own borders. As a result, the Soviet Union had to turn to other countries to acquire the necessary materials. They established a spy network to steal information and materials from the United States, and also turned to their allies in Eastern Europe for support. Another major challenge facing the Soviet Union was the development of the necessary technology and infrastructure. The development of the atomic bomb required the construction of large-scale nuclear reactors, which required immense amounts of energy and technical expertise. The Soviet Union had to develop new techniques and methods for the production of enriched uranium and plutonium, and also had to build the necessary infrastructure to produce and test nuclear weapons. Despite these challenges, the Soviet Union was able to develop and test their first atomic bomb in 1949. This development fundamentally altered the balance of power in the world as the United States no longer held a monopoly on nuclear weapons. The development of the atomic bomb also had significant implications for the future of international relations and the Cold War. The Soviet Union's development of the atomic bomb was met with shock and fear in the United States and around the world. The United States had been the only country to possess nuclear weapons and had used them to devastating effect in Japan. The development of the atomic bomb by the Soviet Union raised the specter of a nuclear arms race, with both sides building up their nuclear arsenals in an effort to deter the other. The Soviet Union's development of the atomic bomb also had significant implications for the Cold War. The development of the atomic bomb gave the Soviet Union a new level of strategic leverage, as they now had the ability to threaten the United States and its allies with nuclear destruction. This helped to shift the balance of power in the world and led to a new era of competition and conflict between the two superpowers. In summary, the Soviet Union's development of the atomic bomb was a massive undertaking that fundamentally altered the balance of power in the world. The development of the atomic bomb required immense resources and technical expertise and posed a number of challenges for the Soviet Union. However, 
through a combination of espionage, scientific innovation, and industrial mobilization, the Soviet Union was able to develop their own nuclear weapons, fundamentally altering the course of world history. The development of the hydrogen bomb, also known as the thermonuclear bomb, was a significant milestone in the history of modern warfare and international relations. The hydrogen bomb represented a significant advancement in nuclear technology, with the power to cause even greater devastation and destruction than the atomic bomb. The story of the U.S. development of the hydrogen bomb is a complex one, involving the efforts of many scientists, politicians, and military leaders, and it is a story that has left a lasting mark on the course of human history. The development of the hydrogen bomb was a response to the growing threat of global conflict in the early 20th century. With the rise of the Soviet Union and the increasing tensions between the major world powers, many scientists and military leaders recognized the need for a new and more powerful weapon that could be used to deter and defeat the enemy. The development of the hydrogen bomb was a massive undertaking, requiring significant resources and the efforts of some of the most brilliant minds in science and engineering. The U.S. effort to develop the bomb involved thousands of scientists, engineers, and support staff, and it was shrouded in secrecy and security measures to prevent the spread of information to the enemy. The hydrogen bomb was based on a fusion reaction, where hydrogen atoms are fused together to form helium and release an immense amount of energy. The process was far more complex than the fission reaction used in the atomic bomb, and it required new and innovative technologies to make it possible. The first successful test of the hydrogen bomb was conducted on November 1, 1952, at a site in the Pacific Ocean. The test was a resounding success, and it marked the beginning of a new era in nuclear technology. The hydrogen bomb was far more powerful than the atomic bomb, with the power to destroy entire cities and cause immense suffering and devastation. The development of the hydrogen bomb had a profound impact on the course of the Cold War and on the future of international relations. It marked the beginning of a new era of nuclear weapons and deterrence, with the threat of nuclear annihilation becoming a central concern in the post-World War II era. It also raised important questions about the morality and ethics of using such a weapon, and it led to a greater emphasis on disarmament and arms control in international relations. In the decades that followed the development of the hydrogen bomb, many countries sought to acquire nuclear weapons of their own, leading to a proliferation of nuclear weapons around the world. This has raised concerns about the dangers of nuclear war and the need for greater international cooperation in the areas of arms control and disarmament. Looking back on the development of the hydrogen bomb, it is clear that it represented a pivotal moment in the history of modern warfare and a defining moment in human history. It demonstrated the immense power of science and technology to shape the course of human events, and it raised important questions about the morality and ethics of warfare. The development of the hydrogen bomb was a testament to the power of human ingenuity and the resilience of the human spirit. It marked the beginning of a new era in human history, with the threat of nuclear annihilation becoming a central concern in international relations. May we never forget the lessons of the hydrogen bomb, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of peace and security for all. The development of the atomic bomb by the United States and the Soviet Union had fundamentally altered the balance of power in the world. However, the development of the atomic bomb was only the beginning of the nuclear arms race between the two superpowers. In the years that followed, both the United States and the Soviet Union would develop more powerful and destructive weapons, including the hydrogen bomb. The Soviet Union's development of the hydrogen bomb was a massive undertaking that required immense resources and technical expertise. The hydrogen bomb, also known as the thermonuclear bomb, was a far more powerful weapon than the atomic bomb. The hydrogen bomb was based on the principles of nuclear fusion, in which lighter elements are fused together to create heavier elements, releasing vast amounts of energy in the process. The hydrogen bomb was far more destructive than the atomic bomb and had the potential to cause catastrophic damage on an unprecedented scale. 
The Soviet Union's development of the hydrogen bomb was a major priority for the Soviet government. The Soviet Union saw the development of the hydrogen bomb as a way to gain an advantage over the United States in the nuclear arms race and to deter the United States from launching a nuclear attack. The development of the hydrogen bomb required immense resources and technical expertise. The Soviet Union had to develop new technologies and techniques for the production of nuclear fusion and had to build new infrastructure and testing facilities to develop and test the weapon. The development of the hydrogen bomb also required large quantities of fissile material, including uranium and plutonium. The Soviet Union's development of the hydrogen bomb was led by a group of brilliant scientists, including Andrei Sakharov and Igor Tam. These scientists worked tirelessly to develop new technologies and techniques for the production of nuclear fusion and to build the infrastructure necessary to develop and test the weapon. The development of the hydrogen bomb was a massive undertaking that required the mobilization of the entire Soviet economy. The Soviet Union's development of the hydrogen bomb was met with shock and fear in the United States and around the world. The development of the hydrogen bomb represented a major escalation in the nuclear arms race and raised the specter of a catastrophic nuclear war. The United States and other countries around the world condemned the development of the hydrogen bomb and called for a renewed emphasis on arms control and disarmament. The development of the hydrogen bomb also had significant implications for the Cold War. The Soviet Union's development of the hydrogen bomb gave the Soviet Union a new level of strategic leverage, as they now had the ability to threaten the United States and its allies with even more destructive weapons. This helped to shift the balance of power in the world and led to a new era of competition and conflict between the two superpowers. In summary, the Soviet Union's development of the hydrogen bomb was a massive undertaking that required immense resources and technical expertise. The development of the hydrogen bomb was a major priority for the Soviet government and was seen as a way to gain an advantage over the United States in the nuclear arms race. The development of the hydrogen bomb represented a major escalation in the nuclear arms race and raised the specter of a catastrophic nuclear war. The development of the hydrogen bomb helped to shift the balance of power in the world and led to a new era of competition and conflict between the two superpowers. The development of the hydrogen bomb serves as a stark reminder of the dangers of nuclear weapons and the importance of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. The legacy of the hydrogen bomb continues to shape the world today and serves as a reminder of the fragility and uncertainty of human affairs. The arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War was one of the defining features of the era, and it had a profound impact on international relations and global security. The period under Eisenhower and Khrushchev saw a significant escalation in the arms race, with both sides seeking to develop and deploy new and more powerful weapons in an effort to gain an advantage over the other. The arms race was driven by a variety of factors, including political ideology, military strategy, and technological innovation. Both the U.S. and the Soviet Union recognized the importance of military power in shaping the course of international relations, and they were determined to assert their dominance and protect their interests. Under the leadership of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the U.S. pursued a policy of massive retaliation, which involved the development and deployment of new and more powerful nuclear weapons. This policy was based on the idea that the threat of nuclear retaliation was an effective deterrent to war, and it led to a significant expansion of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. In response, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev pursued a policy of peaceful coexistence, which sought to establish a peaceful coexistence between the Soviet Union and the West. However, Khrushchev also recognized the importance of military power and sought to develop new and more powerful weapons in an effort to keep pace with the U.S. One of the key factors driving the arms race was the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, which could deliver nuclear warheads to targets thousands of miles away. The development of ICBMs represented a significant breakthrough in missile technology, 
and both the U.S. and the Soviet Union invested heavily in their development and deployment. The arms race also led to a significant expansion of military spending, with both the U.S. and the Soviet Union investing heavily in their military infrastructure and personnel. This had a significant impact on the global economy, with military spending consuming a significant portion of the resources and attention of both countries. The escalation of the arms race under Eisenhower and Khrushchev had a profound impact on international relations and global security. It raised important questions about the morality and ethics of using nuclear weapons, and it underscored the dangers of nuclear proliferation and the need for greater international cooperation in the areas of arms control and disarmament. The arms race also had a significant impact on the global balance of power, with the U.S. and the Soviet Union becoming the dominant military powers in the world. This led to a significant shift in the nature of international relations, with the Cold War becoming the defining feature of the era. Looking back on the arms race under Eisenhower and Khrushchev, it is clear that it represented a pivotal moment in the history of modern warfare and international relations. It demonstrated the immense power of science and technology to shape the course of human events, and it raised important questions about the morality and ethics of warfare. The arms race under Eisenhower and Khrushchev was a testament to the power of human ingenuity and the resilience of the human spirit. It marked the beginning of a new era in human history, with the threat of nuclear annihilation becoming a central concern in international relations. May we never forget the lessons of the arms race, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of peace and security for all. The strategic arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union had reached unprecedented levels by the late 1960s. Both countries had developed a vast arsenal of nuclear weapons, and the potential for catastrophic destruction was greater than ever before. In response to this escalating arms race, the United States and the Soviet Union embarked on a series of negotiations aimed at limiting the growth of their nuclear arsenals. These negotiations, known as the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, SALT I and II, were a critical element in the effort to prevent nuclear war and to promote international stability. The SALT I negotiations were held in the early 1970s, and resulted in a number of agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union aimed at limiting the growth of their nuclear arsenals. The SALT I agreements included a treaty limiting the development and deployment of anti ballistic missile ABM, systems, as well as an agreement limiting the number of intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs, and submarine launched ballistic missiles SLBMs, that each country could possess. The SALT I agreements also established a framework for future arms control negotiations, including the development of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty CTBT. The SALT I negotiations were a significant achievement in the effort to limit the growth of nuclear arsenals and to promote international stability. The agreements reached during the negotiations were a testament to the power of diplomacy and the value of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. However, the SALT I agreements were not without their limitations and did not completely resolve the nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. The SALT II negotiations were held in the late 1970s and were aimed at further limiting the growth of the United States and Soviet nuclear arsenals. The SALT II agreements included a treaty limiting the number of strategic offensive arms that each country could possess, including ICBMs, SLBMs, and heavy bombers. The SALT II agreements also established a framework for future arms control negotiations, including the development of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty INF. The SALT II negotiations were a significant achievement in the effort to limit the growth of nuclear arsenals and to promote international stability. The agreements reached during the negotiations were a testament to the power of diplomacy and the value of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. However, the SALT II agreements were not without their limitations and were not fully implemented due to political tensions and Cold War competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. The strategic arms limitation talks were a critical element in the effort to prevent nuclear war and to promote international stability. 
The negotiations were a testament to the power of diplomacy and the value of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. The SALT I and II agreements were significant achievements and helped to limit the growth of the United States and Soviet nuclear arsenals. However, the SALT agreements were not without their limitations and did not completely resolve the nuclear arms race between the two superpowers. The legacy of the SALT negotiations continues to shape the world today and serves as a reminder of the importance of arms control and disarmament in the effort to promote international peace and stability. The Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, signed in 1963, was a landmark agreement between the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom that represented a significant step forward in the pursuit of international peace and security. The treaty banned the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, in space, and underwater, and it marked a significant milestone in the efforts to curb the spread of nuclear weapons and reduce the risk of nuclear war. The Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was the result of years of negotiations and diplomatic efforts, and it represented a significant achievement for both the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The treaty was a major victory for those who had been advocating for nuclear disarmament and arms control, and it served as a model for future efforts to reduce the threat of nuclear war. The treaty was signed at a time when the Cold War was at its peak, and the threat of nuclear war was a constant source of anxiety for people around the world. The signing of the treaty represented a turning point in the history of international relations and it marked a significant shift in the way that countries thought about the use of nuclear weapons. The Nuclear Test Ban Treaty had a significant impact on the course of international relations and global security. It demonstrated the importance of diplomacy and negotiation in resolving conflicts, and it underscored the dangers of nuclear proliferation and the need for greater international cooperation in the areas of arms control and disarmament. The treaty also had a significant impact on the scientific and technological communities, with the ban on nuclear testing forcing scientists to find new and innovative ways to monitor the safety and reliability of nuclear weapons. This led to significant advancements in the fields of seismology, geophysics, and other related disciplines. Looking back on the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, it is clear that it represented a pivotal moment in the history of modern warfare and international relations. It demonstrated the power of diplomacy and negotiation in resolving conflicts, and it underscored the importance of international cooperation in the pursuit of peace and security. The Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was a triumph of reason over fear, and it marked a significant step forward in the pursuit of international peace and security. May we never forget the lessons of this treaty, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of disarmament, arms control, and the common good. In the late 1960s, the United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in an escalating arms race. The two superpowers had developed vast arsenals of nuclear weapons, and the potential for catastrophic destruction was greater than ever before. In an effort to limit the growth of their nuclear arsenals, the United States and the Soviet Union embarked on a series of negotiations aimed at promoting arms control and disarmament. One of the key agreements to come out of these negotiations was the Anti-Ballistic Missile ABM, Treaty, which was signed in 1972. The ABM Treaty was a landmark agreement that limited the development and deployment of anti-ballistic missile systems. The treaty was designed to prevent either the United States or the Soviet Union from developing a system that could completely protect them from a nuclear attack, as such a system would upset the delicate balance of power between the two superpowers and could lead to a new arms race. The ABM Treaty was a significant achievement in the effort to promote arms control and disarmament. The treaty was a testament to the power of diplomacy and the value of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. The ABM Treaty helped to limit the growth of nuclear arsenals and to promote international stability. The ABM Treaty was a complex agreement that set out a number of limitations on the development and deployment of anti-ballistic missile systems. The treaty limited each country to a single ABM site, which was designed to protect their capital city. The treaty also limited the number of interceptor missiles that each country could possess 
and prohibited the development of new types of ABM systems. The ABM Treaty was met with a mixed reaction in the United States and the Soviet Union. In the United States, some military officials argued that the treaty limited their ability to defend against a potential nuclear attack. However, supporters of the treaty argued that it was necessary to prevent a new arms race and to promote international stability. The ABM Treaty remained in effect for over 30 years and was seen as a key element in the effort to prevent nuclear war and to promote international peace and stability. However, in the early 2000s, the United States announced its intention to withdraw from the treaty, citing the need to develop a missile defense system to protect against potential threats from rogue states. The decision to withdraw from the ABM treaty was met with criticism from some quarters, who argued that it could lead to a new arms race and undermine the international system of arms control and disarmament. In summary, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty was a landmark agreement that limited the development and deployment of anti-ballistic missile systems. The treaty was a significant achievement in the effort to promote arms control and disarmament, and helped to limit the growth of nuclear arsenals and to promote international stability. The ABM Treaty was a complex agreement that set out a number of limitations on the development and deployment of ABM systems, and was met with a mixed reaction in the United States and the Soviet Union. The legacy of the ABM Treaty continues to shape the world today and serves as a reminder of the importance of arms control and disarmament in the effort to promote international peace and stability. The Strategic Defense Initiative SDI, also known as Star Wars, was a proposed missile defense system that was put forward by President Ronald Reagan in 1983. The SDI represented a significant departure from the traditional approach to nuclear defense and it sparked a heated debate over the ethics and effectiveness of missile defense systems. The basic idea behind the SDI was to develop a network of space-based satellites that would be able to intercept and destroy incoming ballistic missiles before they could reach their targets. This represented a significant departure from the traditional approach to nuclear defense, which focused on deterrence and retaliation rather than active defense. The SDI was a controversial proposal, with critics arguing that it was too expensive, technically unfeasible, and that it would destabilize the balance of power between the United States and the Soviet Union. The proposal also raised important questions about the morality and ethics of developing new and more powerful weapons, and it underscored the need for greater international cooperation in the areas of arms control and disarmament. The SDI was developed at a time when the Cold War was still a major source of tension and anxiety around the world. The threat of nuclear war was a constant source of concern, and the proposed missile defense system was seen by some as a way to mitigate that threat. However, the SDI was also seen by many as a dangerous and potentially destabilizing development. Critics argued that it would encourage an arms race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union and that it would lead to an escalation in military spending that could have devastating consequences for the global economy. The SDI represented a significant departure from the traditional approach to nuclear defense, and it marked a turning point in the history of international relations. It underscored the importance of new and innovative approaches to disarmament and arms control and it raised important questions about the ethics and morality of using new and more powerful weapons. Ultimately, the SDI was not fully implemented, and it remains a controversial and divisive issue to this day. The debate over the proposal underscored the importance of international cooperation and diplomacy in resolving conflicts and reducing the risk of nuclear war. Looking back on the SDI, it is clear that it represented a pivotal moment in the history of modern warfare and international relations. It demonstrated the power of new and innovative approaches to defense and security, and it raised important questions about the role of technology and ethics in shaping the course of human events. The Strategic Defense Initiative was a symbol of the tensions and anxieties of the Cold War era. It represented a significant departure from the traditional approach to nuclear defense, and it raised important questions about the ethics and morality of using new and more powerful weapons. 
May we never forget the lessons of the SDI, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of disarmament, arms control, and the common good. The nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union was one of the defining features of the Cold War. The two superpowers had developed vast arsenals of nuclear weapons, and the potential for catastrophic destruction was greater than ever before. However, by the 1980s, the arms race had begun to wind down, as both the United States and the Soviet Union began to recognize the dangers of nuclear war and the need for arms control and disarmament. The end of the arms race was a complex process that involved a number of negotiations and agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, START, was a key agreement that was signed in 1991 and was designed to limit the number of nuclear weapons possessed by each country. The START agreement was a significant achievement in the effort to promote arms control and disarmament and help to reduce tensions between the two superpowers. The end of the arms race had a number of significant implications for the world. One of the key implications was the reduction in the risk of nuclear war. With the arms race winding down, the potential for a catastrophic nuclear conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union was greatly reduced. This helped to promote international peace and stability and paved the way for a new era of cooperation between the two superpowers. The end of the arms race also had significant implications for the United States and the Soviet Union. With the arms race winding down, both countries were able to shift their focus away from military spending and towards other areas, such as economic development and social programs. This helped to improve the standard of living for people in both countries and helped to promote greater stability and security. However, the end of the arms race was not without its challenges. In the aftermath of the Cold War, the world faced new threats and challenges, including terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The end of the arms race did not eliminate the threat of nuclear war entirely, and the risk of a catastrophic conflict between nuclear armed states remains a concern today. The end of the arms race also had significant implications for the international system of arms control and disarmament. With the end of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union were no longer the only nuclear armed states in the world. This led to new challenges in the effort to promote arms control and disarmament, as new nuclear armed states emerged, such as India, Pakistan and North Korea. In summary, the end of the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union was a significant achievement in the effort to promote arms control and disarmament. The end of the arms race helped to reduce the risk of nuclear war and promote international peace and stability. However, the end of the arms race was not without its challenges, and the world still faces new threats and challenges in the effort to promote arms control and disarmament. The legacy of the arms race continues to shape the world today, and serves as a reminder of the dangers of nuclear weapons and the importance of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. The end of the arms race also serves as a testament to the power of diplomacy and the value of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. Chapter 10. The Vietnam War The Vietnam War was one of the most significant and controversial conflicts of the 20th century, and its origins were complex and multifaceted. The war was fought between the Communist government of North Vietnam and the government of South Vietnam, which was supported by the United States and other Western powers. The origins of the Vietnam War can be traced back to the end of World War II, when the Vietnamese people began their struggle for independence from French colonial rule. The struggle was led by Ho Chi Minh, a communist leader who had spent many years in exile in Europe and Asia. Ho Chi Minh was a charismatic leader who inspired a generation of Vietnamese to fight for their freedom. The French, however, were determined to hold on to their colony in Vietnam, and they launched a brutal war of suppression against the Vietnamese people. This led to a period of intense conflict that lasted for several years, and it ultimately ended with the defeat of the French forces at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Following the defeat of the French, Vietnam was divided into two separate countries, with the communist government of North Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh and the government of South Vietnam under President Goh Dinh Diem. The division was intended to be temporary, 
but it soon became clear that the two sides had irreconcilable differences and that a new conflict was inevitable. The United States became involved in the conflict in the early 1960s, when President John F. Kennedy began sending military advisors and other forms of assistance to South Vietnam. The U.S. was motivated by a desire to prevent the spread of communism in Southeast Asia, and it saw South Vietnam as a key ally in the fight against communism. However, the conflict in Vietnam quickly escalated, with the North Vietnamese forces receiving support from the Soviet Union and other communist powers. The U.S. responded by increasing its military presence in Vietnam, and the conflict soon became a full-scale war that lasted for more than a decade. The Vietnam War was marked by intense fighting and heavy casualties on both sides, and it had a profound impact on the course of international relations and global security. It raised important questions about the ethics and morality of using military force to achieve political ends, and it underscored the dangers of the arms race and nuclear proliferation. Looking back on the origins of the Vietnam War, it is clear that it represented a pivotal moment in the history of modern warfare and international relations. It demonstrated the power of ideology and political convictions to shape the course of human events and it raised important questions about the role of military force in resolving conflicts. The origins of the Vietnam War were complex and multifaceted, reflecting the tensions and anxieties of the post-World War II era. May we never forget the lessons of this conflict, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of peace, justice, and the common good. The Vietnam War was one of the most significant conflicts of the 20th century. The war was a complex and multifaceted conflict that involved a number of different parties, including the United States, the Soviet Union, and various factions within Vietnam. The war was marked by a number of significant events, including the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which was a key turning point in the escalation of the conflict. The Gulf of Tonkin incident occurred in August 1964, when the U.S. Navy claimed that two of its destroyers, had been attacked by North Vietnamese naval vessels in the Gulf of Tonkin. The U.S. government responded by authorizing a retaliatory strike against North Vietnam and by passing the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which gave President Lyndon B. Johnson broad authority to escalate U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. The Gulf of Tonkin incident was a complex and controversial event, and there is still debate over what actually happened. Some historians have argued that the incident was exaggerated or even fabricated by the U.S. government in order to justify a more aggressive stance towards North Vietnam. Others have argued that the incident was a genuine attack by North Vietnam and that the U.S. response was justified. Regardless of what actually happened, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a key turning point in the Vietnam War. The incident led to a significant escalation of U.S. involvement in the conflict as President Johnson authorized a massive bombing campaign against North Vietnam and sent tens of thousands of U.S. troops to fight in the war. The Gulf of Tonkin incident also had significant implications for the U.S. government's approach to the war, as the U.S. government became increasingly committed to a policy of military intervention and sought to win the war at all costs. The escalation of the Vietnam War had a number of significant implications for the United States and the world. The war was one of the most controversial and divisive conflicts in U.S. history and led to significant social and political upheaval in the United States. The war also had significant economic implications as the cost of the war strained the U.S. economy and contributed to inflation and economic stagnation. The escalation of the Vietnam War also had significant implications for the international system. The war was seen as a key element in the global struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union and contributed to tensions between the two superpowers. The war also had significant implications for the development of the international system of human rights and humanitarian law, as the conflict raised significant questions about the legitimacy and morality of military intervention and the conduct of war. In summary, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a key turning point in the escalation of the Vietnam War. The incident led to a significant escalation of U.S. involvement in the conflict and had significant implications for the United States and the world. 
The escalation of the Vietnam War was one of the most significant events of the 20th century and had significant social, political, and economic implications. The legacy of the Vietnam War continues to shape the world today and serves as a reminder of the importance of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts and of the dangers of military intervention. The Gulf of Tonkin incident also serves as a reminder of the complexity and uncertainty of human affairs and of the need to approach historical events with caution and humility. The Vietnam War was one of the most significant and controversial conflicts of the 20th century, and it was marked by a series of different military strategies and tactics. One of the most controversial of these was the search and destroy strategy employed by the United States military in Vietnam. The search and destroy strategy was a military tactic that involved locating and engaging enemy forces in the field and then destroying them with overwhelming firepower. The strategy was based on the idea that the best way to defeat the enemy was to seek them out and engage them in battle rather than waiting for them to attack. The search and destroy strategy was seen by many as a necessary response to the guerrilla tactics employed by the Viet Cong, the communist forces fighting in South Vietnam. The Viet Cong were known for their hit-and-run attacks and their ability to blend in with the local population, making it difficult for U.S. forces to identify and engage them. The search-and-destroy strategy was intended to address this problem by putting U.S. troops on the offensive and forcing the Viet Cong to engage in pitched battles. The strategy involved large-scale operations that often involved significant civilian casualties and it was criticized by many for its brutality and its failure to achieve its strategic objectives. The search-and-destroy strategy was also criticized for its impact on the morale of U.S. troops, many of whom found themselves caught up in a brutal and seemingly endless conflict. The strategy was seen by many as an example of the over-reliance on military force in Vietnam, and it raised important questions about the ethics and morality of using military force to achieve political ends. Looking back on the search and destroy strategy, it is clear that it represented a significant failure of U.S. military policy in Vietnam. The strategy was based on flawed assumptions about the nature of the conflict and the capabilities of the enemy, and it ultimately failed to achieve its strategic objectives. The search and destroy strategy also had a profound impact on the course of international relations and global security. It underscored the dangers of the arms race and nuclear proliferation, and it raised important questions about the role of military force in resolving conflicts. The search and destroy strategy was a testament to the dangers of over-reliance on military force in resolving conflicts. May we never forget the lessons of this strategy, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of peace, justice, and the common good. The Vietnam War was one of the most significant conflicts of the 20th century. The war was a complex and multifaceted conflict that involved a number of different parties, including the United States, the Soviet Union, and various factions within Vietnam. One of the key elements of the Vietnam War was the role of guerrilla warfare and the Viet Cong, a communist guerrilla movement in South Vietnam. Guerrilla warfare is a type of unconventional warfare that involves small mobile groups of fighters engaging in hit-and-run attacks against a larger, more established military force. Guerrilla warfare is characterized by its use of ambushes, sabotage, and other tactics designed to wear down the enemy and undermine their will to fight. The Viet Cong was a communist guerrilla movement in South Vietnam that was active during the Vietnam War. The Viet Cong was made up of a number of different groups, including peasants, workers, and students, and was supported by the communist government in North Vietnam. The Viet Cong were a formidable force in the Vietnam War and played a significant role in the conflict. The Viet Cong employed a range of guerrilla tactics, including ambushes, sabotage, and hit-and-run attacks. The Viet Cong also used a number of different weapons, including homemade explosives, booby traps, and small arms. The use of guerrilla tactics by the Viet Cong had significant implications for the United States and its allies. The U.S. military was not equipped to deal with guerrilla warfare, and the tactics used by the Viet Cong were effective at disrupting U.S. operations and undermining the U.S. military's morale. The use of guerrilla tactics by the Viet Cong 
also had significant implications for the war itself. The Viet Cong's use of guerrilla tactics helped to prolong the conflict, as the U.S. military was unable to defeat the Viet Cong on the battlefield. The Viet Cong's tactics also had significant psychological effects, as they helped to erode support for the war in the United States and around the world. Despite the effectiveness of the Viet Cong's tactics, the movement was not without its weaknesses. The Viet Cong relied heavily on support from the civilian population, and their actions sometimes alienated the very people they were trying to win over. The Viet Cong also suffered from a lack of resources and were often outgunned by the U.S. military. In summary, the role of guerrilla warfare and the Viet Cong was a key element of the Vietnam War. The Viet Cong's use of guerrilla tactics had significant implications for the war and for the United States and its allies. The Viet Cong's tactics helped to prolong the conflict and erode support for the war, and underscored the difficulties of waging a conventional war against a guerrilla movement. The legacy of the Viet Cong's guerrilla tactics continues to shape the world today and serves as a reminder of the importance of understanding the complexities of modern warfare. The Viet Cong's tactics also serve as a testament to the power of unconventional warfare and the ability of small, mobile groups of fighters to challenge established military forces. The Tet Offensive was a major military campaign launched by the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong in 1968, during the Vietnam War. The offensive was a significant turning point in the conflict, and it marked a major shift in the way that the war was fought and perceived by both the American public and the military leadership. The Tet Offensive was launched on January 30, 1968, and it involved a coordinated attack on multiple targets across South Vietnam, including cities and military bases. The offensive was a surprise to the U.S. military and the South Vietnamese government, who had believed that the Viet Cong were too weak to launch such a large-scale attack. The Tet Offensive was a major military success for the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, who were able to seize control of a number of key targets and hold them for a significant period of time. The offensive demonstrated the resilience and determination of the communist forces, and it raised important questions about the effectiveness of U.S. military strategy and tactics. The Tet Offensive also had a significant impact on the course of the war and the way that it was perceived by both the American public and the military leadership. The offensive was a major blow to the morale of U.S. troops, many of whom were disillusioned by the scale of the attack and the inability of the U.S. military to prevent it. The Tet Offensive also marked a significant turning point in the way that the war was fought, with both sides recognizing the importance of political and psychological factors in shaping the course of the conflict. The offensive demonstrated the power of propaganda and the ability of the Viet Cong to mobilize popular support, and it underscored the importance of winning the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. Looking back on the Tet Offensive, it is clear that it represented a significant turning point in the history of the Vietnam War. It demonstrated the resilience and determination of the communist forces, and it raised important questions about the effectiveness of U.S. military strategy and tactics. The Tet Offensive also had a significant impact on the course of international relations and global security. It underscored the dangers of the arms race and nuclear proliferation, and it raised important questions about the morality and ethics of using military force to achieve political ends. The Tet Offensive was a turning point in the Vietnam War, marking the beginning of a new era in the conflict and raising important questions about the ethics and morality of using military force to achieve political ends. May we never forget the lessons of the Tet Offensive, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of peace, justice, and the common good. The Vietnam War was one of the most controversial and divisive conflicts in U.S. history. The war was marked by significant social and political upheaval, as many Americans opposed the conflict and the U.S. government's approach to the war. The anti war movement and civil disobedience, played a significant role in shaping the public debate over the war and in ultimately bringing an end to U.S. involvement in the conflict. The anti-war movement was a broad social movement that emerged in the United States during the 1960s and 1970s. 
The movement was made up of a diverse range of individuals and groups, including students, activists, religious leaders, and veterans, who were united by their opposition to the Vietnam War and their desire for peace. The anti-war movement was a significant force in shaping public opinion about the war. The movement organized protests, marches, and other demonstrations, and used a range of tactics to draw attention to the human costs of the war and to call for an end to U.S. involvement in the conflict. The anti-war movement also helped to shift the political landscape, as more and more elected officials began to question the wisdom of the war and the U.S. government's approach to the conflict. One of the key tactics used by the anti-war movement was civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is a form of nonviolent protest that involves the deliberate violation of a law or a social norm. Civil disobedience is typically used as a way to draw attention to a cause and to challenge an unjust law or policy. Civil disobedience played a significant role in the anti-war movement as activists used a range of tactics to challenge the U.S. government's policies and to draw attention to the human costs of the war. These tactics included sit-ins, boycotts, and other forms of nonviolent protest, as well as acts of civil disobedience such as the burning of draft cards and other government documents. The use of civil disobedience by the anti-war movement had significant implications for the United States and the world. The movement helped to promote greater social and political awareness and helped to mobilize a new generation of Americans to engage in the political process. The movement also helped to shift the political landscape as more and more elected officials began to question the wisdom of the war and the U.S. government's approach to the conflict. The legacy of the anti-war movement and civil disobedience continues to shape the world today and serves as a reminder of the power of social and political movements to affect change. The anti-war movement and civil disobedience also serve as a testament to the importance of civic engagement and of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts. The legacy of the anti-war movement also underscores the importance of understanding the complexities of modern warfare and of the need to approach historical events with caution and humility. In summary, the anti-war movement and civil disobedience played a significant role in shaping public opinion about the Vietnam War and in ultimately bringing an end to U.S. involvement in the conflict. The use of civil disobedience by the anti-war movement helped to promote greater social and political awareness and helped to shift the political landscape. The legacy of the anti-war movement and civil disobedience continues to shape the world today and serves as a reminder of the importance of social and political movements in effecting change and of the need to approach historical events with caution and humility. The secret bombing of Cambodia and Laos was a covert military operation conducted by the United States during the Vietnam War. The operation was aimed at disrupting the movement of communist forces and supplies along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a network of roads and trails that ran through Cambodia and Laos and into South Vietnam. The bombing campaign began in 1965 and continued until 1973, and it involved a series of airstrikes that targeted both military and civilian targets in Cambodia and Laos. The campaign was conducted in secret, and it was not widely known to the American public or the international community. The secret bombing of Cambodia and Laos was a controversial operation that raised important questions about the ethics and morality of using military force to achieve political ends. The campaign was criticized by many for its indiscriminate nature and its impact on civilian populations. The bombing campaign also had a significant impact on the course of the Vietnam War, with many arguing that it had the unintended consequence of strengthening the communist forces and prolonging the conflict. The bombing campaign also had a profound impact on the people of Cambodia and Laos who suffered significant loss of life and damage to their infrastructure as a result of the airstrikes. The secret bombing of Cambodia and Laos underscored the dangers of covert military operations and the need for greater transparency and accountability in the conduct of military policy. It raised important questions about the role of the United States in international affairs and the ethical implications of using military force to achieve political ends. Looking back on the secret bombing of Cambodia and Laos, 
it is clear that it represented a significant failure of U.S. military policy in the Vietnam War. The campaign demonstrated the dangers of over-reliance on military force in resolving conflicts, and it underscored the importance of diplomacy and negotiation in resolving disputes. The secret bombing of Cambodia and Laos was a dark chapter in the history of the Vietnam War, underscoring the dangers of using military force to achieve political ends. May we never forget the lessons of this campaign, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of peace, justice and the common good. The Vietnam War was marked by significant atrocities, including the My Lai Massacre, which was one of the most notorious incidents of the conflict. The My Lai Massacre was a horrific incident in which U.S. soldiers killed more than 500 Vietnamese civilians, including women, children, and elderly people, in the village of My Lai in March 1968. The incident had significant implications for the war and for the United States, and underscored the dangers of military intervention and the need to hold soldiers accountable for their actions. The My Lai Massacre was a complex and multifaceted event, and there is still debate over what actually happened. Some historians have argued that the soldiers involved in the massacre were following orders, while others have argued that the soldiers acted on their own and without the knowledge of their superiors. Regardless of what actually happened, the My Lai Massacre was a significant atrocity that had significant implications for the war and for the United States. The massacre led to widespread condemnation of the U.S. military and the U.S. government's approach to the war and undermined support for the war among the American public. The My Lai Massacre also had significant implications for the international system of human rights and humanitarian law. The massacre was a clear violation of the principles of the Geneva Conventions and other international agreements, and underscored the need for greater accountability and transparency in the conduct of military operations. The My Lai Massacre also helped to shape the discourse around war crimes and the need to hold soldiers accountable for their actions. The massacre led to a number of investigations and trials, and helped to establish a framework for holding soldiers accountable for war crimes and other violations of international law. In summary, the My Lai Massacre was a horrific event that had significant implications for the Vietnam War and for the United States. The massacre underscored the dangers of military intervention and the need to hold soldiers accountable for their actions. The My Lai Massacre also had significant implications for the international system of human rights and humanitarian law, and helped to shape the discourse around war crimes and the need to establish a framework for holding soldiers accountable for their actions. The legacy of the My Lai Massacre continues to shape the world today, and serves as a reminder of the importance of finding peaceful solutions to conflicts, and of the need to approach historical events with caution and humility. The Paris Peace Accords were a series of agreements signed in 1973 that marked the end of the Vietnam War. The agreements were negotiated between the United States, the government of South Vietnam, and the communist forces of North Vietnam, and they were aimed at bringing an end to the conflict and establishing a framework for peace in the region. The Paris Peace Accords represented a significant turning point in the history of the Vietnam War, and they marked the beginning of a new era in the conflict. The agreements were the result of intense negotiations and diplomacy, and they represented a significant victory for those who had long advocated for a peaceful resolution to the conflict. The Paris Peace Accords were based on a number of key principles, including a ceasefire agreement, the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Vietnam, and the establishment of a provisional government in South Vietnam. The agreements also called for the release of prisoners of war and the implementation of a political solution to the conflict. The Paris Peace Accords were signed in January 1973, and they represented a significant achievement in the pursuit of peace and diplomacy. The agreements marked the end of a long and costly conflict that had claimed the lives of millions of people and had profoundly affected the course of international relations and global security. However, the peace was short-lived, as the provisional government established in South Vietnam soon collapsed, and the North Vietnamese forces launched a new offensive that led to the final defeat of South Vietnam in 1975. The fall of Saigon marked the end of the Vietnam War 
and the beginning of a new era in the history of the region. Looking back on the Paris Peace Accords, it is clear that they represented a significant turning point in the history of the Vietnam War. The agreements underscored the importance of diplomacy and negotiation in resolving conflicts, and they demonstrated the power of political solutions to promote peace and stability in the region. However, the fall of Saigon also demonstrated the limitations of the Paris Peace Accords and the challenges of achieving lasting peace and stability in a region marked by deep divisions and long-standing tensions. The conflict in Vietnam underscored the importance of addressing the root causes of conflict and the need for greater cooperation and dialogue in resolving disputes. The Paris Peace Accords represented a triumph of diplomacy and negotiation in the pursuit of peace, but they also underscored the complex and multifaceted nature of conflicts in the modern world. May we never forget the lessons of the Vietnam War, and may we always remain committed to the pursuit of peace, justice, and the common good. The Vietnam War was one of the most significant conflicts in